This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Two, Chapter Eighteen. Nine Days. The marriage day was shining brightly, and they were ready outside the closed door of the doctor's room, where he was speaking with Charles Darnay. They were ready to go to church. The beautiful bride, Mr. Lorry, and Miss Pross, to whom the event, through a gradual process of reconcilement to the inevitable, would have been one of absolute bliss, but for the yet lingering consideration that her brother Solomon should have been the bridegroom. And so, said Mr. Lorry, who could not sufficiently admire the bride, and who had been moving round her to take in every point of her quiet pretty dress, and so it was for this, my sweet Lucy, that I brought you across the channel. Such a baby! Lord bless me! How little I thought what I was doing! How lightly I valued the obligation I was conferring on my friend Mr. Charles! You didn't mean it! "'remarked the matter-of-fact Miss Pross. "'And therefore, how could you know it? "'Nonsense!' "'Really? Well, but don't cry,' said the gentle Mr. Lorry. "'I am not crying,' said Miss Pross. "'You are.' "'I, my Pross?' "'By this time Mr. Lorry dared to be pleasant with her on occasion. "'You were. Just now. I saw you do it, and I don't wonder at it.' "'Such a present of plate as you have made them is enough to bring tears into anybody's eyes. "'There's not a fork or spoon in the collection,' said Miss Pross, "'that I didn't cry over last night after the box came, till I couldn't see it.' "'I am highly gratified,' said Mr. Lorry. "'Though, upon my honour, I had no intention of rendering those trifling articles of remembrance invisible to any one. "'Dear me!' This is an occasion that makes a man speculate on all he has lost. Dear, 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 to think that there might have been a Mrs. Lorry any time these fifty years almost. Not at all, said Miss Pross. You think there might never have been a Mrs. Lorry? asked the gentleman of that name. Pooh, rejoined Miss Pross. You were a bachelor in your cradle. Well— "'observed Mr. Lorry, beamingly adjusting his little wig. "'That seems probable, too.' "'And you were cut out for a bachelor,' pursued Miss Pross, "'before you were put in your cradle.' "'Then I think,' said Mr. Lorry, "'that I was very unhandsomely dealt with, "'and that I ought to have had a voice in the selection of my pattern. "'Enough. Now, my dear Lucy,' drawing his arm soothingly round her waist, "'I hear them moving in the next room.' "'and Miss Pross and I, as two formal folks of business, "'are anxious not to lose the final opportunity "'of saying something to you that you wish to hear. "'You leave your good father, my dear, "'in hands as earnest and as loving as your own. "'He shall be taken every conceivable care of. "'During the next fortnight, while you are in Warwickshire and thereabouts, "'even Telson shall go to the wall, comparatively speaking, before him. "'and when, at the fortnight's end, he comes to join you and your beloved husband "'on your other fortnight's trip in Wales, "'you shall say that we have sent him to you in the best health and in the happiest frame. "'Now, I hear somebody's step coming to the door. "'Let me kiss my dear girl with an old-fashioned bachelor blessing "'before somebody comes to claim his own.' "'For a moment he held the fair face from him, to look at the well-remembered expression on the forehead, and then laid the bright golden hair against his little brown wig, with a genuine tenderness and delicacy, which, if such things be old-fashioned, were as old as Adam. The door of the doctor's room opened, and he came out with Charles Darnay. He was so deadly pale, which had not been the case when they went in together, that no vestige of colour was to be seen in his face. But in the composure of his manner he was unaltered, except that to the shrewd glance of Mr. Lorry it disclosed some shadowy indication that the old air of avoidance 
and dread had lately passed over him, like a cold wind. He gave his arm to his daughter, and took her downstairs to the chariot which Mr. Lorry had hired in honour of the day. The rest followed in another carriage, and soon, in a neighbouring church where no strange eyes looked on, Charles Darnay and Lucy Manette were happily married. Besides the glancing tears that shone among the smiles of the little group when it was done, some diamonds, very bright and sparkling, glanced on the bride's hand, which were newly released from the dark obscurity of one of Mr. Lorry's pockets. They returned home to breakfast, and all went well, and in due course the golden hair that had mingled with the poor shoemaker's white locks in the Paris garret were mingled with them again in the morning sunlight, on the threshold of the door at parting. It was a hard parting, though it was not for long, but her father cheered her, and said at last, gently disengaging himself from her enfolding arms, "'Take her, Charles. She is yours.' and her agitated hand waved to them from a chaise window, and she was gone. The corner being out of the way of the idle and curious, and the preparations having been very simple and few, the doctor, Mr. Lorry, and Miss Pross were left quite alone. It was when they turned into the welcome shade of the cool old hall that Mr. Lorry observed a great change to have come over the doctor, as if the golden arm uplifted there had struck him a poisoned blow. He had naturally repressed much, and some revulsion might have been expected in him when the occasion for repression was gone. But it was the old, scared, lost look that troubled Mr. Lorry, and through his absent manner of clasping his head and drearily wandering away into his own room when they got upstairs, Mr. Lorry was reminded of Defarge, the wine-shop keeper, and the starlit ride. "'I think,' he whispered to Miss Pross, after anxious consideration, "'I think we had best not speak to him just now, or at all disturb him. I must look in at Tellson's, so I will go there at once, and come back presently. Then we will take him for a ride into the country, and dine there, and all will be well.' It was easier for Mr. Lorry to look in at Tellson's than to look out of Tellson's. He was detained two hours. When he came back, he ascended the old staircase alone, having asked no question of the servant. Going thus into the doctor's room, he was stopped by a low sound of knocking. "'Good God!' he said with a start. "'What's that?' Miss Pross, with a terrified face, was at his ear. "'Oh, me, oh, me, all is lost!' cried she, wringing her hands. "'What is to be told to Lady Bird? He doesn't know me, and is making shoes!' Mr. Lorry said what he could to calm her, and went himself into the doctor's room. The bench was turned towards the light, as it had been when he had seen the shoemaker at his work before and his head was bent down, and he was very busy. "'Dr. Manette! My dear friend, Dr. Manette!' The doctor looked at him for a moment, half inquiringly, half as if he were angry at being spoken to, and bent over his work again. He had laid aside his coat and waistcoat. His shirt was open at the throat, as it used to be when he did that work, and even the old, haggard, faded surface of face had come back to him. He worked hard, impatiently, as if in some sense of having been interrupted. Mr. Lorry glanced at the work in his hand, and observed that it was a shoe of the old size and shape. He took up another that was lying by him, and asked what it was. "'A young lady's walking shoe,' he muttered, without looking up. "'It ought to have been finished long ago. Let it be.' "'But, Dr. Manette, look at me.' He obeyed in the old, mechanically submissive manner, without pausing in his work. "'You know me, my dear friend. Think again. This is not your proper occupation. Think, dear friend.' 
nothing would induce him to speak more. He looked up for an instant at a time, when he was requested to do so, but no persuasion would extract a word from him. He worked and worked and worked in silence, and words fell on him as they would have fallen on an echoless wall or on the air. The only ray of hope that Mr. Lorry could discover was that he sometimes furtively looked up without being asked. In that there seemed a faint expression of curiosity or perplexity, as though he were trying to reconcile some doubts in his mind. Two things at once impressed themselves on Mr. Lorry, as important above all others. The first, that this must be kept secret from Lucy. The second, that it must be kept secret from all who knew him. In conjunction with Miss Pross, he took immediate steps towards the latter precaution, by giving out that the doctor was not well, and required a few days of complete rest. In aid of the kind deception to be practised on his daughter, Miss Pross was to write, describing his having been called away professionally, and referring to an imaginary letter of two or three hurried lines in his own hand, represented to have been addressed to her by the same post. These measures, advisable to be taken in any case, Mr. Lorry took in the hope of his coming to himself. If that should happen soon, he kept another course in reserve, which was to have a certain opinion that he thought the best on the doctor's case. In the hope of his recovery, and of resort to this third course being thereby rendered practicable, Mr. Lorry resolved to watch him attentively, with as little appearance as possible of doing so. He therefore made arrangements to absent himself from Tellson's for the first time in his life, and took his post by the window in the same room. He was not long in discovering that it was worse than useless to speak to him, since on being pressed he became worried. He abandoned that attempt on the first day, and resolved merely to keep himself always before him as a silent protest against the delusion into which he had fallen, or was falling. He remained, therefore, in his seat near the window, reading and writing, and expressing in as many pleasant and natural ways as he could think of that it was a free place. Dr. Manette took what was given him to eat and drink, and worked on that first day until it was too dark to see, worked on half an hour after Mr. Lorry could not have seen for his life to read or write. When he put his tools aside as useless until morning, Mr. Lorry rose and said to him, "'Will you go out?' He looked down at the floor on either side of him in the old manner, looked up in the old manner, and repeated in the old low voice, "'Out?' "'Yes, for a walk with me. Why not?' He made no effort to say why not, and said not a word more. But Mr. Lorry thought he saw, as he leant forward on his bench in the dusk, with his elbows on his knees and his head in his hands, that he was in some misty way asking himself, why not? The sagacity of the man of business perceived an advantage here, and determined to hold it. Miss Pross and he divided the night into two watches, and observed him at intervals from the adjoining room. He paced up and down for a long time before he lay down, but when he did finally lay himself down, he fell asleep. In the morning he was up betimes, and went straight to his bench and to work. On this second day, Mr. Lorry saluted him cheerfully by his name, and spoke to him on topics that had been of late familiar to them. He returned no reply, but it was evident that he heard what was said, and that he thought about it, however confusedly. This encouraged Mr. Lorry to have Miss Pross in with her work several times during the day. At those times they quietly spoke of Lucy and of her father then present, precisely in the usual manner, and as if there were nothing amiss. This was done without any demonstrative accompaniment, not long enough or often enough to harass him, and it lightened Mr. Lorry's friendly heart to believe that he looked up oftener 
and that he appeared to be stirred by some perception of inconsistencies surrounding him. When it fell dark again, Mr. Lorry asked him as before, "'Dear doctor, will you go out?' "'As before,' he repeated. "'Out?' "'Yes, for a walk with me. Why not?' This time Mr. Lorry feigned to go out when he could extract no answer from him, and, after remaining absent for an hour, returned. In the meanwhile the doctor had removed to the seat in the window, and had sat there, looking down at the plane-tree. But on Mr. Lorry's return he slipped away to his bench. The time went very slowly on, and Mr. Lorry's hope darkened, and his heart grew heavier again, and grew yet heavier and heavier every day. The third day came and went, the fourth, the fifth, five days, six days, seven days, eight days, nine days. With a hope ever darkening, and with a heart always growing heavier and heavier, Mr. Lorry passed through this anxious time. The secret was well kept, and Lucy was unconscious and happy but he could not fail to observe that the shoemaker, whose hand had been a little out at first, was growing dreadfully skilful, and that he had never been so intent on his work, and that his hands had never been so nimble and expert as in the dusk of the ninth evening. End of Book Two, Chapter Eighteen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on March the 19th, 2006. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Chapter 2, Part 19. An Opinion. Worn out by anxious watching, Mr. Lorry fell asleep at his post. On the tenth morning of his suspense he was startled by the shining of the sun into the room where a heavy slumber had overtaken him when it was dark night. He rubbed his eyes and roused himself, but he doubted, when he had done so, whether he was not still asleep, for, going to the door of the doctor's room and looking in, he perceived that the shoemaker's bench and tools were put aside again, and that the doctor himself sat reading at the window. He was in his usual morning dress, and his face, which Mr. Lorry could distinctly see, though very pale, was calmly studious and attentive. Even when he had satisfied himself that he was awake, Mr. Lorry felt giddily uncertain for some few moments whether the late shoemaking might not be a disturbed dream of his own. Did not his eyes show him his friend before him in his customed clothing and aspect, and employed as usual? And was there any sign within their range that the change of which he had so strong an impression had actually happened? It was but the inquiry of his first confusion and astonishment, the answer being obvious. If the impression were not produced by a real, corresponding, and sufficient cause, how came he, Jarvis Lorry, there? How came he to have fallen asleep in his clothes on the sofa in Dr. Manette's consulting-room, and to be debating these points outside the doctor's bedroom door in the early morning? Within a few minutes Miss Pross stood whispering at his side. If he had any particle of doubt left, her talk would of necessity have resolved it. But he was by that time clear-headed, and had none. He advised that they should let the time go by until the regular breakfast hour, and should then meet the doctor as if nothing unusual had occurred. If he appeared to be in his customary state of mind, Mr. Lorry would then cautiously proceed to seek direction and guidance from the opinion he had been in his anxiety so anxious to obtain. 
Miss Pross, submitting herself to his judgment, the scheme was worked out with care. Having abundance of time for his usual methodical toilette, Mr. Lorry presented himself at the breakfast hour in his usual white linen, and with his usual neat leg. The doctor was summoned in the usual way, and came to breakfast. So far as it was possible to comprehend him without overstepping those delicate and gradual approaches which Mr. Lorry felt to be the only safe advance, he at first supposed that his daughter's marriage had taken place yesterday. An incidental allusion, purposely thrown out to the day of the week and the day of the month, set him thinking and counting, and evidently made him uneasy. In all other respects, however, he was so composedly himself that Mr. Lorry determined to have the aid he sought, and that aid was his own. Therefore, when the breakfast was done and cleared away, and he and the doctor were left together, Mr. Lorry said feelingly, "'My dear Dr. Manette, I am anxious to have your opinion, in confidence, on a very curious case in which I am deeply interested. That is to say, it is very curious to me. Perhaps, to your better information, it may be less so.' Glancing at his hands, which were discoloured by his late work, the doctor looked troubled and listened attentively. He had already glanced at his hands more than once. "'Dr. Manette,' said Mr. Lorry, touching him affectionately on the arm, "'this case is the case of a particularly dear friend of mine. Pray give your mind to it, and advise me well for his sake, and above all for his daughters. His daughters, my dear Manette.' "'If I understand,' said the doctor in a subdued tone, "'some mental shock?' "'Yes.' "'Be explicit,' said the doctor. "'Spare no detail.' Mr. Lorry saw that they understood one another, and proceeded. "'My dear Dr. Manette, it is the case of an old and prolonged shock, of great acuteness and severity to the affections, the feelings, the, the as you express it, the mind, the mind. It is the case of a shock under which the sufferer was borne down. One cannot say for how long, because I believe he cannot calculate the time himself, and there are no other means of getting at it. It is the case of a shock from which the sufferer never recovered, by a process that he cannot trace himself, as I once heard him publicly relate in a striking manner. It is the case of a shock from which he has recovered, so completely as to be a highly intelligent man, capable of close application of mind and great exertion of body, and of constantly making fresh additions to his stock of knowledge, which was already very large, but unfortunately there has been— He paused and took a deep breath, a slight relapse. The doctor, in a low voice, asked, Of how long duration? Nine days and nights. How did it show itself? I infer, glancing at his hands again, in the resumption of some old pursuit connected with the shock. That is the fact. Now, did you ever see him? Asked the doctor distinctly and collectedly, though in the same low voice, engaged in that pursuit originally. Once. And when the relapse fell on him, was he in most respects, or in all respects, as he was then? I think in all respects. You spoke of his daughter. Does his daughter know of the relapse? No, it has been kept from her, and I hope will always be kept from her. It is known only to myself and to one other who may be trusted. The doctor grasped his hand and murmured, "'That was very kind. That was very thoughtful.' Mr. Lorry grasped his hand in return, and neither of the two spoke for a little while. "'Now, my dear Manette,' said Mr. Lorry at length, in his most considerate and most affectionate way, "'I am a mere man of business, and unfit to cope with such intricate and difficult matters. I do not possess the kind of information necessary. I do not possess the kind of intelligence I want guiding. 
There is no man in this world on whom I could rely for right guidance as on you. Tell me, how does this relapse come about? Is there danger of another? Could a repetition of it be prevented? How should a repetition of it be treated? How does it come about at all? What can I do for my friend? No man ever can have been more desirous in his heart to serve a friend than I am to serve mine, if I knew how. But I don't know how to originate in such a case. If your sagacity, knowledge, and experience could put me on the right track, I feel I might be able to do much. Unenlightened and undirected, I can do little. Pray discuss it with me. Pray enable me to see it a little more clearly, and teach me how to be a little more useful. Dr. Manette sat meditating after those earnest words were spoken, and Mr. Lorry did not press him. I think it is probable, said the doctor, breaking silence with an effort, that the relapse you have described, my dear friend, was not quite unforeseen by its subject. Was it dreaded by him? Mr. Lorry ventured to ask. Very much, he said. He said it with an involuntary shudder. You have no idea how much such an apprehension weighs on the sufferer's mind, and how difficult, how almost impossible it is for him to force himself to utter a word upon the topic that oppresses him. Would he, asked Mr. Lorry, be sensibly relieved if he could prevail upon himself to impart that secret brooding to any one when it is on him? I think so. But it is, as I have told you, next to impossible. I even believe it, in some cases, to be quite impossible. Now, said Mr. Lorry, gently laying his hand on the doctor's arm again, after a short silence on both sides, to what would you refer this attack? I believe, returned Dr. Manette, that there had been a strong and involuntary revival of the train of thought and resemblance that was the first cause of the malady. Some intense associations of a most distressing nature were vividly recalled, I think. It is probable that there had long been a dread lurking in his mind, that those associations would be recalled, say, under certain circumstances, say, on a particular occasion. He tried to prepare himself in vain. Perhaps the effort to prepare himself made him less able to bear it. "'Would he remember what took place in the relapse?' asked Mr. Lorry, with natural hesitation. The doctor looked desolately around the room, shook his head, and answered in a low voice, "'Not at all.' "'Now, as to the future,' hinted Mr. Lorry, as to the future, said the doctor, recovering firmness, I should have great hope. As it pleased heaven in his mercy to restore him so soon, I should have great hope. He, yielding under the pressure of a complicated something, long dreaded and long vaguely unforeseen and contended against, and recovering after that cloud had burst and passed, I should hope that the worst is over. "'Well, well, that's good comfort. I am thankful,' said Mr. Lorry. "'I am thankful,' repeated the doctor, bending his head with reverence. "'There are two other points,' said Mr. Lorry, "'on which I am anxious to be instructed. May I go on?' "'You cannot do your friend a better service,' the doctor gave him his hand. To the first, then, he is of a studious habit, and unusually energetic. He implies himself with great ardor to the acquisition of professional knowledge, to the conducting of experiments, to many things. Now, does he do too much? I think not. It may be the character of his mind to be 
always in singular need of occupation, that may be in part natural to it, in part the result of affliction, the less of it was occupied with healthy things, the more it would be in danger of turning in the unhealthy direction. He may have observed himself and made the discovery. You're sure he is not under too great a strain? I think I am quite sure of it. My dear Manette, if he were overworked now, my dear Lorry, I doubt if that could easily be. There has been a violent stress in one direction, and it needs a counterweight. Excuse me, as a persistent man of business, assuming for a moment that he was overworked, it would show itself in some renewal of this disorder? I do not think so. I do not think, said Dr. Manette, with the firmness of self-conviction, that anything but the one train of association could renew it. I think that henceforth nothing but some extraordinary jarring of that cord could renew it. After what has happened, and after his recovery, I find it difficult to imagine any such violent sounding of that string again. I trust, and I almost believe, that the circumstances likely to renew it are exhausted. He spoke with the diffidence of a man who knew how slight a thing would overset the delicate organization of the mind, and yet with the confidence of a man who had slowly won his assurance out of personal endurance and distress. It was not for his friend to abate that confidence. He professed himself more relieved and encouraged than he really was, and approached his second and last point. He felt it to be the most difficult of all, but remembering his old Sunday morning conversation with Miss Pross, and remembering what he had seen in the last nine days, he knew that he must face it. The occupation, resumed under the influence of this passing affliction, so happily recovered from, said Mr. Lorry, clearing his throat, we will call blacksmith's work. Blacksmith's work. We will say, to put a case, as for the sake of illustration, that he had been used in his bad time to work at a little forge. We will say that he had been unexpectedly found at his forge again. Is that not a pity that he should keep it by him? The doctor shaded his forehead with his hand and beat his foot nervously to the ground. "'He has always kept it by him,' said Mr. Lorry, with an anxious look at his friend. "'Now, would it not be better that he should let it go?' Still the doctor, with shaded forehead, beat his foot nervously on the ground. "'You do not find it easy to advise me?' said Mr. Lorry. I quite understand it to be a nice question, and yet I think—and here he shook his head and stopped. "'You see,' said Dr. Manette, turning to him after an uneasy pause, "'it is very hard to explain consistently the innermost workings of this poor man's mind. He once yearned so frightfully for that occupation, and it was so welcome when it came. No doubt it relieved his pain so much by substituting the perplexity of the fingers for the perplexity of the brain, and by substituting, as he became more practiced, the ingenuity of the hands for the ingenuity of the mental torture that he had never been able to bear the thought of putting it quite out of his reach. Even now, when I believe he is more hopeful of himself than he has ever been, and even speaks of himself with a kind of confidence, the idea that he might need that old employment and not find it gives him a sudden sense of terror, like that which one may fancy strikes the heart of a lost child. He looked like his illustration, as he raised his eyes to Mr. Lorry's face. But may not, 
Mind, I ask for information as a plodding man of business, who only deals with such material objects as guineas, shillings, and banknotes. May not the retention of the thing involve the retention of the idea? If the thing were gone, my dear Manette, might not fear go with it? In short, is it not a concession to the misgiving to keep the forge? There was another silence. "'You see, too,' said the doctor tremulously, "'it is such an old companion.' "'I would not keep it,' said Mr. Lorry, shaking his head, "'for he gained in firmness as he saw the doctor disquieted. "'I would recommend him to sacrifice it. "'I only want your authority. "'I am sure it does no good. "'Come.' Give me your authority, like a good dear man, for his daughter's sake, my dear Manette. Very strange to see what a struggle there was within him. In her name, then, let it be done. I sanction it. But I would not take it away while he was present. Let it be removed when he is not there. Let him miss his old companion after an absence. Mr. Lorry readily engaged for that, and the conference was ended. They passed the day in the country, and the doctor was quite restored. On the three following days he remained perfectly well, and on the fourteenth day he went away to join Lucy and her husband. The precaution that had been taken into account for his silence Mr. Lorry had previously explained to him, and he had written to Lucy in accordance with it, and she held no suspicions. On the night of the day on which he left the house, Mr. Lorry went into the room with a chopper, saw, chisel, and hammer, attended by Miss Pross carrying a light. There, with closed doors, and in a mysterious and guilty manner, Mr. Lorry hacked the shoemaker's bench to pieces, while Miss Pross held the candle as if she were assisting at a murder, for which, indeed, in her grimness she was no unsuitable figure. The burning of the body, previously reduced to pieces convenient for the purpose, was commenced without delay in the kitchen fire, and the tools, shoes, and leather were buried in the garden. So wicked do destruction and secrecy appear to honest minds that Mr. Lorry and Miss Pross, while engaged in the commission of their deed and in the removal of its traces, almost felt and almost looked like accomplices in a horrible crime. So ends Chapter 2, Part 19 an opinion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kent Fulmer. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book 2, Chapter 20. A Plea. When the newly married pair came home, the first person who appeared to offer his congratulations was Sidney Carton. They had not been at home many hours when he presented himself. He was not improved in habits or in looks or in manner, but there was a certain rugged air of fidelity about him which was new to the observation of Charles Darnay. He watched his opportunity of taking Darnay aside into a window and of speaking to him when no one overheard. "'Mr. Darnay,' said Carton, "'I wish we might be friends.' We're already friends, I hope. You are good enough to say so as a fashion of speech, but I don't mean any fashion of speech. Indeed, when I say I wish we might be friends, I scarcely mean quite that either. Charles Darnay, as was natural, asked him in all good humor and good fellowship what did he mean. Upon my life, said Carton, smiling, I find it easier to comprehend in my own mind than to convey to yours. However, let me try. You remember a certain famous occasion when I was more drunk than, than usual? I remember a certain famous occasion when you forced me to confess that you had been drinking. I remember it, too. The curse of those occasions is heavy upon me, for I always remember them. 
I hope it may be taken into account one day when all days are at an end for me. Don't be alarmed. I am not going to preach. I am not at all alarmed. Earnestness in you is anything but alarming to me. Ah, said Carton, with a careless wave of his hand, as if he waved that away. On the drunken occasion in question, one of a large number, as you know, I was insufferable about liking you and not liking you. I wish you would forget it. I forgot it long ago. Fashion of speech again. But, Mr. Darnay, oblivion is not so easy to me as you represent it to be to you. I have by no means forgotten it, and a light answer does not help me to forget it. If it was a light answer, returned Darnay, I beg your forgiveness for it. I had no other object than to turn a slight thing, which to my surprise seems to trouble you too much aside. I declare to you on the faith of a gentleman that I have long dismissed it from my mind. Good heaven! What was there to dismiss? Have I had nothing more important to remember in the great service you rendered me that day? As to the great service, said Carton, I am bound to avow to you, when you speak of it that way, that it was mere professional claptrap. I don't know that I cared what became of you when I rendered it. Mind, I say when I rendered it, I am speaking of the past. You make light of the obligation, returned Darnay, but I will not quarrel with your light answer. Genuine truth, Mr. Darnay, trust me. I have gone aside from my purpose. I was speaking about our being friends. Now you know me. You know I am incapable of all the higher and better flights of men. If you doubt it, ask Stryver, and he'll tell you so. I prefer to form my own opinion without the aid of his. Well, at any rate, you know me as a dissolute dog who has never done any good and never will. I don't know that you never will. But I do, and you must take my word for it. Well, if you could endure to have such a worthless fellow, and a fellow of such indifferent reputation, coming and going at odd times, I should ask that I might be permitted to come and go as a privileged person here, that I might be regarded as a useless, and, I would add, if it were not for the resemblance I detected between you and me, an unornamental piece of furniture, tolerated for its old service, and taken no notice of. I doubt if I should abuse the permission. It is a hundred to one if I should avail myself of it four times in a year. It would satisfy me, I dare say, to know that I had it. Will you try? That is another way of saying that I am placed on the footing I have indicated. I thank you, Darnay. I may use that freedom with your name. I think so, Carton, by this time. They shook hands upon it, and Sidney turned away. Within a minute afterwards, he was, to all outward appearances, as unsubstantial as ever. When he was gone, and in the course of an evening passed with Miss Pross, the doctor, and Mr. Lorry, Charles Darnay made some mention of this conversation in general terms, and spoke of Sidney Carton as a problem of carelessness and recklessness. He spoke of him in short, not bitterly, or meaning to bear hard upon him, but as anybody might who saw him as he showed himself. He had no idea that this could dwell in the thoughts of his fair young wife, but when he afterwards joined her in their own rooms, he found her waiting for him with the old pretty lifting of the forehead strongly marked. "'We are thoughtful tonight,' said Darnay, drawing his arm about her. "'Yes, dearest Charles,' with her hands on his breast and the inquiring and attentive expression fixed upon him. "'We are rather thoughtful tonight, for we have something on our mind tonight.' "'What is it, my Lucy?' Will you promise not to press one question on me, if I beg you not to ask it? Will I promise? What will I not promise you, my love? What indeed? With his hand putting aside the golden hair from the cheek, and his other hand against the heart that beat for him. I think, Charles, poor Mr. Carton deserves more consideration and respect than you expressed for him tonight. Indeed, my own? Why so? That is what you are not to ask me. But I think... I know he does. If you know it, it is enough. What would you have me do, my life? I would ask you, my dearest, to be very generous with him always, and very lenient on his faults when he is not by. I would ask you to believe that he has a heart he very, very seldom reveals, and that there are deep wounds in it. My dear, I have seen it bleeding. It is a painful reflection to me, said Charles Darnay, quite astounded, that I should have done him any wrong. I never thought this of him. My husband, it is so. I fear he is not to be reclaimed. There is scarcely a hope that anything in his character or fortunes is repairable now, but I am sure he is capable of good things, gentle things, even magnanimous things. 
She looked so beautiful in the purity of her faith in this lost man that her husband could have looked at her as she was for hours. And, oh, my dearest love, she urged, clinging nearer to him, laying her head upon his breast and raising her eyes to his. Remember how strong we are in our happiness and how weak he is in his misery. The supplication touched him home. I will always remember it, dear heart. I will remember it as long as I live. He bent over the golden head and put the rosy lips to his and folded her in his arms. If one forlorn wanderer then pacing the dark streets could have heard her innocent disclosure and could have seen the drops of pity kissed away by her husband from the soft blue eyes so loving of that husband, he might have cried to the night and the words would not have parted from his lips for the first time. God bless her for her sweet compassion. End of Book 2, Chapter 20 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This chapter read by Zale Schaefer A Tale of Two Cities Book Two, The Golden Thread Chapter 21, Echoing Footsteps A wonderful corner for echoes, it has been remarked, that corner where the doctor lived, ever busily winding the golden thread which bound her husband and her father and herself and her old directress and companion in a life of quiet bliss, Lucy sat in the still house in the tranquilly resounding corner, listening to the echoing footsteps of years. At first there were times, though she was a perfectly happy young wife, when her work would slowly fall from her hands and her eyes would be dimmed. For there was something coming in the echoes, something light, afar off, and scarcely audible yet, that stirred her heart too much. Fluttering hopes and doubts, hopes of a love as yet unknown to her, doubts of her remaining upon earth to enjoy that new delight, divided her breast. Among the echoes, then, there would arise the sound of footsteps at her own early grave, and thoughts of the husband who would be left so desolate and who would mourn for her so much swelled to her eyes and broke like waves. That time passed, and her little Lucy lay on her bosom. Then among the advancing echoes there was the tread of her tiny feet and the sound of her prattling words. Let greater echoes resound as they would. The young mother at the cradle-side could always hear those coming. They came, and the shady house was sunny with a child's laugh, and the divine friend of children, to whom in her trouble she had confided hers, seemed to take her child in his arms as he took the child of old and made it a sacred joy to her. Ever busily winding the golden thread that bound them all together, weaving the service of her happy influence through the tissue of all their lives, and making it predominate nowhere, Lucy heard in the echoes of years none but friendly and soothing sounds. Her husband's step was strong and prosperous among them, her father's firm and equal. Lo, Miss Pross, in harness of string, awakening the echoes as an unruly charger, whip-corrected, snorting and pawing the earth under the plane tree in the garden. Even when there were sounds of sorrow among the rest, they were not harsh nor cruel. Even when golden hair like her own lay in a halo on a pillow round the worn face of a little boy, and he said with a radiant smile, Dear Papa and Mamma, I am very sorry to leave you both, and to leave my pretty sister, but I am called and I must go. Those were not tears all of agony that wetted his young mother's cheek, as the spirit departed from her embrace that had been entrusted to it. Suffer them and forbid them not. They see my father's face. O oh, father, blessed words! Thus the rustling of an angel's wings got blended with the other echoes, and they were not wholly of earth, but had in them that breath of heaven. Sighs of the winds that blew over a little garden tomb were mingled with them also, and both were audible to Lucy, in a hushed murmur, like the breathing of a summer sea asleep upon a sandy shore, as the little Lucy, comically studious at the task of the morning, or dressing a doll at her mother's footstool, chattered in the tongues of the two cities that were blended in her life. The echoes rarely answered to the actual tread of Sidney Carton. 
Some half dozen times a year at most he claimed his privilege of coming in uninvited, and would sit among them through the evening as he had once done often. He never came there heated with wine, and one other thing regarding him was whispered in the echoes, which has been whispered by all true echoes for ages and ages. No man ever really loved a woman, lost her, and knew her with a blameless though an unchanged mind, when she was a wife and a mother, but her children had a strange sympathy with him, an indistinct delicacy of pity for him. What fine hidden sensibilities are touched in such a case no echoes tell, but it is so, and it was so here. Carton was the first stranger to whom little Lucy held out her chubby arms, and he kept his place with her as she grew. The little boy had spoken of him almost at the last. Poor Carton, kiss him for me. Mr. Stryver shouldered his way through the law, like some great engine forcing itself through turbid water, and dragged his useful friend in his wake, like a boat towed astern. As the boat so favored is usually in a rough plight, and mostly under water, so Sidney had a swamped life of it. But easy and strong custom, unhappily so much easier and stronger in him than any stimulating sense of desert or disgrace, made it the life he was to lead, and he no more thought of emerging from his state of lion's jackal than any real jackal may be supposed to think of rising to be a lion. Stryver was rich, had married a florid widow with property and three boys who had nothing particularly shining about them but the straight hair of their dumpling heads. These three gentlemen, Mr. Stryver, exuding patronage of the most offensive quality from every poor, had walked before him like three sheep to the quiet corner in Soho, and had offered as pupils to Lucy's husband, delicately saying, Hello, here are three lumps of bread and cheese toward your matrimonial picnic, Darnay. The polite rejection of the three lumps of bread and cheese had quite bloated Mr. Stryver with indignation, which he afterwards turned to account in the training of the young gentlemen by directing them to beware of the pride of beggars, like that Tudor fellow. He was also in the habit of declaiming to Mrs. Stryver, over his full-bodied wine, on the arts Mrs. Darnay had once put in practice to catch him, and on the diamond-cut diamond arts in himself, madam, which had rendered him not to be caught. Some of his King's Bench familiars, who were occasionally parties to the full-bodied wine and the lie, excused him for the latter by saying that he had told it so often that he believed it himself, which is surely such an incorrigible aggravation of an originally bad offence as to justify any such offenders being carried off to some suitably retired spot and there hanged out of the way. These were among the echoes to which Lucy, sometimes pensive, sometimes amused and laughing, listened in the echoing corner until her little daughter was six years old. How near to her heart the echoes of her child's tread came, and those of her own dear father's, always active and self-possessed, and those of her dear husband's need not be told. Nor how the lightest echo of their united home, directed by herself with such a wise and elegant thrift that it was more abundant than any waste, was music to her. Nor how there were echoes all about her, sweet in her ears, of the many times her father had told her that he found her more devoted to him married, if that could be, than single, and of the many times her husband had said to her that no cares and duties seemed to divide her love for him, or her help to him, and asked her, What is the magic secret, my darling, of your being everything to all of us, as if there were only one of us, yet never seeming to be hurried, or to have too much to do? But there were other echoes from a distance, that rumbled menacingly in the corner all through this space of time. And it was now, about Lucy's sixth birthday, that they began to have an awful sound, as of a great storm in France with a dreadful sea rising. On a night in mid-July, 1,789, Mr. Lorry came in late from Telson's, and sat himself down by Lucy and her husband in the dark window. It was a hot, wild night, and they were all three reminded of the old Sunday night when they had looked at the lightning from the same place. "'I began to think,' said Mr. Lorry, pushing his brown wig back, "'that I should have to pass the night at Telson's. We have been so full of business all day that we have not known what to do first or which way to turn. There is such an uneasiness in Paris that we have actually a run of confidence upon us. Our customers over there seem not to be able to confide their property to us fast enough.' 
there is positively a mania among them for sending it to England. That has a bad look, said Darnay. A bad look, you say, my dear Darnay? Yes, but we don't know what reason there is in it. People are so unreasonable. Some of us at Telson's are getting old, and we really can't be troubled out of the ordinary course without due occasion. Still, said Darnay, you know how gloomy and threatening the sky is. I know that to be sure, assented Mr. Lorry, trying to persuade himself that his sweet temper was soured and that he grumbled. But I am determined to be peevish after my long day's botheration. Where is Manette? Here he is, said the doctor, entering the dark room at the moment. I am quite glad you are at home, for these hurries and forebodings by which I have been surrounded all day have made me nervous without reason. You are not going out, I hope. No, I am going to play backgammon with you, if you like, said the doctor. I don't think I do like, if I may speak my mind. I am not fit to be pitted against you to-night. Is the tea-board still there, Lucy? I can't see. Of course, it has been kept for you. Thank ye, my dear. The precious child is safe in bed. And sleeping soundly. That's right. All safe and well. I don't know why anything should be otherwise than safe and well here, thank God but I have been so put out all day, and I am not as young as I was. My tea, my dear, thank ye. Now come and take your place in the circle. Let us sit quiet and hear the echoes about which you have your theory. Not a theory. It was a fancy. A fancy, then, my wise pet, said Mr. Lorry, patting her hand. They are very numerous and very loud, though, are they not? Only hear them headlong mad and dangerous footsteps to force their way into anybody's life footsteps not easily made clean again if once stained red the footsteps raging in st antoine afar off as the little circle sat in the dark london window st antoine had been that morning a vast dusky mask of scarecrows heaving to and fro with frequent gleams of light above the billowy heads where steel blades and bayonets shone in the sun a tremendous roar arose from the throat of St. Antoine, and a forest of naked arms struggled in the air like shriveled branches of trees in a winter wind, all the fingers convulsively clutching at every weapon or semblance of a weapon that was thrown up from the depths below, no matter how far off. Who gave them out, whence they last came, where they began, through what agency they crookedly quivered and jerked, scores at a time, over the heads of the crowd, like a kind of lightning, no eye in the throng could have told. But muskets were being distributed. So were cartridges, powder and ball, bars of iron and wood, knives, axes, pikes, every weapon that distracted ingenuity could discover or devise. People who could lay hold of nothing else set themselves with bleeding hands to force stones and bricks out of their places in walls. Every pulse and heart in St. Antoine was on high fever strain and at high fever heat. Every living creature there held life as of no account and was demented with a passionate readiness to sacrifice it. As a whirlpool of boiling waters has a center point, so all this raging circled round Defarge's wine shop, and every human drop in the cauldron had a tendency to be sucked toward the vortex where Defarge himself, already begrimed with gunpowder and sweat, issued orders, issued arms, thrust this man back, dragged this man forward, disarmed one to arm another, labored and strove in the thickest of the uproar. "'Keep near to me, Jacques Three, cried Defarge, "'and do you, Jacques One and Two, "'separate and put yourselves at the head "'of as many of these patriots as you can. "'Where is my wife?' "'Eh, well, here you see me,' said Madame, "'composed as ever, but not knitting to-day. "'Madame's resolute right hand was occupied with an axe "'in place of the usual softer implements, "'and in her girdle were a pistol and a cruel knife. "'Where do you go, my wife?' "'I go,' said Madame, "'with you at present.' "'You shall see me at the head of women by and by.' "'Come, then!' cried Defarge, in a resounding voice. "'Patriots and friends, we are ready! The Bastille!' With a roar that sounded as if all the breath in France had been shaped into the detested word, the living sea rose, wave on wave, depth on depth, and overflowed the city to that point. Alarm bells ringing, drums beating, the sea raging and thundering on its new beach, the attack begun. Deep ditches, double drawbridge, massive stone walls, eight great towers, cannon, muskets, fire and smoke. 
through the fire and through the smoke, in the fire and in the smoke, for the sea cast him up against a cannon, and on the instant he became a cannoneer. Defarge of the wine-shop worked like a manful soldier two fierce hours. Deep ditch, single drawbridge, massive stone walls, eight great towers, cannon, muskets, fire and smoke. One drawbridge down. Work, comrades, all work! Work, Jacques one, Jacques two, Jacques one thousand, Jacques two thousand, Jacques five and twenty thousand, in the name of all the angels or the devils which you prefer, work! Thus Defarge of the wine-shop, still at his gun, which had long grown hot. To me, women, cried Madame his wife, what, we can kill as well as the men when the place is taken? And to her, with a shrill, thirsty cry, trooping women variously armed, but all armed alike in hunger and revenge cannon muskets fire and smoke but still the deep ditch the single drawbridge the massive stone walls and the eight great towers slight displacements of the raging sea made by the falling wounded flashing weapons blazing torches smoking wagon loads of wet straw hard work at neighboring barricades in all directions shrieks volleys execrations bravery without stint boom smash and rattle and the furious sounding of the living sea but still the deep ditch, and the single drawbridge, and the massive stone walls, and the eight great towers, and still Defarge of the wine-shop at his gun, grown doubly hot by the service of four fierce hours. A white flag from within the fortress, and a parley, this dimly perceptible through the raging storm, nothing audible in it. Suddenly the sea rose immeasurably wider and higher, and swept Defarge of the wine-shop over the lower drawbridge, past the massive outer stone walls, in among the eight great towers surrendered. So resistless was the force of the ocean bearing him on, that even to draw his breath or turn his head was as impracticable as if he had been struggling in the surf at the South Sea, until he was landed in the outer courtyard of the Bastille. There, against an angle of a wall, he made a struggle to look about him. Jacques III was nearly at his side. Madame Defarge, still heading some of her women, was visible in the inner distance, and her knife was in her hand. Everywhere was tumult, exultation, deafening and maniacal bewilderment, astounding noise, yet furious dumb show. The prisoners! The records! The secret cells! The instruments of torture! The prisoners! Of all these cries and ten thousand incoherencies, the prisoners! was the cry most taken up by the sea that rushed in, as if there were an eternity of people as well as of time and space. When the foremost billows rolled past, bearing the prison officers with them and threatening them all with instant death if any secret nook remained undisclosed, Defarge laid his strong hand on the breast of one of these men, a man with a gray head who had a lighted torch in his hand, separated him from the rest, and got him between himself and the wall. "'Show me the north tower,' said Defarge. "'Quick!' "'I will, faithfully,' replied the man, "'if you will come with me. "'But there is no one there.' "'What is the meaning of one hundred and five north tower?' asked Defarge. "'Quick!' "'The meaning, monsieur? "'Does it mean a captive or a place of captivity? "'Or do you mean that I shall strike you dead?' "'Kill him!' croaked Jacques Three, who had come close up. Monsieur, it is a cell. Show it me. Pass this way, then. Jacques Three, with his usual craving on him, and evidently disappointed by the dialogue taking a turn that did not seem to promise bloodshed, held by Defarge's arm, as he held by the turnkeys. Their three heads had been close together during this brief discourse and it had been as much as they could do to hear one another even then, so tremendous was the noise of the living ocean, in its eruption into the fortress, and its inundation of the courts and passages and staircases. All around, outside, too, it beat the walls with a deep, hoarse roar, from which occasionally some partial shouts of tumult broke and leaped into the air like spray. Through gloomy vaults where the light of day had never shone, past hideous doors of dark dens and cages, down cavernous flights of steps, and again up steep rugged ascents of stone and brick, more like dry waterfalls than staircases, Defarge, the turnkey, and Jacques Three, linked hand and arm, went with all the speed they could make. 
Here and there, especially at first, the inundation started on them and swept by, but when they had done descending and were winding and climbing up a tower, they were alone. Hemmed in here by the massive thickness of walls and arches, the storm within the fortress and without was only audible to them in a dull, subdued way, as if the noise out of which they had come had almost destroyed their sense of hearing. The turnkey stopped at a low door, put a key in a clashing lock, swung the door slowly open, and said, as they all bent their heads and passed in, One hundred and five North Tower. There was a small, heavily grated, unglazed window high in the wall, with a stone screen before it, so that the sky could be only seen by stooping low and looking up. There was a small chimney, heavily barred across, a few feet within. There was a heap of old feathery wood ashes on the hearth. There was a stool, and table, and a straw bed. There were the four blackened walls and a rusted iron ring in one of them. "'Pass that torch slowly along these walls that I may see them,' said Defarge to the turnkey. The man obeyed, and Defarge followed the light closely with his eyes. "'Stop! Look here, Jacques!' "'A.M.' croaked Jacques Three as he read greedily. "'Alexandre Manette,' said Defarge in his ear, following the leathers with his swarthy forefinger, deeply ingrained with gunpowder. And here he wrote, A poor physician. And it was he, without doubt, who scratched a calendar on this stone. What is that in your hand? A crowbar? Give it me. He had still the linstock of his gun in his own hand. He made a sudden exchange of the two instruments, and turning on the worm-eaten stool and table, beat them to pieces in a few blows. "'Hold the light higher,' he said wrathfully to the turnkey. "'Look among those fragments with care, Jacques, and see. Here is my knife,' throwing it to him. "'Rip open that bed and search the straw. Hold the light higher, you!' With a menacing look at the turnkey, he crawled upon the hearth, and peering up the chimney, struck and prized at its sides with the crowbar, and worked at the iron grating across it. In a few minutes some mortar and dust came dropping down, which he averted his face to avoid, and in it, and in the old wood ashes, and in a crevice in the chimney into which his weapon had slipped or wrought itself, he groped with a cautious touch. "'Nothing in the wood, and nothing in the straw, Jacques?' "'Nothing.' "'Let us collect them together in the middle of the cell. So, light them, you!' The turnkey fired the little pile, which blazed high and hot. Stooping again to come out at the low arched door, they left it burning and retraced their way to the courtyard, seeming to recover their sense of hearing as they came down, until they were in the raging flood once more. They found it surging and tossing in quest of Defarge himself. St. Antoine was clamorous to have its wine-shop keeper foremost in the guard upon the governor who had defended the Bastille and shot the people. Otherwise the governor would not be marched to the Hôtel de Ville for judgment. Otherwise the governor would escape, and the people's blood, suddenly of some value after many years of worthlessness, be unavenged. In the howling universe of passion and contention that seemed to encompass this grim old officer conspicuous in his gray coat and red decoration, there was but one quite steady figure, and that was a woman's. "'See, there is my husband!' she cried, pointing him out. "'See, Defarge!' She stood immovable close to the grim old officer, and remained immovable close to him, remained immovable close to him through the streets, as Defarge and the rest bore him along, remained immovable close to him when he got near his destination, and began to be struck at from behind, remained immovable close to him when the long gathering rain of stabs and blows fell heavy, was so close to him when he dropped dead under it, that suddenly animated, she put her foot upon his neck, and with her cruel knife, long ready, hewed off his head. The hour was come when St. Antoine was to execute his horrible idea of hoisting up men for lamps to show what he could be and do. St. Antoine's blood was up, and the blood of tyranny and domination by the iron hand was down, down on the steps of the Hôtel de Ville, where the governor's body lay down on the sole of the shoe of Madame Defarge, where she had trodden on the body to steady it for mutilation. "'Lower the lamp yonder!' cried St. Antoine, after glaring round for a new means of death. 
Here is one of his soldiers to be left on guard. The swinging sentinel was posted, and the sea rushed on. The sea of black and threatening waters, and of destructive upheaving of wave against wave, whose depths were yet unfathomed, and whose forces were yet unknown. The remorseless sea of turbulently swaying shapes, voices of vengeance, and faces hardened in the furnaces of suffering, until the touch of pity could make no mark on them. But in the ocean of faces, where every fierce and furious expression was in vivid life, there were two groups of faces, each seven in number, so fixedly contrasting with the rest, that never did sea roll which bore more memorable wrecks with it. Seven faces of prisoners, suddenly released by the storm that had burst their tomb, were carried high overhead, all scared, all lost, all wondering and amazed, as if the last day were come and those who rejoiced around them were lost spirits. Other seven faces there were, carried higher, seven dead faces, whose drooping eyelids and half-seen eyes awaited the last day. Impassive faces, yet with a suspended, not an abolished, expression on them. Faces rather in a fearful pause, as having yet to raise the dropped lids of the eyes and bear witness with the bloodless lips. Thou didst it. Seven prisoners released, seven gory heads on pikes, the keys of the accursed fortress of the eight strong towers, some discovered letters and other memorials of prisoners of old time, long dead of broken hearts. Such and such like the loudly echoing footsteps of St. Antoine escort through the Paris streets in mid-July, 1789. Now heaven defeat the fancy of Lucy Darnay, and keep these feet far out of her life, for they are headlong, mad, and dangerous, and in the years so long after the breaking of the cask at Defarge's wine-shop door, they are not easily purified when once stained red. End of chapter 21Haggard St. Antoine had had only one exultant week in which to soften his modicum of hard and bitter bread to such extent as he could, with the relish of fraternal embraces and congratulations, when Madame Defarge sat at her counter as usual, presiding over the customers. Madame Defarge wore no rose in her head, for the great brotherhood of spies had become, even in one short week, extremely chary of trusting themselves to the saints' mercies. The lamps across his streets had a portentously elastic swing with them. Madame Defarge, with her arms folded, sat in the morning light and heat, contemplating the wine-shop and the street. In both there were several knots of loungers, squalid and miserable, but now with a manifest sense of power enthroned on their distress. The raggedest nightcap, awry on the wretchedest head, had this crooked significance in it. I know how hard it has grown for me, the wearer of this, to support life in myself. But do you know how easy it has grown for me, the wearer of this, to destroy life in you? Every lean bare arm that had been without work before had this work always ready for it now, that it could strike. The fingers of the knitting women were vicious, with the experience that they could tear. There was a change in the appearance of St. Antoine. The image had been hammering into this for hundreds of years, and the last finishing blows had told mightily on the expression. Madame Defarge sat observing it with such suppressed approval as was to be desired in the leader of the St. Antoine women. One of her sisterhood knitted beside her. The short, rather plump wife of a starved grocer, and the mother of two children withal, this lieutenant had already earned the complimentary name of the Vengeance. Hark, said the vengeance, listen then, who comes? 
as if a train of powder laid from the outermost bound of the St. Antoine quarter to the wine-shop door had been suddenly fired, a fast-spreading murmur came rushing along. "'It is Defarge,' said Madame. "'Silence, patriots!' Defarge came in breathless, pulled off a red cap he wore, and looked around him. "'Listen everywhere,' said Madame again. "'Listen to him!' Defarge stood, panting, against a background of eager eyes and open mouths formed outside the door. All those within the wine-shop had sprung to their feet. "'Say then, my husband, what is it?' "'News from the other world.' "'How then?' cried Madame, contemptuously. "'The other world?' "'Does everybody here recall old Foulon, who told the famished people that they might eat grass, and who died and went to hell?' "'Everybody!' from all throats. The news is of him. He is among us. Among us, from the universal throat again. And dead? Not dead. He feared us so much, and with reason, that he caused himself to be represented as dead, and had a grand mock funeral. But they have found him alive, hiding in the country, and have brought him in. I have seen him but now, on his way to the Hôtel de Ville, a prisoner. Have I said he had reason to fear us? Say all. Had he reason? Wretched old sinner of more than threescore years and ten, if he had never known it yet, he would have known it in his heart of hearts if he could have heard the answering cry. A moment of profound silence followed. Defarge and his wife looked steadfastly at one another. The vengeance stooped, and the jar of a drum was heard as she moved it at her feet behind the counter. "'Patriots,' said Defarge in a determined voice, "'are we ready?' Instantly Madame Defarge's knife was in her girdle, the drum was beating in the streets as if it and a drummer had flown together by magic, and the vengeance, uttering terrific shrieks and flinging her arms about her head like all the forty furies at once, was tearing from house to house, rousing the women. The men were terrible in the bloody-minded anger with which they looked from windows, caught up what arms they had and came pouring down into the streets. But the women were a sight to chill the boldest. From such household occupations as their bare poverty yielded, from their children, from their aged and their sick crouching on the bare ground, famished and naked, they ran out with streaming hair, urging one another and themselves to madness with the wildest cries and actions. Villain Foulon taken, my sister! Old Foulon taken, my mother! Miscreant Foulon taken, my daughter! Then a score of others ran into the midst of these, beating their breasts, tearing their hair, and screaming, Foulon alive! Foulon who told the starving people they might eat grass! Foulon who told my old father that he might eat grass when I had no bread to give him! Foulon who told my baby it might suck grass when these breasts were dry with want! O oh, mother of God, this Foulon, O oh, heaven, our suffering, hear me, my dead baby and my withered father, I swear on my knees, on these stones, to avenge you on Foulon. Husbands and brothers and young men, give us the blood of Foulon, give us the heart of Foulon, give us the body and soul of Foulon, rend Foulon to pieces and dig him into the ground that grass may grow from him. With these cries, numbers of the women, lashed into blind frenzy, whirled about, striking and tearing at their own friends, until they dropped into a passionate swoon, and were only saved by the men belonging to them from being trampled underfoot. Nevertheless, not a moment was lost, not a moment. This Foulon was at the Hôtel de Ville, and might be loosed. Never if Saint Antoine knew his own sufferings, insults, and wrongs. Armed men and women flocked out of the quarter so fast, and drew even these last dregs after them with such a force of suction, that within a quarter of an hour there was not a human creature in St. Antoine's bosom, but a few old crones and the wailing children. No, they were all by that time choking the hall of examination, where this old man, ugly and wicked, was, and overflowing into the adjacent open space and streets. The Defarges, husband and wife, the Vengeance, the Jacques Three, were in the first press, and at no great distance from him in the hall. "'See!' cried Madame, pointing with her knife. "'See the old villain bound with ropes! That was well done to tie a bunch of grass upon his back! Ha ha! That was well done! Let him eat it now!' Madame put her knife under her arm and clapped her hands as at a play. 
the people immediately behind Madame Dufarge explaining the cause of her satisfaction to those behind them, and those again explaining to others and those to others, the neighboring streets resounded with the clapping of hands. Similarly, during two or three hours of drawl and the winnowing of many bushels of words, Madame Defarge's frequent expressions of impatience were taken up with marvelous quickness at a distance, the more readily because certain men who had by some wonderful exercise of agility climbed up the external architecture to look in from the windows knew Madame Defarge well and acted as a telegraph between her and the crowd outside the building. At length the sun rose up so high that it struck a kindly ray as of hope or protection directly down upon the old prisoner's head. The favor was too much to bear. In an instant the barrier of dust and chaff that had stood surprisingly long went to the winds and St. Antoine had got him. It was known directly to the furthest confines of the crowd. Defarge had but sprung over a railing at a table and folded the miserable wretch in a deadly embrace. Madame Defarge had but followed and turned her hand in one of the ropes with which he was tied. The Vengeance and Jacques Three were not yet up with them, and the men at the windows had not yet swooped into the hall like birds of prey from their high perches, when the cry seemed to go up all over the city, "'Bring him out! Bring him to the lamp!' Down and up, and head foremost on the steps of the building, now on his knees, now on his feet, now on his back dragged and struck at and stifled by the bunches of grass and straw that were thrust into his face by hundreds of hands torn bruised panting bleeding yet always entreating and beseeching for mercy now full of vehement agony of action with a small clear space about him as the people drew one another back that they might see now a log of dead wood drawn through a forest of legs he was hauled to the nearest street corner where one of the fatal lamps swung, and there Madame Dufarge let him go, as a cat might have done to a mouse, and silently and composedly looked at him while they made ready, and while he besought her, the women passionately screeching at him all the time, and the men sternly calling out to have him killed with grass in his mouth. Once he went aloft, and the rope broke, and they caught him shrieking, Twice he went aloft, and the rope broke, and they caught him shrieking. Then the rope was merciful and held him, and his head was soon upon a pike, with grass enough in the mouth for all St. Antoine to dance at the sight of. Nor was this the end of the day's bad work, for St. Antoine so shouted and danced his angry blood up that it boiled again on hearing when the day closed that in the son-in-law of the dispatched another of the people's enemies and insulters was coming into Paris under a guard five hundred strong in cavalry alone. St. Antoine wrote his crimes on flaring sheets of paper, seized him, would have torn him out of the breast of an army to bear Foulon company, set his head and heart on pikes, and carried the three spoils of the day in wolf procession through the streets. Not before dark did the men and women come back to the children, wailing and breadless. Then the miserable baker's shops were beset by long files of them, patiently waiting to buy bad bread. And while they waited, with stomachs faint and empty, they beguiled the time by embracing one another on the triumphs of the day, and achieving them again in gossip. Gradually these strings of ragged people shortened and frayed away and then poor lights began to shine in high windows, and slender fires were made in the streets at which neighbors cooked in common, afterwards supping at their doors. Scanty and insufficient suppers those, and innocent of meat, as of most other sauce to wretched bread. Yet human fellowship infused some nourishment into the flinty viands, and struck some sparks of cheerfulness out of them. Fathers and mothers who had had their full share in the worst of the day played gently with their meager children, and lovers with such a world around them and before them loved and hoped. It was almost morning when Defarge's wine shop parted with its last knot of customers, and Monsieur Defarge said to Madame his wife in husky tones while fastening the door, "'At last it is come, my dear.' "'Eh, well,' returned Madame." almost. St. Antoine slept, the Defarges slept, 
Even the vengeance slept with her starved grocer, and the drum was at rest. The drum's was the only voice in St. Antoine that blood and hurry had not changed. The vengeance, as custodian of the drum, could have wakened him up and had the same speech out of him as before the Bastille fell, or old Foulon was seized. Not so with the hoarse tones of the men and women in St. Antoine's bosom. End of chapter 22 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Eastman, February 26, 2006. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book 2, Chapter 23. Fire Rises. There was a change on the village where the fountain fell, and where the mender of roads went forth daily to hammer out of the stones on the highway such morsels of bread as might serve for patches to hold his poor ignorant soul and his poor reduced body together. The prison on the crag was not so dominant as of yore. There were soldiers to guard it, but not many. There were officers to guard the soldiers, but not one of them knew what his men would do, beyond this, that it would probably not be what he was ordered. Far and wide lay a ruined country, yielding nothing but desolation. Every green leaf, every blade of grass and blade of grain, was as shriveled and poor as the miserable people. Everything was bowed down, dejected, oppressed, and broken. Habitations, fences, domesticated animals, men, women, children, and the soil that bore them, all worn out. Monsignor, often a most worthy individual gentleman, was a national blessing, gave a chivalrous tone to things, was a polite example of luxurious and shining life, and a great deal more to equal purpose. Nevertheless, Monsignor as a class had somehow or other, brought things to this. Strange that creation, designed expressly for Monsignor, should be so soon wrung dry and squeezed out. There must be something short-sighted in the eternal arrangements, surely. Thus it was, however, and the last drop of blood having been extracted from the flints, and the last screw of the rack having been turned so often that its purchase crumbled, and it now turned, and turned, with nothing to bite. Monsignor began to run away, from a phenomenon so low and unaccountable. But this was not the change on the village, and on many a village like it. For scores of years gone by, Monsignor had squeezed it, and wrung it, and had seldom graced it with his presence, except for the pleasures of the chase now found in hunting the people, now found in hunting the beasts, for whose preservation Monsignor made edifying spaces of barbarous and barren wilderness. No, the change consisted in the appearance of strange faces of low caste, rather than in the disappearance of the high caste, chiseled, and otherwise beautified and beautifying features of Monsignor. For in these times, as the mender of roads worked solitary, in the dust, not often troubling himself to reflect that dust he was, and to dust he must return, being for the most part too much occupied in thinking how little he had for supper, and how much more he would eat if he had it. In these times, as he raised his eyes from his lonely labor and viewed the prospect, he would see some rough figure approaching on foot, the like of which was once a rarity in those parts, but was now a frequent presence. As it advanced, the mender of roads would discern without surprise that it was a shaggy-haired man of almost barbarian aspect, tall, in wooden shoes that were clumsy even to the eyes of a mender of roads, grim, rough, swart, steeped in the mud and dust of many highways, dank, with the marshy moisture of many low grounds, sprinkled 
with the thorns and leaves and moss of many byways through woods. Such a man came upon him like a ghost at noon in the July weather, as he sat on his heap of stones under a bank, taking such shelter as he could get from a shower of hail. The man looked at him, looked at the village in the hollow, at the mill, and at the prison on the crag. When he had identified these objects in what benighted mind he had, he said, in a dialect that was just intelligible, How goes it, Jacques? All well, Jacques. Touch, then. They joined hands, and the man sat down on the heap of stones. No dinner? Nothing but supper now, said the mender of roads, with a hungry face. It is the fashion, growled the man. I meet no dinner anywhere. He took out a blackened pipe, filled it, lighted it with flint and steel, pulled at it until it was in a bright glow, then suddenly held it from him and dropped something into it from between his finger and thumb that blazed and went out in a puff of smoke. Touch, then. It was the turn of the mender of roads to say it this time, after observing these operations. They again joined hands. Tonight, said the mender of roads. Tonight, said the man, putting the pipe in his mouth. Where? Here. He and the mender of roads sat on the heap of stones, looking silently at one another with the hail driving in between them like a pygmy charge of bayonets, until the sky began to clear over the village. "'Show me,' said the traveller then, moving to the brow of the hill. "'See,' returned the mender of roads with extended finger, "'you go down here and straight through the street and past the fountain to the devil with all that,' interrupted the other, rolling his eye over the landscape." I go through no streets and past no fountains. Well, well, about two leagues beyond the summit of that hill, above the village. Good. When do you cease to work? At sunset. Will you wake me before departing? I have walked two nights without resting. Let me finish my pipe, and I shall sleep like a child. Will you wake me? Surely. The wayfarer smoked his pipe out, put it in his breast, slipped off his great wooden shoes, and lay down on his back on the heap of stones. He was fast asleep directly. As the road-mender plied his dusty labor, and the hail-clouds, rolling away, revealed bright bars and streaks of sky, which were responded to by silver gleams upon the landscape, the little man who wore a red cap now in place of his blue one, seemed fascinated by the figure on the heap of stones. His eyes were so often turned towards it that he used his tools mechanically, and one would have said to very poor account. The bronze face, the shaggy black hair and beard, the coarse woolen red cap, the rough medley dress of homespun stuff and hairy skins of beasts, the powerful frame attenuated by spare living, and the sullen and desperate compression of the lips in sleep, inspired the mender of roads with awe. The traveller had travelled far, and his feet were footsore, and his ankles chafed and bleeding. His great shoes, stuffed with leaves and grass, had been heavy to drag over the many long leagues, and his clothes were chafed into holes, as he himself was, into sores. Stooping down beside him, the road-mender tried to get a peep at secret weapons in his breast or where not. But in vain, for he slept with his arms crossed upon him, and set as resolutely as his lips. Fortified towns with their stockades, guardhouses, gates, trenches, and drawbridges, seemed to the mender of roads to be so much air as against this figure. And when he lifted his eyes from it to the horizon and looked around, he saw in his small fancy similar figures, stopped by no obstacle, 
tending to centers all over France. The man slept on, indifferent to showers of hail and intervals of brightness, to sunshine on his face and shadow, to the paltering lumps of dull ice on his body and the diamonds into which the sun changed them, until the sun was low in the west and the sky was glowing. Then the mender of roads, having got his tools together and all things ready to go down into the village, roused him. Good said the sleeper, rising on his elbow. Two leagues beyond the summit of the hill? About. About. Good. The mender of roads went home, with the dust going on before him according to the set of the wind, and was soon at the fountain, squeezing himself in among the lean kine brought there to drink, and appearing even to whisper to them, in his whispering to all the village. When the village had taken its poor supper, it did not creep to bed, as it usually did, but came out of doors again, and remained there. A curious contagion of whispering was upon it, and also, when it gathered together at the fountain in the dark, another curious contagion of looking expectantly at the sky, in one direction only. Monsieur Gabel, chief functionary of the place, became uneasy, went out on his housetop alone, and looked in that direction too, glanced down from behind his chimneys at the darkening faces by the fountain below, and sent word to the sacristan who kept the keys of the church that there might be need to ring the tocsin by and by. The night deepened. The trees environing the old chateau, keeping its solitary state apart, moved in a rising wind, as though they threatened the pile of building massive and dark in the gloom. Up the two terrace flights of steps the rain ran wildly, and beat at the great door, like a swift messenger rousing those within. Uneasy rushes of wind went through the hall, among the old spears and knives, and passed lamenting up the stairs, and shook the curtains of the bed, where the last marquis had slept. East, west, north, and south, through the woods, four heavy treading, unkempt figures crushed the high grass and cracked the branches, striding on cautiously to come together in the courtyard. Four lights broke out there, and moved away in different directions, and all was black again. But not for long, Presently the chateau began to make itself strangely visible by some light of its own, as though it were growing luminous. Then a flickering streak played behind the architecture of the front, picking out transparent places and showing where balustrades, arches, and windows were. Then it soared higher and grew broader and brighter. Soon, from a score of the great windows, flames burst forth, and the stone faces awakened, stared out of fire. A faint murmur arose about the house from the few people who were left there, and there was a saddling of a horse and riding away. There was spurring and slashing through the darkness, and bridle was drawn in the space by the village fountain, and the horse in a foam stood at Monsieur Gabel's door. Help, Gabel! Help, everyone! The tocsin rang impatiently, but other help, if that were any, there was none. The mender of roads and two hundred and fifty particular friends stood with folded arms at the fountain, looking at the pillar of fire in the sky. It must be forty feet high, said they grimly, and never moved. The rider from the chateau and the horse in a foam clattered away through the village and galloped up the stony steep to the prison on the crag. At the gate, a group of officers were looking at the fire. Removed from them, a group of soldiers. Help, gentlemen! Officers! The chateau is on fire! Valuable objects may be saved from the flames by timely aid! Help! Help! The officers looked towards the soldiers, who looked at the fire, gave no orders, 
and answered with shrugs and biting of lips, It must burn. As the rider rattled down the hill again and through the street, the village was illuminating. The mender of roads and the two hundred and fifty particular friends, inspired as one man and woman by the idea of lighting up, had darted into their houses, and were putting candles in every dull little pane of glass. The general scarcity of everything occasioned candles to be borrowed in a rather peremptory manner of Monsieur Gabelle, and in a moment of reluctance and hesitation on that functionary's part, the mender of roads, once so submissive to authority, had remarked that carriages were good to make bonfires with, and that post-horses would roast. The chateau was left to itself to flame and burn. In the roaring and raging of the conflagration, a red-hot wind, driving straight from the infernal regions, seemed to be blowing the edifice away. With the rising and falling of the blaze, the stone faces showed as if they were in torment. When great masses of stone and timber fell, the face with the two dints in the nose became obscured. Anon struggled out of the smoke again, as if it were the face of the cruel Marquis, burning at the stake and contending with the fire. The chateau burned. The nearest trees, laid hold of by the fire, scorched and shriveled. Trees at a distance, fired by the four fierce figures, begirt the blazing edifice with a new forest of smoke. Molten lead and iron boiled in the marble basin of the fountain. The water ran dry. The extinguisher tops of the towers vanished like ice before the heat, and trickled down into four rugged wells of flame. Great rents and splits branched out in the solid walls like crystallization, Stupefied birds wheeled about and dropped into the furnace. Four fierce figures trudged away, east, west, north, and south, along the night-enshrouded roads, guided by the beacon they had lighted, towards their next destination. The illuminated village had seized hold of the toxin, and abolishing the lawful ringer, rang for joy. Not only that, but the village, light-headed with famine, fire, and bell-ringing, and bethinking itself that Monsieur Gabelle had to do with the collection of rent and taxes, though it was but a small installment of taxes, and no rent at all that Gabelle had got in those latter days, became impatient for an interview with him, and surrounding his house summoned him to come forth for personal conference. Whereupon, Monsieur Gabelle did heavily bar his door, and retire to hold counsel with himself. The result of that conference was that Gabelle again withdrew himself to his housetop behind his stack of chimneys, this time resolved, if his door were broken in, he was a small southern man of retaliative temperament, to pitch himself head foremost over the parapet, and crush a man or two below. Probably, Monsieur Gabelle passed a long night up there, with the distant chateau for fire and candle, and the beating at his door, combined with the joy ringing, for music. Not to mention his having an ill-omened lamp slung across the road before his posting-house gate, which the village showed a lively inclination to displace in his favour. A trying suspense, to be passing a whole summer night on the brink of the black ocean, ready to take that plunge into it, upon which Monsieur Gabelle had resolved. But the friendly dawn appearing at last, and the rush candles of the village guttering out, the people happily dispersed, and Monsieur Gabelle came down, bringing his life with him for that while. Within a hundred miles, and in the light of other fires, there were other functionaries less fortunate. That night, and other nights, whom the rising sun found hanging across once peaceful streets where they had been born and bred. Also, there were other villagers and townspeople, less fortunate than the mender of roads and his fellows, upon whom the functionaries and soldiery turned with success, 
and whom they sprung up in their turn. But the fierce figures were steadily wending east, west, north, and south, be that as it would, and whosoever hung, fire burned. The altitude of the gallows that would turn to water and quench it, no functionary, by any stretch of mathematics, was able to calculate successfully. End of Book 2, Chapter 23 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Two, Chapter Twenty Four. Drawn to the Lodestone Rock. In such risings of fire and risings of sea, the firm earth shaken by the rushes of an angry ocean which had now no ebb, but which was always on the flow, higher and higher, to the terror and wonder of the beholders on the shore, three years of tempest were consumed. Three more birthdays of little Lucy had been woven by the golden thread into the peaceful tissue of the life of her home. Many a night and many a day had its inmates listened to the echoes in the corner, with hearts that failed them when they heard the thronging feet. For the footsteps had become to their minds as the footsteps of a people, tumultuous under a red flag, and with their country declared in danger, changed into wild beasts by terrible enchantment, long persisted in. Monseigneur, as a class, had dissociated himself from the phenomenon of his not being appreciated, of his being so little wanted in France, as to incur considerable danger of receiving his dismissal from it and this life together. Like the fabled rustic who raised the devil with infinite pains, and was so terrified at the sight of him that he could ask the enemy no question, but immediately fled, so Monseigneur, after boldly reading the Lord's Prayer backwards for a great number of years, and performing many other potent spells for compelling the evil one, no sooner beheld him in his terrors than he took to his noble heels. The shining bull's-eye of the court was gone, or it would have been the mark for a hurricane of national bullets. It had never been a good eye to see with— had long had the moat in it of Lucifer's pride, Sardanapulus's luxury, and the mould's blindness, but it had dropped out and was gone. The court, from that exclusive inner circle to its outermost rotten ring of intrigue, corruption, and dissimulation, was all gone together. Royalty was gone, had been besieged in its palace, and suspended, when the last tidings came over. The August— of the year one thousand seven hundred and ninety-two was come, and Monseigneur was by this time scattered far and wide. As was natural, the headquarters and great gathering place of Monseigneur in London was Telson's Bank. Spirits are supposed to haunt the places where their bodies most resorted, and Monseigneur, without a guinea, haunted the spot where his guineas used to be. Moreover, it was the spot to which such French intelligence as was most to be relied upon came quickest. Again, Tellson's was a munificent house, and extended great liberality to old customers who had fallen from their high estate. Again, those nobles who had seen the coming storm in time, and anticipating plunder or confiscation, had made provident remittances to Tellson's, were always to be heard of there by their needy brethren. To which it must be added that every newcomer from France reported himself and his tidings at Telson's almost as a matter of course. For such variety of reasons, Telson's was at the time, as to French intelligence, a kind of high exchange, and this was so well known to the public, and the inquiries made there were in consequence so numerous that Telson sometimes wrote the latest news out in a line or so, and posted it in the bank windows, for all who ran through Temple Bar to read. 
On a steaming, misty afternoon, Mr. Lorry sat at his desk, and Charles Darnay stood leaning on it, talking with him in a low voice. The penitential den, once set apart for interviews with the house, was now the news exchange, and was filled to overflowing. It was within half an hour or so of the time of closing. "'But although you are the youngest man that ever lived,' said Charles Darnay, rather hesitating, "'I must still suggest to you—' "'I understand. "'That I am too old,' said Mr. Lorry. "'Unsettled weather, a long journey, uncertain means of travelling, a disorganised country, a city that may not even be safe for you.' "'My dear Charles,' said Mr. Lorry, with cheerful confidence. "'You touch some of the reasons for my going, not for my staying away. It's safe enough for me. Nobody will care to interfere with an old fellow of hard upon four score, when there are so many people there much better worth interfering with. As to its being a disorganised city, if it were not a disorganised city, there would be no occasion to send somebody from our house here to our house there.' who knows the city and the business of old, and is in Telson's confidence. As to the uncertain travelling, the long journey, and the winter weather, if I were not prepared to submit myself to a few inconveniences for the sake of Telson's after all these years, who ought to be? "'I wish I were going myself,' said Charles Darnay, somewhat restlessly, and like one thinking aloud. "'Indeed! You're a pretty fellow to object and advise,' exclaimed Mr. Lorry. "'You wish you were going yourself, and you a Frenchman born? You're a wise counsellor. "'My dear Mr. Lorry, it is because I am a Frenchman born that the thought, which I did not mean to utter here, however, has passed through my mind often. "'One cannot help thinking, having had some sympathy for the miserable people,' and having abandoned something to them. He spoke here in his former thoughtful manner. That one might be listened to, and might have the power to persuade to some restraint. Only last night, after you had left us, when I was talking to Lucy— When you were talking to Lucy? Mr. Lorry repeated. Yes, I wonder you are not ashamed to mention the name of Lucy— "'wishing you were going to France at this time of day.' "'However, I am not going,' said Charles Darnay, with a smile. "'It is more to the purpose that you say you are. "'And I am, in plain reality. "'The truth is, my dear Charles,' "'Mr. Lorry glanced at the distant house and lowered his voice. "'You can have no conception of the difficulty with which our business is transacted.' and of the peril in which our books and papers over yonder are involved. The Lord above knows what the compromising consequences would be to numbers of people if some of our documents were seized or destroyed, and they might be at any time, you know. For who can say that Paris is not set afire to-day, or sacked to-morrow? Now, a judicious selection from these, with the least possible delay, and the burying of them, or otherwise getting them out of harm's way, is within the power, without loss of precious time, of scarcely any one but myself, if any one. And shall I hang back, when Telson's knows this, and says this, Telson's, whose bread I've eaten these sixty years, because I'm a little stiff about the joints, why, I am a boy, sir, to half a dozen old codgers here. How I admire the gallantry of your youthful spirit, Mr. Lorry! "'That! Nonsense, sir! And my dear Charles,' said Mr. Lorry, glancing at the house again, "'you are to remember that getting things out of Paris at this present time, no matter what things, is next to an impossibility. Papers and precious matters were this very day brought to us here. I, I speak in strict confidence. It's not business-like to whisper it even to you. By the strangest bearers you can imagine.' every one of whom had his head hanging on by a single hair as he passed the barriers. At another time our parcels would come and go as easily as in business like old England. But now everything is stopped. 
"'And do you really go to-night?' "'I really go to-night, for the case has become too pressing to admit of delay. "'And do you take no one with you?' "'All sorts of people have been proposed to me, but I'll have nothing to say to any of them. "'I intend to take Jerry. "'Jerry has been my bodyguard on Sunday nights for a long time past, and I'm used to him. "'Nobody will suspect Jerry of being anything but an English bulldog.' or of having any design in his head but to fly at anyone who touches his master. "'I must say again that I heartily admire your gallantry and youthfulness.' "'I must say again, nonsense, nonsense. When I have executed this little commission, I shall perhaps accept Telson's proposal to retire and live at my ease. Time enough, then, to think about growing old.' This dialogue had taken place at Mr. Lorry's usual desk, with Monseigneur swarming within a yard or two of it, boastful of what he would do to avenge himself on the rascal people before long. It was too much the way of Monseigneur under his reverses as a refugee, and it was much too much the way of native British orthodoxy to talk of this terrible revolution, as though it were the only harvest ever known under the skies that had not been sown as if nothing had ever been done or omitted to be done that had led to it, as if observers of the wretched millions in France, and of the misused and perverted resources that should have made them prosperous, had not seen it inevitably coming, years before, and had not in plain words recorded what they saw. Such vapouring, combined with the extravagant plots of Monseigneur for the restoration of a state of things that had utterly exhausted itself, and worn out heaven and earth as well as itself, was hard to be endured without some remonstrance by any sane man who knew the truth. And it was such vapouring all about his ears, like a troublesome confusion of blood in his own head, added to a latent uneasiness in his mind, which had already made Charles Darnay restless, and which still kept him so. Among the talkers were Stryver of the King's Bench Bar, far on his way to state promotion, and therefore loud on the theme, broaching to Monseigneur his devices for blowing the people up and exterminating them from the face of the earth, and doing without them, and for accomplishing many similar objects, akin in their nature to the abolition of eagles by sprinkling salt on the tails of the race. Him Darnay heard with a particular feeling of objection— and Darnay stood divided between going away that he might hear no more, and remaining to interpose his word, when the thing that was to be went on to shape itself out. The house approached Mr. Lorry, and laying a soiled and unopened letter before him, asked if he had yet discovered any traces of the person to whom it was addressed. The house laid the letter down so close to Darnay that he saw the direction the more quickly, because it was his own right name. The address, turned into English, ran, very pressing, to Monsieur Heretofore, the Marquis saint Evremond of France, confided to the cares of Messrs. Telson and Go, Bankers, London, England. On the marriage morning, Dr. Manette had made it his one urgent and expressed request to Charles Darnay, that the secret of this name should be, unless he, the doctor, dissolved the obligation, kept in violet between them. Nobody else knew it to be his name. His own wife had no suspicion of the fact. Mr. Lorry could have none. "'No,' said Mr. Lorry, in reply to the house, "'I have referred it, I think, to everybody now here, and no one can tell me where this gentleman is to be found.' the hands of the clock verging upon the hour of closing the bank, there was a general set of the current of talkers past Mr. Lorry's desk. He held the letter out inquiringly, and Monseigneur looked at it in the person of this plotting and indignant refugee, and Monseigneur looked at it in the person of that plotting and indignant refugee, and this, that, and the other all had something disparaging to say, in French or in English, concerning the Marquis, who was not to be found. Nephew, I believe, but in any case degenerate successor of the polished Marquis who was murdered, said one. Happy to say I never knew him. 
"'A craven who abandoned his post,' said another. "'This monseigneur had been got out of Paris, legs uppermost, and half suffocated in a low of hay, some years ago.' "'Infected with the new doctrines,' said a third, eyeing the direction through his glass in passing. "'Set himself in opposition to the last marquis, abandoned the estates when he inherited them, and left them to the raffineurs.' "'They will recompense him now, I hope, as he deserves.' "'Hey,' said the blatant driver, "'did he, though? "'Is that the sort of fellow? "'Let's look at his infamous name. "'Damn the fellow!' Darnay, unable to restrain himself any longer, touched Mr. Stryver on the shoulder, and said, "'I know the fellow.' "'Do you, by Jupiter?' said Stryver. "'I'm sorry for it.' "'Why?' "'Why, Mr. Darnay? Do you hear what he did? Don't ask why in these times.' "'But I do ask why.' "'Then I tell you again, Mr. Darnay. I'm sorry for it. I'm sorry to hear you putting any such extraordinary questions. Here's a fellow who, infected by the most pestilent and blasphemous code of devilry that was ever known, abandoned his property to the vilest scum of the earth that ever did a murder by wholesale.' "'And you ask me why I'm sorry that a man who instructs youth knows him? "'Well, but I'll answer you I'm sorry, because I believe there is contamination in such a scoundrel. "'That's why.' "'Mindful of the secret, Darnay with great difficulty checked himself, and said, "'You may not understand the gentleman.' "'I understand how to put you in a corner, Mr. Darnay,' said Bullis Driver, "'and I'll do it.' "'If this fellow is a gentleman, I don't understand him. "'You may tell him so with my compliments. "'You may also tell him, from me, "'that after abandoning his worldly goods and position to this butcherly mob, "'I wonder he's not at the head of them.' "'But no, gentlemen,' said Stryver, looking all round and snapping his fingers, "'I know something of human nature, and I tell you that you'll never find a fellow like this fellow "'trusting himself to the mercies of such precious protégés. "'No, gentlemen, he'll always show him a clean pair of heels very early in the scuffle, and sneak away.' "'With those words, and a final snap of his fingers, "'Mr. Stryver shouldered himself into Fleet Street, amidst the general approbation of his hearers.' Mr. Lorry and Charles Darnay were left alone at the desk, in the general departure from the bank. "'Will you take charge of the letter?' said Mr. Lorry. "'You know where to deliver it?' "'I do. "'Will you undertake to explain that we suppose it to have been addressed here, on the chance of our knowing where to forward it, and that it has been here some time?' "'I will do so.' "'Do you start for Paris from here?' "'From here, at eight. "'I will come back to see you off.' "'Very ill at ease with himself, and with Stryver, and most other men, "'Darnay made the best of his way into the quiet of the temple, "'opened the letter, and read it. "'These were its contents. "'Prison of the Abbé, Paris, June 21st, 1792. Monsieur heretofore the Marquis. After having long been in danger of my life at the hands of the village, I have been seized with great violence and indignity, and brought a long journey on foot to Paris. On the road I have suffered a great deal. Nor is that all. My house has been destroyed, raised to the ground, the crime for which I am imprisoned, monsieur, heretofore the Marquis, and for which I shall be summoned before the tribunal, and shall lose my life, without your so generous help, is, they tell me, treason against the majesty of the people, in that I have acted against them for an emigrant. It is in vain I represent that I have acted for them, and not against, according to your commands." It is in vain I represent that, before the sequestration of emigrant property, I had remitted the imposts they had ceased to pay, that I had collected no rent, that I had recourse to no process. The only response is that I have acted for an emigrant, and where is that emigrant? 
"'Ah, most gracious, monsieur, here too for the Marquis. "'Where is that emigrant? "'I cry in my sleep, where is he? "'I demand of heaven, will he not come to deliver me? "'No answer. "'Ah, monsieur, here too for the Marquis, "'I send my desolate cry across the sea, "'hoping it may perhaps reach your ears "'through the great bank of Tilson, known at Paris.' For the love of heaven, of justice, of generosity, of the honour of your noble name, I supplicate you, monsieur, heretofore the Marquis, to succour and release me. My fault is that I have been true to you. Oh, monsieur, heretofore the Marquis, I pray you to be true to me. From this prison here of horror, whence I every hour tend nearer and nearer to destruction, I send you... Monsieur, heretofore the Marquis, the assurance of my dolorous and unhappy service, your afflicted Gabelle. The latent uneasiness in Darnay's mind was roused to vigorous life by this letter. The peril of an old servant and a good one, whose only crime was fidelity to himself and his family, stared him so reproachfully in the face that as he walked to and fro in the temple, considering what to do, he almost hid his face from the passers-by. He knew very well that in his horror of the deed which had culminated the bad deeds and bad reputation of the old family house, in his resentful suspicions of his uncle, and in the aversion with which his conscience regarded the crumbling fabric that he was supposed to uphold, he had acted imperfectly. He knew very well that in his love for Lucy, his renunciation of his social place, though by no means new to his own mind, had been hurried and incomplete. He knew that he ought to have systematically worked it out and supervised it, and that he had meant to do it, and that it had never been done. The happiness of his own chosen English home, the necessity of being always actively employed, the swift changes and troubles of the time which had followed on one another so fast, that the events of this week annihilated the immature plans of last week, and the events of the week following made all new again. He knew very well that to the force of these circumstances he had yielded, not without disquiet, but still without continuous and accumulating resistance, that he had watched the times for a time of action, and that they had shifted and struggled until the time had gone by and the nobility were trooping from France by every highway and byway, and their property was in course of confiscation and destruction, and their very names were blotting out, was as well known to himself as it could be to any new authority in France that might impeach him for it. But he had oppressed no man, he had imprisoned no man, he was so far from having harshly exacted payment of his dues that he had relinquished them of his own will thrown himself on a world with no favour in it, won his own private place there, and earned his own bread. Monsieur Gabelle had held the impoverished and involved estate on written instructions, to spare the people, to give them what little there was to give, such fuel as the heavy creditors would let them have in the winter, and such produce as could be saved from the same grip in summer, and no doubt he had put the fact in plea and proof for his own safety so that it could not but appear now. This favoured the desperate resolution Charles Darnay had begun to make, that he would go to Paris. Yes, like the mariner in the old story, the winds and streams had driven him within the influence of the lodestone rock, and it was drawing him to itself, and he must go. Everything that arose before his mind drifted him on, faster and faster, more and more steadily to the terrible attraction. His latent uneasiness had been that bad aims were being worked out in his own unhappy land by bad instruments, and that he, who could not fail to know that he was better than they, was not there, trying to do something to stay bloodshed, and to assert the claims of mercy and humanity. With this uneasiness half-stifled and half-reproaching him, he had been brought to the pointed comparison of himself with the brave old gentleman in whom duty was so strong. Upon that comparison, injurious to himself, had instantly followed the sneers of Monseigneur, 
which had stung him bitterly, and those of Stryver, which above all were coarse and galling for old reasons. Upon those had followed Gabelle's letter, the appeal of an innocent prisoner in danger of death to his justice, honour, and good name. His resolution was made. He must go to Paris. Yes, the lodestone rock was drawing him, and he must sail on until he struck. He knew of no rock. He saw hardly any danger. The intention with which he had done what he had done, even though he had left it incomplete, presented it before him in an aspect that would be gratefully acknowledged in France, on his presenting himself to assert it. Then that glorious vision of doing good— which is so often the sanguine mirage of so many good minds, arose before him, and he even saw himself in the illusion with some influence to guide this raging revolution that was running so fearfully wild. As he walked to and fro with his resolution made, he considered that neither Lucy nor her father must know of it until he was gone. Lucy should be spared the pain of separation, and her father— always reluctant to turn his thoughts towards the dangerous ground of old, should come to the knowledge of the step as a step taken, and not in the balance of suspense and doubt. How much of the incompleteness of his situation was referable to her father, through the painful anxiety to avoid reviving old associations of France in his mind, he did not discuss with himself. But that circumstance, too, had its influence in his course— he walked to and fro, with thoughts very busy, until it was time to return to Telson's and take leave of Mr. Lorry. As soon as he arrived in Paris, he would present himself to this old friend, but he must say nothing of his intention now. A carriage with post-horses was ready at the bank door, and Jerry was booted and equipped. "'I have delivered that letter,' said Charles Darnay to Mr. Lorry. I would not consent to your being charged with any written answer, but perhaps you will take a verbal one. That I will, and readily, said Mr. Lorry, if it's not dangerous. Not at all, though it is to a prisoner in the Abbey. What is his name? said Mr. Lorry, with his open pocket-book in his hand. Gabelle. Gabelle. And what is the message to the unfortunate Gabelle in prison? simply that he has received the letter and will come. Any time mentioned? He will start upon his journey to-morrow night. Any person mentioned? No. He helped Mr. Lorry to wrap himself in a number of coats and cloaks, and went out with him from the warm atmosphere of the old bank into the misty air of Fleet Street. My love to Lucy, and to little Lucy— said Mr. Lorry at parting, and take precious care of them till I come back. Charles Darnay shook his head and doubtfully smiled as the carriage rolled away. That night, it was the 14th of August, he sat up late and wrote two fervent letters. One was to Lucy, explaining the strong obligation he was under to go to Paris, and showing her, at length, the reasons that he had for feeling confident that he could become involved in no personal danger there. The other was to the doctor, confiding Lucy and their dear child to his care, and dwelling on the same topics with the strongest assurances. To both he wrote that he would dispatch letters in proof of his safety immediately after his arrival. It was a hard day, that day of being among them, with the first reservation of their joint lives on his mind. It was a hard matter to preserve the innocent deceit of which they were profoundly unsuspicious. But an affectionate glance at his wife, so happy and busy, made him resolute not to tell her what impended. He had been half moved to do it, so strange it was to him to act in anything without her quiet aid and the day passed quickly. Early in the evening he embraced her and her scarcely less dear namesake, pretending that he would return by and by. An imaginary engagement took him out, and he had secreted a valise of clothes ready. And so he emerged into the heavy mist of the heavy streets with a heavier heart. 
The unseen force was drawing him fast to itself now, and all the tides and winds were setting straight and strong towards it. He left his two letters with a trusty porter, to be delivered half an hour before midnight, and no sooner, took horse for Dover, and began his journey. For the love of heaven, of justice, of generosity, of the honour of your noble name, was the poor prisoner's cry, with which he strengthened his sinking heart, as he left all that was dear on earth behind him, and floated away for the lodestone rock. End of Book Two This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marion Brown, Toronto, Canada. The Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three, Chapter One. In Secret. The traveller fared slowly on his way, who fared towards Paris from England in the autumn of the year one thousand seven hundred and ninety two. More than enough of bad roads, bad equipages, and bad horses he would have encountered to delay him, though the fallen and unfortunate king of France had been upon his throne in all his glory. But the changed times were fraught with other obstacles than these. Every town gate and village taxing house had its band of citizen patriots with their national muskets in a most explosive state of readiness, who stopped all comers and goers, cross-questioned them, inspected their papers, looked for their names in lists of their own, turned them back or sent them on, or stopped them and laid them in hold, as their capricious judgment of fancy deemed best for the dawning republic, one and indivisible, of liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. A very few French leagues of his journey were accomplished, when Charles Darnay began to perceive that for him along these country roads there was no hope of return until he should have been declared a good citizen at Paris. Whatever might befall now, he must on to journey's end. Not a mean village closed upon him, not a common barrier dropped across the road behind him, but he knew it to be another iron door in the series that was barred between him and England. The universal watchfulness so encompassed him that if he had been taken in a net, or were being forwarded to his destination, in a cage, he could not have felt his freedom were more completely gone. This universal watchfulness not only stopped him on the highway twenty times in a stage, but retarded his progress twenty times in a day, by riding after him and taking him back, riding before him and stopping him by anticipation, riding with him and keeping him in charge, he had been days upon his journey in France alone, when he went to bed tired out, in a little town on the high road, still a long way from Paris. Nothing but the production of the afflicted Gabelle's letter from his prison of the Abbey would have got him on so far. His difficulty at the guard-house in this small place had been such that he felt his journey to have come to a crisis, and he was, therefore, as little surprised as a man could be, to find himself awakened at the small inn to which he had been remitted until morning in the middle of the night. Awakened by a timid local functionary and three armed patriots in rough red caps and with pipes in their mouths who sat down on the bed. Emigrant, said the functionary, I am going to send you on to Paris under an escort. Citizen, I desire nothing more than to get to Paris, though I could dispense with the escort. Silence growled a red cap, striking at the coverlet with the butt-end of his musket. Peace, aristocrat. It is, as the good patriot says, observed the timid functionary, you are an aristocrat, and must have an escort, and must pay for it. I have no choice, said Charles Darnay. Choice! Listen to him, cried the same scowling red cap, as if it was not a favour to be protected from the lamp iron. It is always as the good patriot says, observed the functionary. Rise and dress yourself, emigrant. Darnay complied, and was taken back to the guard-house, where other patriots in rough red caps were smoking, drinking, and sleeping by a watch-fire. 
Here he paid a heavy price for his escort, and hence he started with it on the wet, wet roads at three o'clock in the morning. The escort were two mounted patriots in red caps and tricolored cockades, armed with national muskets and sabres, who rode one on either side of him. The escorted governed his own horse, but a loose line was attached to his bridle, the end of which one of the patriots kept girded round his wrist. In this state they set forth with the sharp rain driving in their faces, clattering at a heavy dragoon trot over the uneven town pavement, and out upon the mire deep roads. In this state they traversed without change, except of horses and pace, all the mire deep leagues that lay between them and the capital. They travelled in the night, halting an hour or two after daybreak, and lying by until the twilight fell. The escort were so wretchedly clothed that they twisted straw round their bare legs and thatched their ragged shoulders to keep the wet off. Apart from the personal discomfort of being so attended, and apart from such considerations of present danger as arose from one of the patriots being chronically drunk and carrying his musket very recklessly, Charles Darnay did not allow the restraint that was laid upon him to awaken any serious fears in his breast, for he reasoned with himself that it could have no reference to the merits of an individual's case that was not yet stated, and of representations confirmable by the prisoner in the abbey that were not yet made. But when they came to the town of Beauvais, which they did at eventide, when the streets were filled with people, he could not conceal from himself that the aspect of affairs was very alarming. An ominous crowd gathered to see him dismount of the posting yard, and many voices called out loudly, Down with the emigrant! He stopped in the act of swinging himself out of his saddle, and resuming it in as his safest place, said, Emigrant, my friends, do you not see me here, in France, of my own will? You are a cursed emigrant, cried a farrier, making at him in a furious manner through the press, hammer in hand, and you are a cursed aristocrat. The postmaster interposed himself between this man and the rider's bridle, at which he was evidently making, and soothingly said, Let him be, let him be, he will be judged at Paris. Judged, repeated the farrier, swinging his hammer. I and condemned as a traitor. At this the crowd roared approval. Checking the postmaster, who was for turning his horse's head to the yard, the drunken patriot sat composedly in his saddle looking on, with the line round his wrist. Darnay said, as soon as he could make his voice heard, Friends, you deceive yourselves, or you are deceived. I am not a traitor. He lies, cried the smith. He is a traitor since the decree. His life is forfeit to the people. His cursed life is not his own. At the instant when Darnay saw a rush in the eyes of the crowd, which another instant would have brought upon him, the postmaster turned his horse into the yard, the escort rode in close upon his horse's flanks, and the postmaster shut and barred the crazy double gates. The farrier struck a blow upon them with his hammer, and the crowd groaned, but no more was done. "'What is this decree that the smith spoke of?' Darnay asked the postmaster when he had thanked him and stood beside him in the yard. "'Truly a decree for selling the property of emigrants. When passed? On the fourteenth, the day I left England.' Everybody says it is but one of several, and that there will be others, if there are not already, banishing all emigrants and condemning all to death who return. That is what he meant when he said your life was not your own. But there are no such decrees yet. What do I know? said the postmaster, shrugging his shoulders. There may be, or there will be. It's all the same. What would you have? They rested on some straw in a loft until the middle of the night then rode forward again when all the town was asleep. Among the many wild changes observable on familiar things which made this wild ride unreal, not the least was the seeming rarity of sleep. After long and lonely spurring over dreary roads, they would come to a cluster of poor cottages, not steeped in darkness, but all glittering with lights, and would find the people in a ghostly manner in the dead of the night, circling hand in hand round a shriveled tree of liberty, or all drawn up together singing a liberty song. Happily, however, there was sleep in Beauvais,
that night to help them out of it, and they passed once more into solitude and loneliness. Jiggling through the untimely cold and wet among impoverished fields that had yielded no fruits of the earth that year, diversified by the blackened remains of burnt houses and by the sudden emergence from ambuscade and sharp reining up against their way of patriot patrols on the watch on all the roads. Daylight at last found them before the wall of Paris. The barrier was closed and strongly guarded when they rode up to it. "'Where are the papers of this prisoner?' demanded a resolute-looking man in authority, who was summoned out by the guard. Naturally struck by the disagreeable word, Charles Darnay requested the speaker to take notice that he was a free traveller and French citizen, in charge of an escort which the disturbed state of the country had imposed upon him, and which he had paid for. "'Where,' repeated the same personage, without taking any heed of him whatever, "'are the papers of this prisoner?' The drunken patriot had them in his cap and produced them. Casting his eyes over Gabelle's letter, the same personage in authority showed some disorder and surprise, and looked at Darnay with a close attention. He left escort and escorted without saying a word, however, and went into the guard-room. Meanwhile they sat upon their horses outside the gate. Looking about him while in this state of suspense, Charles Darnay observed that the gate was held by a mixed guard of soldiers and patriots the latter far outnumbering the former, and that while ingress into the city for peasants' carts bringing in supplies and for similar traffic and traffickers was easy enough, egress even for the homeliest people was very difficult. A numerous medley of men and women, not to mention beasts and vehicles of various sorts, was waiting to issue forth, but the previous identification was so strict that they filtered through the barrier very slowly. Some of these people knew their turn for examination to be so far off that they lay down on the ground to sleep or smoke, while others talked together or loitered about. The red cap and tricolour cockade were universal, both among men and women. When he had sat in his saddle some half-hour, taking note of these things, Darnay found himself confronted by the same man in authority who directed the guard to open the barrier. Then he delivered to the escort, drunk and sober, a receipt for the escorted, and requested him to dismount. He did so, and the two patriots, leading his tired horse, turned and rode away without entering the city. He accompanied his conductor into a guard-room, smelling of common wine and tobacco, where certain soldiers and patriots, asleep and awake, drunk and sober, and in various neutral states between sleeping and waking, drunkenness and sobriety, were standing and lying about. The light in the guard-house, half derived from the waning oil-lamps of the night, and half from the overcast day, was in a correspondingly uncertain condition. Some registers were lying open on a desk, and an officer of a coarse, dark aspect presided over these. "'Citizen Defarge,' said he to Darnay's conductor, as he took a slip of paper to write on, "'is this the emigrant Evremond? This is the man. Your age, Evremond?' Thirty-seven. Married, Evremond? Yes. Where married? In England. Without doubt. Where is your wife, Evremond? In England. Without doubt. You are consigned, Evremond, to the prison of La Force. Just heaven! exclaimed Darnay. Under what law and for what offence? The officer looked up from his slip of paper for a moment. We have new laws, Evremond, and new offences since you were here. He said it with a hard smile and went on writing. I entreat you to observe that I have come here voluntarily, in response to that written appeal of a fellow countryman which lies before you. I demand no more than the opportunity to do so without delay. Is not that my right? Emigrants have no rights, Evremond, was the stolid reply. The officer wrote until he had finished, read over to himself what he had written, sanded it and handed it to Defarge, with the words, In secret. Defarge motioned with the paper to the prisoner that he must accompany him. The prisoner obeyed, and a guard of two armed patriots attended them. "'Is it you?' said Defarge, in a low voice, as they went down the guardhouse steps and turned into Paris, who married the daughter of Dr. Manette, once a prisoner in the Bastille that is no more. "'Yes,' replied Darnay, looking at him with surprise. "'My name is Defarge, and I keep a wine-shop in the quarter St. Antoine. Possibly you have heard of me.' 
My wife came to your house to reclaim her father? Yes. The word wife seemed to serve as a gloomy reminder to Defarge, to say with sudden impatience, In the name of that sharp female newly born, and called La Guillotine, why did you come to France? You heard me say why a minute ago. Do you not believe it is the truth? A bad truth for you, said Defarge, speaking with knitted brows, and looking straight before him. Indeed I am lost here. All here is so unprecedented, so changed, so sudden and unfair that I am absolutely lost. Will you render me a little help? None. Defarge spoke, always looking straight before him. Will you answer me a single question? Perhaps, according to its nature, you can say what it is. In this prison that I am going to so unjustly, shall I have some free communication with the world outside? You will see. I am not to be buried there, prejudged, and without any means of presenting my case? You will see. But what then? Other people have been similarly buried in worse prisons before now. But never by me, Citizen Defarge. Defarge glanced darkly at him for answer, and walked on in a steady and set silence. The deeper he sank into this silence, the fainter hope there was, or so Darnay thought, of his softening in any slight degree. He therefore made haste to say, It is of the utmost importance to me, you know, citizen, even better than I, of how much importance, that I should be able to communicate to Mr. Lorry of Telson's Bank, an English gentleman who is now in Paris, the simple fact without comment that I have been thrown into the prison of La Force. Will you cause that to be done for me? I will do, Defarge doggedly rejoined, nothing for you. My duty is to my country and the people. I am the sworn servant of both, against you. I will do nothing for you. Charles Darnay felt it hopeless to entreat him further, and his pride was touched besides. As they walked on in silence, he could not but see how used the people were to the spectacle of prisoners passing along the streets. The very children scarcely noticed him. A few passers turned their heads, and a few shook their fingers at him, as an aristocrat. Otherwise, that a man in good clothes should be going to prison was no more remarkable than that a labourer in working clothes should be going to work. In one narrow, dark, and dirty street through which they passed, an excited orator mounted on a stool was addressing the excited audience on the crimes against the people of the king and the royal family. The next few words that he caught from this man's lips first made it known to Charles Darnay that the king was in prison and that the foreign ambassadors had one and all left Paris. On the road, except at Beauvais, he had heard absolutely nothing. The escort and the universal watchfulness had completely isolated him. That he had fallen among far greater dangers than those which had developed themselves when he left England, he of course knew now. That perils had thickened about him fast, and might thicken faster and faster yet, he of course knew now. He could not but admit to himself that he might not have made this journey if he could have foreseen the events of a few days, and yet his misgivings were not so dark as imagined by the light of this later time they would appear. Troubled as the future was, it was the unknown future, and in its obscurity there was ignorant hope. The horrible massacre, days and nights long, which within a few rounds of the clock was to set a great mark of blood upon the blessed garnering time of harvest, was as far out of his knowledge as if it had been a hundred thousand years away. The sharp female newly born and called La Guillotine was hardly known to him, or to the generality of people by name. The frightful deeds that were to be soon done were probably unimagined at that time in the brains of the doers. How could they have a place in the shadowy conceptions of a gentle mind? Of unjust treatment and detention and hardship, and in cruel separation from his wife and child, he foreshadowed the likelihood, or the certainty, but beyond this he dreaded nothing distinctly. With this on his mind, which was enough to carry into a dreary prison courtyard, he arrived at the prison of La Force. A man with a bloated face opened the strong wicket, to whom Defarge presented, the emigrant Evremond. "'What the devil? How many more of them?' exclaimed the man with the bloated face. Defarge took his receipt without noticing the exclamation, and withdrew, with his two fellow patriots. "'What the devil, I say again!' exclaimed the jailer, left with his wife, 
How many more? The jailer's wife, being provided with no answer to the question, merely replied, One must have patience, my dear. Three turnkeys who entered responsive to a bell she rang echoed the sentiment, and one added, For the love of liberty, which sounded in that place like an inappropriate conclusion. The prison of La Force was a gloomy prison, dark and filthy, and with a horrible smell of foul sleep in it. Extraordinary how soon the noisome flavor of imprisoned sleep becomes manifest in all such places that are ill cared for. In secret, too, grumbled the jailer, looking at the written paper, as if I was not already full to bursting. He stuck the paper on a file in an ill humor, and Charles Darnay awaited his further pleasure for half an hour, sometimes pacing to and fro in the strong arched room, sometimes resting on a stone seat, and in either case detained to be imprinted at, on the memory of the chief and his subordinates. Come, said the chief, at length taking up his keys, come with me, emigrant. Through the dismal prison twilight, his new charge accompanied him by corridor and staircase, many doors clanging and locking behind them, until they came into a large, low, vaulted chamber, crowded with prisoners of both sexes. The women were seated at a long table, reading and writing, knitting, sewing, and embroidering. The men were for the most part standing behind their chairs, or lingering up and down the room. In the instinctive association of prisoners with shameful crime and disgrace, the newcomer recoiled from this company. But the crowning unreality of his long unreal ride was, there all at once rising to receive him, with every refinement of manner known to the time, and with all the engaging graces and courtesies of life. So strangely clouded were these refinements of the prison manners and gloom, so spectral did they become in the inappropriate squalor and misery through which they were seen, that Charles Darnay seemed to stand in a company of the dead, ghosts all, the ghost of beauty, the ghost of stateliness, the ghost of elegance, the ghost of pride, the ghost of frivolity, the ghost of wit, the ghost of youth, the ghost of age, all waiting their dismissal from the desolate shore, all turning on him eyes that were changed by the death they had died in coming here. It struck him motionless, the jailer standing at his side and the other jailers moving about, who would have been well enough as to appearance in the ordinary exercise of their functions, looked so extravagantly coarse, contrasted with sorrowing mothers and blooming daughters who were there, with the apparitions of the coquette, the young beauty and the mature woman delicately bred, that the inversion of all experience and likelihood which the scene of shadows presented was heightened to its utmost. Surely ghosts all! Surely the long unreal ride some progress of disease that had brought him to these gloomy shades. In the name of the assembled companions in misfortune, said a gentleman of courtly appearance and address, coming forward, I have the honour of giving you welcome to La Force, and of condoling with you on the calamity that has brought you among us. May it soon terminate happily. It would be an impertinence elsewhere, but it is not so here, to ask your name and condition. Charles Darnay roused himself and gave the required information, in words as suitable as he could find. But I hope, said the gentleman, following the chief jailer with his eyes, who moved across the room, that you are not in secret. I do not understand the meaning of the term, but I have heard them say so. Oh, what a pity! We so much regret it. But take courage. Several members of our society have been in secret at first, and it has lasted but a short time. Then he added, raising his voice, I grieve to inform the society, in secret. There was a murmur of commiseration as Charles Darnay crossed the room to a grated door where the jailer waited him, and many voices, among which the soft and compassionate voices of women were conspicuous, gave him good wishes and encouragement. He turned at the grated door to render the thanks of his heart. It closed under the jailer's hand, and the apparitions vanished from his sight forever. The wicket opened on a stone staircase leading upward. When they had ascended forty steps, the prisoner of half an hour already counted them. The jailer opened a low black door, and they passed into a solitary cell. It struck cold and damp, but was not dark. Yours, said the jailer. Why am I confined alone? 
How do I know? I can buy pen, ink, and paper? Such are not my orders. You will be visited and can ask then. At present you may buy your food and nothing more. There were in the cell a chair, a table, and a straw mattress. As the jailer made a general inspection of these objects, and of the four walls before going out, a wandering fancy wandered through the mind of the prisoner leaning against the wall opposite to him, that the jailer was so unwholesomely bloated, both in face and person, as to look like a man who'd been drowned and filled with water. When the jailer was gone, he thought in the same wandering away, Now am I left, as if I were dead? Stopping then, to look down at the mattress, he turned from it with a sick feeling, and thought, and here in these crawling creatures is the first condition of the body after death. Five paces by four and a half, five paces by four and a half, five paces by four and a half. The prisoner walked to and fro in his cell, counting its measurement, and the roar of the city arose like muffled drums, with a wild swell of voices added to them. He made shoes, he made shoes, he made shoes. The prisoner counted the measurement again and paced faster, to draw his mind from him, that latter repetition. The ghosts that vanished him, the wicket closed. There was one among them, the appearance of a lady dressed in black, who was leaning in the embrasure of a window, and she had a light shining upon her golden hair, and she looked like, Let us ride on again, for God's sake, through the illuminated villages, with the people all awake. He made shoes, he made shoes, he made shoes. Five paces by four and a half. With such scraps, tossing and rolling upward from the depths of his mind, the prisoner walked faster and faster, obstinately counting and counting, and the roar of the city changed to this extent, that he knew in the swell that rose above them. End of In Secret This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book the Third. The Track of a Storm. Chapter Two. The Grindstone. Tellson's Bank, established in the Saint-Germain quarter of Paris, was in a wing of a large house, approached by a courtyard, and shut off from the street by a high wall and a strong gate. The house belonged to a great nobleman who had lived in it until he made a flight from the troubles, in his own cook's dress, and got across the borders. A mere beast of the chase flying from hunters, he was still in his metempsychosis no other than the same Monsignor, the preparation of whose chocolate for whose lips had once occupied three strong men besides the cook in question. Monsignor gone, and the three strong men absolving themselves from the sin of having drawn his high wages, by being more than ready and willing to cut his throat on the altar of the dawning republic, one and indivisible, of liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. Monsignor's house had been first sequestrated, and then confiscated. For all things moved so fast, and decree followed decree, with that fierce precipitation, that now unto the third night of the autumn month of September, patriot emissaries of the law were in possession of the Monsignor's house, and had marked it with the tricolor, and were drinking brandy in its state apartments. A place of business in London, like Tellson's place of business in Paris, would soon have driven the house out of its mind and into the Gazette. For, what would staid British responsibility and respectability have said to orange trees and boxes in a bank courtyard, and even to a cupid over the counter? Yet such things were. Tellson's had whitewashed the cupid, but he was still to be seen on the ceiling, in the coolest linen, aiming, as he very often does, at money from morning to night. Bankruptcy must inevitably have come of this young pagan, in Lombard Street, London, and also of a curtained alcove in the rear of the immortal boy and also of a looking-glass let into the wall, and also of clerks, not at all old, who danced in public on the slightest provocation. Yet, a French Telsons could get on with these things exceedingly well, and, as long as the times held together, no man had taken fright at them and drawn out his money. 
what money would be drawn out of Tellson's henceforth, and what would lie there, lost and forgotten, what plate and jewels would tarnish in Tellson's hiding-places, while the depositors rusted in prisons, and when they should have violently perished, how many accounts with Tellson's never to be balanced in this world must be carried over into the next? No man could have said, that night, any more than Mr. Jarvis Lorry could, though he thought heavily of these questions. He sat by a newly lighted wood fire, the blighted and unfruitful year was prematurely cold, and on his honest and courageous face there was a deeper shade than the pendant lamp could throw, or any object in the room distortedly reflect. A shade of horror. He occupied rooms in the bank, in his fidelity to the house of which he had grown to be a part, like a strong root ivy. It chanced that they derived a kind of security from the patriotic occupation of the main building, but the true-hearted old gentleman never calculated about that. All such circumstances were indifferent to him, so that he did his duty. On the opposite side of the courtyard, under a colonnade, was extensive standing, for carriages, where, indeed, some carriages of Monseigneur yet stood. Against two of the pillars were fastened two great flaring flambeaux, and in the light of these, standing out in the open air, was a large grindstone, a roughly mounted thing which appeared to have been hurriedly brought there from some neighboring smithy or other workshop. Rising and looking out of the window at these harmless objects, Mr. Lorry shivered and retired to his seat by the fire. He had opened not only the glass window, but the lattice blind outside it, and he had closed them both again and he shivered through his frame. From the streets beyond the high wall and the strong gate, there came the usual night hum of the city, with now and then an indescribable ring in it, weird and unearthly, as if some unwanted sound of a terrible nature were going up to heaven. "'Thank God,' said Mr. Lorry, clasping his hands, "'that no one nearer and dearer to me is in this dreadful town to-night. May he have mercy on all who are in danger.' Soon afterwards the bell at the great gate sounded, and he thought, they have come back, and sat listening. But there was no loud eruption into the courtyard as he had expected, and he heard the gate clash again, and all was quiet. The nervousness and dread that were upon him inspired that vague uneasiness respecting the bank, which a great change would naturally awaken, with such feelings aroused. It was well guarded, and he got up to go among the trusty people who were watching it, when his door suddenly opened, and two figures rushed in, at the sight of which he fell back in amazement. Lucy and her father, Lucy with her arms stretched out to him, and with that old look of earnestness so concentrated and intensified, that it seemed as though it had been stamped upon her face expressly to give force and power to it at this one passage of her life. "'What is this?' cried Mr. Lorry, breathless and confused. "'What is the matter? Lucy! Manette! What has happened? What has brought you here? What is it?' With the look fixed upon him, in her paleness and wildness, she panted out in his arms imploringly, "'Oh, my dear friend, my husband!' "'Your husband, Lucy?' "'Charles!' "'What of Charles?' "'Here!' "'Here, in Paris?' has been here some days three or four i don't know how many i can't collect my thoughts an errand of generosity brought him here unknown to us he was stopped at the barrier and sent to prison the old man uttered an irrepressible cry almost at the same moment the beg of the great gate rang again and a loud noise of feet and voices came pouring into the courtyard what is that noise said the doctor turning towards the window don't look cried Mr. Lorry. Don't look out, Manette. For your life, don't touch the blind. The doctor turned, with his hand upon the fastening of the window, and said, with a cool, bold smile, My dear friend, I have a charmed life in this city. I have been a Bastille prisoner. There is no patriot in Paris, in Paris, in France, who, knowing me to have been a prisoner in the Bastille, would touch me, except to overwhelm me with embraces, or carry me in triumph. My old pain has given me a power that has brought us through the barrier and gained us news of Charles there, and brought us here. I knew it would be so. I knew I could help Charles out of all danger. I told Lucy so. What is that noise? His hand was again upon the window. Don't look, cried Mr. Lorry, absolutely desperate. No, Lucy, my dear, nor you. He got his arm round her and held her. 
Don't be so terrified, my love. I solemnly swear to you that I know of no harm having happened to Charles, that I had no suspicion even of his being in this fatal place. What prison is he in? La Fosse. La Fosse. Lucy, my child, if ever you were brave and serviceable in your life, and you were always both, you will compose yourself now to do exactly as I bid you, for more depends upon it than you can think or I can say. There is no help for you in any action on your part to-night. You cannot possibly stir out. I say this because what I must bid you to do for Charles's sake is the hardest thing to do of all. You must instantly be obedient, still, and quiet. You must let me put you in a room at the back here. You must leave your father and me alone for two minutes, and as there are life and death in the world, you must not delay. I will be submissive to you. I see in your face that you know I can do nothing else than this. I know you are true. The old man kissed her and hurried her into his room and turned the key. Then came hurrying back to the doctor and opened the window and partly opened the blind and put his hand upon the doctor's arm and looked out with him into the courtyard. Looked out upon a throng of men and women, not enough in number or near enough to fill the courtyard, not more than forty or fifty in all. The people in possession of the house had let them in at the gate, and they had rushed in to work at the grindstone. It had evidently been set up there for their purpose, as in a convenient and retired spot. But such awful workers, and such awful work! The grindstone had a double handle, and turning at it madly were two men, whose faces, as their long hair flapped back when the whirlings of the grindstone brought their faces up, were more horrible and cruel than the visages of the wildest savages in their most barbarous disguise. False eyebrows and false moustaches were upon them, and their hideous countenances were all bloody and sweaty, and all awry with howling, and all staring and glaring with beastly excitement and want of sleep. As these ruffians turned and turned, their matted locks now flung forward over their eyes, now flung backward over their necks, some women held wine to their mouths that they might drink, and what with dropping blood, and what with dropping wine, and what with the stream of sparks struck out of the stone, all their wicked atmosphere seemed gore and fire. The eye could not detect one creature in the group free from the smear of blood. Shouldering one another to get next at the sharpening stone were men stripped to the waist, with the stain all over their limbs and bodies, men in all sorts of rags, with the stain upon those rags, men devilishly set off with spoils of women's lace and silk and ribbon, with the stain dyeing those trifles through and through. Hatchets, knives, bayonets, swords, all brought to be sharpened, were all red with it. Some of the hacked swords were tied to the wrists of those who carried them, with strips of linen and fragments of dress, ligatures various in kind, but all deep of the one color. And as the frantic wielders of these weapons snatched them from the stream of sparks and tore away into the streets, the same red hue was red in their frenzied eyes, eyes which any unbrutalized beholder would have given twenty years of life to petrified with a well-directed gun. All this was seen in a moment, as the vision of a drowning man, or of any human creature at any very great pass, could see a world if it were there. They drew back from the window, and the doctor looked for explanation in his friend's ashy face. They are, Mr. Lorry whispered the words, glancing fearfully round at the locked room, murdering the prisoners. If you are sure of what you say, if you really have the power you think you have, as I believe you have, make yourself known to these devils, and get taken to La Fosse. It may be too late, I don't know, but let it not be a minute later. Dr. Manette pressed his hand, hastened bareheaded out of the room, and was in the courtyard when Mr. Lorry regained the blind. His streaming white hair, his remarkable face, and the impetuous confidence of his manner, as he put the weapons aside like water, carried him in an instant to the heart of the concourse at the stone. For a few moments there was a pause, and a hurry, and a murmur, and the unintelligible sound of his voice, and then Mr. Lorry saw him, surrounded by all, and in the midst of a line of twenty men long, all linked shoulder to shoulder and hand to shoulder, hurried out with cries of, Live the Bastille prisoner! Help for the Bastille prisoner's kindred in La Fosse! Room for the Bastille prisoner in front there! Save the prisoner Evremond at La Force, and a thousand answering shouts. He closed the lattice again with a fluttering heart, closed the window and the curtain, hastened to Lucy, 
and told her that her father was assisted by the people and gone in search of her husband. He found her child and Miss Pross with her, but it never occurred to him to be surprised by their appearance until a long time afterwards, when he sat watching them in such quiet as the night knew. Lucy had by that time fallen into a stupor on the floor at his feet, clinging to his hand. Miss Pross had laid the child down on his own bed, and her head had gradually fallen on the pillow beside her pretty charge. Oh, the long, long night, with the moans of the poor wife! And oh, the long, long night, with no return of her father, and no tidings! Twice more in the darkness the bell at the great gate sounded, and the eruption was repeated, and the grindstone whirled and spluttered. "'What is it?' cried Lucy, affrighted. "'Hush! The soldiers' swords are sharpened there,' said Mr. Lorry. "'The place is national property now, and used as a kind of armory, my love.' Twice more in all, but the last spell of work was feeble and fitful. Soon afterwards the day began to dawn, and he softly detached himself from the clasping hand, and cautiously looked out again. A man, so besmeared that he might have been a sorely wounded soldier creeping back to consciousness on a field of slain, was rising from the pavement by the side of the grindstone, and looking about him with a vacant air. Shortly this worn-out murderer described in the imperfect light one of the carriages of Monseigneur, and staggering to that gorgeous vehicle, climbed in at the door, and shut himself up to take his rest on its dainty cushions. The great grindstone earth had turned when Mr. Lorry looked out again, and the sun was red in the courtyard. But the lesser grindstone stood alone there in the calm morning air, with a red upon it that the sun had never given, and would never take away. End of chapter 2 The Grindstone Book the Third, The Track of a Storm Read by Tora in Yellowstone National Park, October 2006This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org, L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot O-R-G. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, Book the Third, The Track of a Storm. Chapter Three, The Shadow. One of the first considerations which arose in the business mind of Mr. Lorry when business hours came around was this, that he had no right to imperil Telson's by sheltering the wife of an immigrant prisoner under the bank roof. His own possessions, safety, life, he would have hazarded for Lucy and her child, without a moment's demur. But the great trust he held was not his own and as to that business charge, he was a strict man of business. At first his mind reverted to Defarge, and he thought of finding out the wine shop again, and taking counsel with its master in reference to the safest dwelling place in the distracted state of the city. But the same consideration that suggested him repudiated him. He lived in the most violent quarter, and doubtless was influential there, and deep in its dangerous workings. Noon coming, and the doctor not returning, and every minute's delay tending to compromise Telson's. Mr. Lorry advised with Lucy. She said that her father had spoken of hiring a lodging for a short term in that quarter, near the banking house. As there was no business objection to this, and as he foresaw that even if it were is all well with Charles, and he were to be released, he could not hope to leave the city. Mr. Lorry went out in quest of such a lodging, and found a suitable one, high up in a removed by street, where the closed blinds and all the other windows of a high melancholy square of buildings marked deserted homes. To this lodging he at once removed Lucy and her child and Miss Pross, giving them what comfort he could, and much more than he had himself. He left Jerry with them as a figure to fill a doorway that would bear considerable knocking on the head and retain to his own occupations. A disturbed and doleful mind he brought to bear upon them and slowly and heavily the day lagged on with him. 
It wore itself out and wore him out with it until the bank closed. He was again alone in his room of the previous night considering what to do next when he heard a foot upon the stair. In a few moments a man stood in his presence who, with a keenly observant look at him, addressed him by his name. Your servant, said Mr. Lorry, do you know me? He was a strongly made man with dark curling hair from forty-five to fifty years of age. For answer he repeated without any change of emphasis the words, Do you know me? I've seen you somewhere, perhaps at my wine shop. Much interested and agitated, Mr. Lorry said, You come from Dr. Manet. Yes, I come from Dr. Manet. And what says he? What does he send me? Defarge gave into his anxious hand an open scrap of paper, bore the words in the doctor's writing. Charles is safe, but I cannot safely leave this place yet. I have obtained the favor that the bearer has a short note from Charles to his wife. Let the bearer see his wife. It was dated from La Force, within an hour. Will you accompany me, said Mr. Lorry, joyfully relieved after reading this note aloud, to where his wife resides? Yes, returned Defarge. Scarcely noticing as yet in what a curiously reserved and mechanical way Defarge spoke, Mr. Lorry put on his hat, and they went down into the courtyard. There they found two women, one knitting. Madame Defarge, surely, said Mr. Lorry who had left her in exactly the same attitude some seventeen years ago. It is she, observed her husband. Does madame go with us? inquired Mr. Lorry, seeing that she moved as they moved. Yes, that she may be able to recognize the faces and know the persons. It is for their safety. Beginning to be struck by Defarge's manner, Mr. Lorry looked dubiously at him and led the way. Both the women followed, the second woman being the vengeance. They passed through the intervening streets as quickly as they might, ascended the staircase of the new domicile, where admitted by Jerry, and found Lucy weeping, alone. She was thrown into a transport by the tidings Mr. Lorry gave her of her husband, and clasped the hand that delivered his note, little thinking what it had been doing near him in the night, and might but for a chance, have done to him. Dearest, take courage. I am well, and your father has influence around me. You cannot answer this. Kiss our child for me. That was all the writing. It was so much, however, to her who received it, that she turned from Defarge to his wife and kissed one of the hands that knitted. It was a passionate, loving, thankful, womanly action but the hand made no response, dropped cold and heavy, and took to its knitting again. There was something in its touch that gave Lucy a check. She stopped in the act of putting the note in her bosom, and, with her hands yet at her neck, looked terrified at Madame Defarge. Madame Defarge met the lifted eyebrows and forehead with a cold, impassive stare. My dear, said Mr. Lorry, striking in to explain, there are frequent risings in the streets, and although it is not likely they will ever trouble you, Madame Defarge wishes to see those whom she has the power to protect at such times, to the end that she may know them, that she may identify them. I believe, said Mr. Lorry, rather halting in his reassuring words as the stony manner of all the three impressed itself upon him more and more. I state the case, citizen Defarge. Defarge looked gloomily at his wife and gave no other answer than a gruff sound of acquiescence. You had better, Lucy, said Mr. Lorry, doing all he could to propitiate by tone and manner. Have the dear child here, and our good pros, our good pros, Defarge, is an English lady and knows no French. The lady in question, whose rooted conviction that she was more than a match for any foreigner was not to be shaken by distress and danger, appeared with folded arms and observed in English, 
to the vengeance whom her eyes first encountered. Well, I'm sure, bold face, I hope you are pretty well. She also bestowed a British cough on Madame Defarge, but neither of the two took much heed of her. Is this his child, said Madame Defarge, stopping in her work for the first time, and pointing her knitting needle at little Lucy as if it were the finger of fate. Yes, madame, answered Mr. Lorry, this is our poor prisoner's darling daughter and only child. The shadow attendant on Madame Defarge and her party seemed to fall so threatening and dark on the child that her mother instinctively kneeled on the ground beside her and held her to her breast. The shadow attendant on Madame Defarge and her party seemed then to fall, threatening and dark, on both the mother and the child. It is enough, my husband, said Madame Defarge. I have seen them, we may go. But the suppressed manner had enough of menace in it, not visible and presented, but indistinct and withheld, to alarm Lucy into saying, as she laid her appealing hand on Madame Defarge's dress, You'll be good to my poor husband. You'll do him no harm. You will help me to see him if you can. Your husband is not my business here, returned Madame Defarge, looking down at her with perfect composure. It is the daughter of your father who is my business here. For my sake, then, be merciful to my husband, for my child's sake. She will put her hands together and pray you to be merciful. We are more afraid of you than any of these others. Madame Defarge received it as a compliment and looked at her husband. Defarge, who had been uneasily biting his thumbnail and looking at her, collected his face into a sterner expression. What is it that your husband says in that little letter? asked Madame Defarge with a lowering smile. Influence? He says something touching influence? That my father, said Lucy, hurriedly taking the paper from her breast, but with her alarmed eyes on her questioner and not on it, has much influence around him. Surely it will release him, said Madame Defarge. Let it do so. As a wife and mother, cried Lucy most earnestly, I implore you to have pity on me, and not to exercise any power that you possess against my innocent husband, but to use it in his behalf. O oh, sister woman, think of me as a wife and mother. Madame de Faget looked coldly as ever at the suppliant, and said, turning to her friend, the vengeance. The wives and mothers we have been used to see since we were as little as this child, and much less, have not been greatly considered. We have known their husbands and fathers laid in prison and kept from them often enough. All our lives we have seen our sister women suffer, in themselves and in their children, poverty, nakedness, hunger, thirst, sickness misery, oppression, and neglect of all kinds? We have seen nothing else return the vengeance. We have borne this a long time, said Madame Defarge, turning her eyes upon Lucy. Judge you, is it likely that the trouble of one wife and mother would be much to us now? She resumed her knitting and went out. The vengeance followed. Defarge went last and closed the door. Courage, my dear Lucy, said Mr. Lorry as he raised her. Courage, courage. So far all goes well with us. Much, much better than it has of late gone with many poor souls. Cheer up and have a thankful heart. I am not thankless. I hope, but that dreadful woman seems to throw a shadow on me and all my hopes. Tut, tut, said Mr. Lorry. What is this despondency in the brave little breast? A shadow, indeed. No substance in it, Lucy. But the shadow of the manor of these Defarges was dark upon himself. For all that, and in his secret mind, it troubled him greatly. End of chapter 3 The Shadow 
Book the Third, The Track of a Storm. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three. CHAPTER Four, CALM IN STORM Dr. Manette did not return until the morning of the fourth day of his absence. So much of what had happened in that dreadful time as could be kept from the knowledge of Lucy was so well concealed from her that not until long afterwards, when France and she were far apart, did she know that eleven hundred defenceless prisoners of both sexes and all ages had been killed by the populace, that four days and nights had been darkened by this deed of horror, and that the air around her had been tainted by the slain. She only knew that there had been an attack upon the prison, that all political prisoners had been in danger, and that some had been dragged out by the crowd and murdered. To Mr. Lorry, the doctor communicated, under an injunction of secrecy on which he had no need to dwell, that the crowd had taken him through a scene of carnage to the prison of La Force, that in the prison he had found a self-appointed tribunal sitting, before which the prisoners were brought singly, and by which they were rapidly ordered to be put forth to be massacred, or to be released, or, in a few cases, to be sent back to their cells that, presented by his conductors to this tribunal, he had announced himself by name and profession as having been for eighteen years a secret and unaccused prisoner in the Bastille, that one of the bodies so sitting in judgment had risen and identified him, and that this man was Defarge, that hereupon he had ascertained, through the registers on the table, that his son-in-law was among the living prisoners, and had pleaded hard to the tribunal, of whom some members were asleep and some awake, some dirty with murder and some clean, some sober and some not, for his life and liberty, that in the first frantic greetings lavished on himself as a notable sufferer under the overthrown system, it had been accorded to him to have Charles Darnay brought before the lawless court and examined, that he seemed on the point of being at once released, when the tide in his favour met with some unexplained check, not intelligible to the doctor, which led to a few words of secret conference, that the man sitting as president had then informed Dr. Manette that the prisoner must remain in custody, but should, for his sake, be held inviolate in safe custody, that immediately, on a signal, the prisoner was removed to the interior of the prison again, but that he, the doctor, had then so strongly pleaded for permission to remain and assure himself that his son-in-law was, through no malice or mischance, delivered to the concourse, whose murderous yells outside the gate had often drowned the proceedings, that he had obtained the permission, and had remained in that hall of blood until the danger was over. The sights he had seen there— with brief snatches of food and sleep by intervals, shall remain untold. The mad joy over the prisoners who were saved has astounded him scarcely less than the mad ferocity against those who were cut to pieces. One prisoner there was, he said, who had been discharged into the street free, but at whom a mistaken savage had thrust a pike as he passed out being besought to go to him and dress the wound, the doctor had passed out at the same gate, and had found him in the arms of a company of Samaritans who were seated on the bodies of their victims. With an inconsistency as monstrous as anything in this awful nightmare, they had helped the healer, and tended the wounded man with the gentlest solicitude, had made a litter for him, and escorted him carefully from the spot had then caught up their weapons, and plunged anew into a butchery so dreadful that the doctor had covered his eyes with his hands, and swooned away in the midst of it. As Mr. Lorry received these confidences, 
and as he watched the face of his friend, now sixty-two years of age, a misgiving arose within him that such dread experiences would revive the old danger. But he had never seen his friend in his present aspect. He had never at all known him in his present character. For the first time the doctor felt, now, that his suffering was strength and power. For the first time he felt that in that sharp fire he had slowly forged the iron which could break the prison door of his daughter's husband and deliver him. "'It all tended to a good end, my friend. It was not mere waste and ruin. As my beloved child was helpful in restoring me to myself, I will be helpful now in restoring the dearest part of herself to her. By the aid of heaven I will do it.' Thus Dr. Manette. And when Jarvis Lorry saw the kindled eyes, the resolute face, the calm, strong look and bearing of a man whose life always seemed to him to have been stopped like a clock for so many years, and then set going again with an energy which had lain dormant during the cessation of its usefulness, he believed. Greater things than the doctor had at that time to contend with, would have yielded before his persevering purpose. While he kept himself in his place as a physician, whose business was with all degrees of mankind, bond and free, rich and poor, bad and good, he used his personal influence so wisely that he was soon the inspecting physician of three prisons, and among them of La Force. He could now assure Lucy that her husband was no longer confined alone, but was mixed with the general body of prisoners. He saw her husband weakly, and brought sweet messages to her, straight from his lips. Sometimes her husband himself sent a letter to her, though never by the doctor's hand. But she was not permitted to write to him, for among the many wild suspicions of plots in the prisons, the wildest of all pointed at emigrants who were known to have made friends or permanent connections abroad. This new life of the doctor's was an anxious life, no doubt. Still, the sagacious Mr. Lorry saw that there was a new sustaining pride in it. Nothing unbecoming tinged the pride. It was a natural and worthy one. But he observed it as a curiosity. The doctor knew that up to that time his imprisonment had been associated in the minds of his daughter and his friend with his personal affliction deprivation and weakness. Now that this was changed, and he knew himself to be invested through that old trial with forces to which they both looked for Charles's ultimate safety and deliverance, he became so far exalted by the change that he took the lead and direction, and required them as the weak to trust to him as the strong. The preceding relative positions of himself and Lucy were reversed, yet only as the liveliest gratitude and affection could reverse them, for he could have no pride but in rendering some service to her who had rendered so much to him. "'All curious to see,' thought Mr. Lorry, in his amiably shrewd way, "'but all natural and right. So take the lead, my dear friend, and keep it. It couldn't be in better hands.' But, though the doctor tried hard, and never ceased trying, to get Charles Darnay set at liberty, or at least to get him brought to trial, the public current of the time set too strong and fast for him. The new era began. The king was tried, doomed, and beheaded. The republic of liberty, equality, fraternity, or death, declared for victory or death against the world in arms. The black flag waved night and day from the great towers of Notre Dame. Three hundred thousand men, summoned to rise against the tyrants of the earth, rose from all the varying soils of France, as if the dragon's teeth had been sown broadcast, and had yielded fruit equally on hill and plain, on rock, in gravel and alluvial mud, under the bright sky of the south, and under the clouds of the north, in fell and forest, in the vineyards and the olive grounds, and among the cropped grass and the stubble of the court, along the fruitful banks of the broad rivers, 
and in the sand of the seashore. What private solicitude could rear itself against the deluge of year one of liberty, the deluge rising from below, not falling from above, and with the windows of heaven shut, not opened? There was no pause, no pity, no peace, no interval of relenting rest, no measurement of time. Though days and nights circled as regularly as when time was young, and the evening and morning were the first day, other count of time there was none. Hold of it was lost in the raging fever of a nation, as it is in the fever of one patient. Now, breaking the unnatural silence of a whole city, the executioner showed the people the head of the king. And now, it seemed, almost in the same breath, the head of his fair wife, which had had eight weary months of imprisoned widowhood and misery to turn it grey. And yet, observing the strange law of contradiction which obtains in all such cases, the time was long while it flamed by so fast. A revolutionary tribunal in the capital, and forty or fifty thousand revolutionary committees all over the land, a law of the suspected, which struck away all security for liberty or life, and delivered over any good and innocent person to any bad and guilty one. Prisons, gorged with people who had committed no offence, and could obtain no hearing. These things became the established order and nature of appointed things, and seemed to be ancient usage before they were many weeks old. Above all, one hideous figure grew as familiar as if it had been before the general gaze from the foundations of the world, the figure of the sharp female called La Guillotine. It was the popular theme for jests. It was the best cure for headache. It infallibly prevented the hair from turning grey. It imparted a peculiar delicacy to the complexion. It was the national razor which shaved close. Who kissed La Guillotine, looked through the little window, and sneezed into the sack. It was the sign of the regeneration of the human race. It superseded the cross. Models of it were worn on breasts from which the cross was discarded, and it was bowed down to, and believed in, where the cross was denied. It sheared off heads so many, that it and the ground it most polluted were a rotten red. It was taken to pieces, like a toy puzzle for a young devil, and was put together again when the occasion wanted it. It hushed the eloquent, struck down the powerful, abolished the beautiful and good. Twenty-two friends of high public mark, twenty-one living and one dead. It had lopped the heads off in one morning, in as many minutes. The name of the strong man of old scripture had descended to the chief functionary who worked it, but so armed he was stronger than his namesake, and blinder, and tore away the gates of God's own temple every day. Among these terrors, and the brood belonging to them, the doctor walked with a steady head, confident in his power, cautiously persistent in his end, never doubting that he would save Lucy's husband at last. Yet the current of the time swept by, so strong and deep, and carried the time away so fiercely, that Charles had lain in prison one year and three months when the doctor was thus steady and confident. So much more wicked and distracted had the revolution grown in that December month that the rivers of the south were encumbered with the bodies of the violently drowned by night, and prisoners were shot in lines and squares under the southern wintry sun. Still the doctor walked among the terrors with a steady head, no man better known than he in Paris at that day, no man in a stranger situation. Silent, humane, indispensable in hospital and prison, using his art equally among assassins and victims, he was a man apart. In the exercise of his skill, the appearance and the story of the Bastille captive removed him from all other men. He was not suspected, or brought in question any more than if he had indeed been recalled to life some eighteen years before, 
or were a spirit moving among mortals. End of Book Three, Chapter Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three, Chapter Five The Wood Sawyer. One year and three months. During all that time, Lucy was never sure from hour to hour but that the guillotine would strike off her husband's head next day. Every day, through stony streets, the tumbrils now jolted heavily, filled with condemned. Lovely girls, bright women, brown-haired, black-haired and grey, youths, stalwart men and old, gentle-born and peasant-born, all red wine for la guillotine, all daily brought into light from the dark cellars of the loathsome prisons, and carried to her through the streets to slake her devouring thirst. Liberty, equality, fraternity, or death, the last much the easiest to bestow, O guillotine. If the suddenness of her calamity and the whirling wheels of the time, had stunned the doctor's daughter into awaiting the result in idle despair, it would but have been with her as it was with many. But from the hour when she had taken the white head to her fresh young bosom in the garret of St. Antoine, she had been true to her duties. She was truest to them in the season of trial, as all the quietly loyal and good will always be. As soon as they were established in their new residence, and her father had entered on the routine of his avocations, she arranged the little household as exactly as if her husband had been there. Everything had its appointed place and its appointed time. Little Lucy she taught, as regularly as if they had all been united in their English home. The slight devices with which she cheated herself into the show of a belief that they would soon be reunited, the little preparations for his speedy return, the setting aside of his chair and of his books, these and the solemn prayer at night for one dear prisoner especially, among the many unhappy souls in prison and the shadow of death, were almost the only outspoken reliefs of her heavy mind. She did not greatly alter in appearance. The plain dark dresses, akin to mourning dresses, which she and her child wore, were as neat and as well attended to as the brighter clothes of happy days. She lost her colour, and the old and intent expression was a constant, not an occasional, thing. Otherwise she remained very pretty and comely. Sometimes at night, on kissing her father, she would burst into the grief she had repressed all day, and would say that her sole reliance under heaven was on him. He always resolutely answered, "'Nothing can happen to him without my knowledge, and I know that I can save him, Lucy.' They had not made the round of their changed life many weeks, when her father said to her, on coming home one evening, "'My dear, there is an upper window in the prison, "'to which Charles can sometimes gain access at three in the afternoon. "'When he can get to it, which depends on many uncertainties and incidents, "'he might see you in the street, he thinks, "'if you stood in a certain place that I can show you. "'But you will not be able to see him, my poor child, "'and even if you could, it would be unsafe for you to make a sign of recognition.' "'Oh, show me the place, my father, and I will go there every day.' From that time, in all weathers, she waited there two hours. As the clock struck two, she was there, and at four she turned resignedly away. When it was not too wet or inclement for her child to be with her, they went together. At other times she was alone.' 
but she never missed a single day. It was the dark and dirty corner of a small winding street. The hovel of a cutter of wood into lengths for burning was the only house at that end. All else was wall. On the third day of her being there, he noticed her. "'Good day, citizeness.' "'Good day, citizen.' This mode of address was now prescribed by decree. It had been established voluntarily some time ago among the more thorough patriots, but was now law for everybody. "'Walking here again, citizeness?' "'You see me, citizen.' The wood sawyer, who was a little man with the redundancy of gesture, he had once been a mender of roads, cast a glance at the prison, pointed at the prison, and putting his ten fingers before his face to represent bars, peeped through them jocosely. "'Wood is not my business,' said he, and went on sawing his wood. Next day he was looking out for her, and accosted her the moment she appeared. "'What? Walking here again, citizeness?' "'Yes, citizen.' "'Oh, a child, too?' "'Your mother, is it not, my little citizeness?' "'Do I say yes, mamma? whispered little Lucy, drawing close to her. "'Yes, dearest.' "'Yes, citizen.' "'Ah, oh, but it's not my business. My work is my business. See, my sir, I call him my little guillotine. "'La, la, 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 and off his head comes.' The billet fell as he spoke, and he threw it into a basket. "'I'll call myself the Samson of the firewood guillotine. See here again. Lou, 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 and off her yet comes. Now a child. Tickle, tickle, pickle, pickle, and off it yet comes. All the family.' Lucy shuddered as he threw two more billets into his basket. But it was impossible to be there while the wood-sawyer was at work, and not be in his sight. Thenceforth, to secure his good will, she always spoke to him first, and often gave him drink-money, which he readily received. He was an inquisitive fellow, and sometimes, when she had quite forgotten him in gazing at the prison roof and grates, and in lifting her heart up to her husband— she would come to herself to find him looking at her, with his knee on his bench, and his saw stopped in its work. "'But it's not my business,' he would generally say on those times, and would briskly fall to his sawing again. In all weathers, in the snow and frost of winter, in the bitter winds of spring, in the hot sunshine of summer, in the rains of autumn, and again in the snow and frost of winter, Lucy passed two hours of every day at this place, and every day on leaving it she kissed the prison wall. Her husband saw her, so she learnt from her father. It might be once in five or six times. It might be twice or thrice running. It might be not for a week or a fortnight together. It was enough that he could and did see her when the chances served, and on that possibility she would have waited out the day seven days a week. These occupations brought her round to the December month, wherein her father walked among the terrors with a steady head. On a lightly snowing afternoon she arrived at the usual corner. It was a day of some wild rejoicing and a festival. She had seen the houses as she came along, decorated with little pikes and with little red caps stuck upon them. Also with tricoloured ribbons, also with the standard inscription. Tricoloured letters were the favourite. Republic one and indivisible. Liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. The miserable shop of the wood sawyer was so small that its whole surface furnished very indifferent space for this legend. He had got somebody to scrawl it up for him, however, who had squeezed death in with most inappropriate difficulty. On his housetop he displayed pike and cap, as a good citizen must, and in a window he had stationed his saw, inscribed as his little Sainte Guillotine, 
for the great sharp female was by that time popularly canonized. His shop was shut, and he was not there, which was a relief to Lucy, and left her quite alone. But he was not far off, for presently she heard a troubled movement, and a shouting coming along which filled her with fear. A moment afterwards, and a throng of people came pouring round the corner by the prison wall, in the midst of whom was the wood-sawyer, hand in hand with the vengeance. There could not be fewer than five hundred people, and they were dancing like five thousand demons. There was no other music than their own singing. They danced to the popular revolution song, keeping a ferocious time that was like a gnashing of teeth in unison. Men and women danced together, women danced together, men danced together, as Hazard had brought them together. At first they were a mere storm of coarse red caps and coarse woollen rags. But as they filled the place and stopped to dance about Lucy, some ghastly apparition of a dance figure gone raving mad arose among them. They advanced, retreated, struck at one another's hands, clutched at one another's heads, spun round alone, caught one another, and spun round in pairs, until many of them dropped. While those were down, the rest linked hand in hand, and all spun round together. Then the ring broke, and in separate rings of two and four they turned and turned, until they all stopped at once, began again, struck, clutched, and tore, and then reversed the spin, and all spun round another way. Suddenly they stopped again, paused, struck out the time afresh, formed into lines the width of the public way, and with their heads low down and their hands high up, swooped, screaming off. No fight could have been half so terrible as this dance. It was so emphatically a fallen sport, a something once innocent delivered over to all devilry, a healthy pastime changed into a means of angering the blood, bewildering the senses, and stealing the heart. Such grace as was visible in it made it the uglier, showing how warped and perverted all things good by nature were become. The maidenly bosom bared to this, the pretty, almost child's head thus distracted, the delicate foot mincing in this slough of blood and dirt, were types of the disjointed time. This was the Carmagnol, as it passed, leaving Lucy frightened and bewildered in the doorway of the wood sawyer's house. The feathery snow fell as quietly and lay as white and soft as if it had never been. "'Oh, my father!' for he stood before her when she lifted up the eyes she had momentarily darkened with her hand. "'Such a cruel, bad sight! "'I know, my dear, I know, I have seen it many times. "'Don't be frightened. Not one of them would harm you. "'I am not frightened for myself, my father. "'But when I think of my husband, and the mercies of these people... "'We will set him above their mercies very soon.' I left him climbing to the window, and I came to tell you. There is no one here to see. You may kiss your hand towards that highest shelving roof. I do so, father, and I send him my soul with it. You cannot see him, my poor dear. No, father, said Lucy, yearning and weeping as she kissed her hand. No. A footstep in the snow. Madame Defarge. "'I salute you, citizeness, from the doctor. "'I salute you, citizen.' "'This in passing, nothing more. "'Madame Defarge gone, like a shadow over the white road. "'Give me your arm, my love. "'Pass from here with an air of cheerfulness and courage, for his sake.' "'That was well done. "'They had left the spot. "'It shall not be in vain. "'Charles is summoned for to-morrow.' "'For to-morrow there is no time to lose. "'I am well prepared, but there are precautions to be taken "'that could not be taken until he was actually summoned before the tribunal. "'He has not received the notice yet, "'but I know that he will presently be summoned for to-morrow "'and removed to the conciergerie. "'I have timely information. "'You are not afraid?' "'She could scarcely answer. "'I trust in you.' "'Do so, implicitly. "'Your suspense is nearly ended, my darling. 
he shall be restored to you within a few hours. I have encompassed him with every protection. I must see Lorry. He stopped. There was a heavy lumbering of wheels within hearing. They both knew too well what it meant. One, two, three. Three tumbrils faring away with their dread loads over the hushing snow. I must see Lorry, the doctor repeated, turning her another way. The staunch old gentleman was still in his trust, had never left it. He and his books were in frequent requisition as to property confiscated and made national. What he could save for the owners, he saved. No better man living to hold fast by what Tellson's had in keeping, and to hold his peace. A murky red and yellow sky, and a rising mist from the Seine, denoted the approach of darkness. It was almost dark when they arrived at the bank. The stately residence of Monseigneur was altogether blighted and deserted. Above a heap of dust and ashes in the court ran the letters, National Property, the Republic One and Indivisible, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity, or Death. Who could that be with Mr. Lorry, the owner of the riding coat upon the chair, who must not be seen? From whom, newly arrived, did he come out, agitated and surprised, to take his favourite in his arms? To whom did he appear to repeat her faltering words, when, raising his voice and turning his head towards the door of the room from which he had issued, he said, "'Removed to the conciergerie, and summoned for to-morrow?' End of Book Three, Chapter Five This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nocturna a Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book Three, Chapter Six Triumph. Instantly all the rest fell to dancing, the and dead the courtyard tribunal overflowed of five with the judges, Carmignoli. public prosecutor, and determined jury sat every day. Their lists went forth every evening, and were read out by the jailers of the various prisons to their prisoners. The standard jailer joke was, Come out and listen to the evening paper, you inside there. Charles Evermond, called Darnay. So at last began the evening paper at La Force. When a name was called, its owner stepped apart into a spot reserved for those who were announced as being thus fatally recorded. Charles Evermond, called Darnay, had reason to know the usage. He had seen hundreds pass away so. His bloated jailer, who wore spectacles to read with, glanced over them to assure himself that he had taken his place, and went through the list, making a similar short pause at each name. There were twenty-three names, but only twenty were responded to, for one of the prisoners so summoned had died in jail and been forgotten, and two had already been guillotined and forgotten. The list was read in the vaulted chamber where Darnay had seen the associated prisoners on the night of his arrival. Every one of those had perished in the massacre. Every human creature he had since cared for and parted with had died on the scaffold. There were hurried words of farewell and kindness, but the parting was soon over. It was the incident of every day, and the Society of La Force was engaged in the preparation of some games of forfeits and a little concert for that evening. They crowded to the grates and shed tears there, but twenty places in the projected entertainments had to be refilled, and the time was, at best, short to the lock-up hour, when the common rooms and corridors would be delivered over to the great dogs who kept watch there through the night. The prisoners were far from insensible or unfeeling. Their ways arose out of the condition of the time. Similarly, though with a subtle difference, a species of fervor or intoxication known without doubt to have led some persons to brave the guillotine unnecessarily and to die by it, was not mere boastfulness, 
but a wild infection of the wildly shaken public mind. In seasons of pestilence, some of us will have a secret attraction to the disease, a terrible passing inclination to die of it. And all of us have like wonders hidden in our breasts, only needing circumstance to evoke them. The passage to the Conciergerie was short and dark. The night in its vermin-haunted cells was long and cold. Next day, 15 prisoners were put to the bar before Charles Darnay's name was called. All the 15 were condemned, and the trials of the whole occupied an hour and a half. Charles Evermond, called Darnay, was at length arraigned. His judges sat upon the bench in feathered hats, but the rough red cap and tricolored cockade was the headdress otherwise prevailing. Looking at the jury and the turbulent audience, he might have thought that the usual order of things was reversed, and that the felons were trying the honest men. The lowest, cruelest, and worst populace of a city, never without its quantity of low, cruel, and bad, were the directing spirits of the scene. Noisily commenting, applauding, disapproving, anticipating, and precipitating the result without a check. Of the men, the greater part were armed in various ways. Of the women, some wore knives, some daggers, some ate and drank as they looked on, many knitted. Among these last was one with a spare piece of knitting under her arm as she worked. She was in the front row, by the side of a man whom he had never seen since his arrival at the barrier, but whom he directly remembered as Defarge. He noticed that she once or twice whispered in his ear, and that she seemed to be his wife. But what he most noticed in the two figures was that although they were posted as close to himself as they could be, they never looked towards him. They seemed to be waiting for something with a dogged determination, and they looked at the jury, but at nothing else. Under the president sat Dr. Manette, in his usual quiet dress. As well as the prisoner could see, he and Mr. Lorry were the only men there, unconnected with the tribunal, who wore their usual clothes, and had not assumed the coarse garb of the Carmagnole. Charles Evermond, called Darnay, was accused by the public prosecutor as an emigrant, whose life was forfeit to the Republic under the decree which banished all emigrants on pain of death. It was nothing that the decree bore date since his return to France. There he was, and there was the decree. He had been taken in France, and his head was demanded. "'Take off his head!' cried the audience. An enemy to the Republic. The President rang his bell to silence those cries and asked the prisoner whether it was not true that he had lived many years in England. Undoubtedly it was. Was he not an emigrant then? What did he call himself? Not an emigrant, he hoped, within the sense and spirit of the law. Why not, the President desired to know because he had voluntarily relinquished a title that was distasteful to him, and a station that was distasteful to him, and had left his country. He submitted before the word emigrant in the present acceptation by the tribunal was in use, to live by his own industry in England rather than on the industry of the overladen people of France. What proof had he of this? He handed in the names of two witnesses, Theophile Gabel and Alexander Manette. But had he married in England? The president reminded him. True, but not an Englishwoman. A citizeness of France? Yes, by birth. Her name and family? Lucy Manette, only daughter of Dr. Manette, the good physician who sits there. This answer had a happy effect upon the audience. Cries and exaltation of the well-known good physician rent the hall. 
So capriciously were the people moved, that tears immediately rolled down several ferocious countenances, which had been glaring at the prisoner a moment before, as if with impatience to pluck him out into the streets and kill him. On these few steps of his dangerous way, Charles Darnay had set his foot according to Dr. Minette's reiterated instructions. The same cautious counsel directed every step that lay before him, and had prepared every inch of his road. The President asked, Why had he returned to France when he did, and not sooner? He had not returned sooner, he replied, simply because he had no means of living in France, save those he had resigned, whereas in England he lived by giving instruction in the French language and literature. He had returned when he did on the pressing and written entreaty of a French citizen, who represented that his life was endangered by his absence. He had come back to save a citizen's life, and to bear his testimony at whatever personal hazard to the truth. Was that criminal in the eyes of the Republic? The populace cried enthusiastically, No! And the President rang his bell to quiet them, which it did not, for they continued to cry, No! until they left off of their own free will. The President required the name of that citizen. The accused explained that the citizen was his first witness. He also referred with confidence to the citizen's letter, which had been taken from him at the barrier, but which he did not doubt would be found among the papers then before the President. The doctor had taken care that it should be there, had assured him that it would be there, and at this stage of the proceedings it was produced and read. Citizen Gabel was called to confirm it, and did so. Citizen Gabel hinted, with infinite delicacy and politeness, that in the pressure of business imposed on the tribunal by the multitude of enemies of the Republic with which it had to deal, he had been slightly overlooked in his prison of the Abbey. In fact, had rather passed out of the tribunal's patriotic remembrance until three days ago, when he had been summoned before it, and had been set at liberty on the juries declaring themselves satisfied that the accusation against him was answered, as to himself, by the surrender of the citizen Evermond, called Darnay. Dr. Manette was next questioned. His high personal popularity and the clearness of his answers made a great impression. But, as he proceeded, as he showed that the accused was his first friend, on his release from his long imprisonment, that the accused had remained in England, always faithful and devoted to his daughter and himself in their exile, that, so far from being in favor with the aristocrat government there, he had actually been tried for his life by it, and the foe of England and friend of the United States, as he brought these circumstances into view, with the greatest discretion and with the straightforward force of truth and earnestness, the jury and the populace became one. At last, when he appealed by name to Monsieur Lorry, an English gentleman then and there present, who, like himself, had been a witness on that English trial and could corroborate his account of it, the jury declared that they had heard enough and that they were ready with their votes if the President were content to receive them. At every vote, the jurymen voted aloud and individually, the populace set up a shout of applause. All the voices were in the prisoner's favor, and the president declared him free. Then began one of those extraordinary scenes with which the populace sometimes gratified their fickleness, or their better impulses towards generosity and mercy, or which they regarded as some set-off against their swollen account of cruel rage. No man can decide now to which of these motives such extraordinary scenes were referable. It is probable to a blending of all the three, with the second predominating. No sooner was the acquittal pronounced than tears were shed as freely as blood at another time, and such fraternal embraces were bestowed upon the prisoner by as many of both sexes as could rush at him, that after his long and unwholesome confinement he was in danger of fainting from exhaustion. Nonetheless, because he knew very well that the very same people, carried by another current, would have rushed at him with the very same intensity to rend him to pieces and strew him over the streets. 
His removal to make way for other accused persons who were to be tried rescued him from these caresses for the moment. Five were to be tried together, next as enemies of the Republic, forasmuch as they had not assisted it by word or deed. So quick was the tribunal to compensate itself and the nation for a chance lost that these five came down to him before he left the place, condemned to die within twenty-four hours. The first of them told him so, with the customary prison sign of death, a raised finger, and they all added in words, Long live the Republic! The five had had, it is true, no audience to lengthen their proceedings. For when he and Dr. Manette emerged from the gate, there was a great crowd about it, in which there seemed to be every face he had seen in court, except two, for which he looked in vain. On his coming out, the concourse made at him anew, weeping, embracing, and shouting, all by turns and all together, until the very tide of the river on the bank of which the mad scene was acted seemed to run mad like the people on the shore. They put him into a great chair they had among them, and which they had taken either out of the court itself or one of its rooms or passages. Over the chair they had thrown a red flag, and to the back of it they had bound a pike with a red cap on its top. In this car of triumph, not even the doctor's entreaties could prevent his being carried to his home on men's shoulders, with a confused sea of red caps heaving about him and casting up to sight from the stormy deep such wrecks of faces that he more than once misdoubted his mind being in confusion, and that he was in the tumbril on his way to the guillotine. In wild, dreamlike procession, embracing whom they met and pointing him out, they carried him on, reddening the snowy streets with the prevailing Republican color, in winding and tramping through them, as they had reddened them below the snow with a deeper dye, they carried him thus into the courtyard of the building where he lived. Her father had gone on before to prepare her, and when her husband stood upon his feet, she dropped insensible in his arms. As he held her to his heart and turned her beautiful head between his face and the brawling crowd, so that his tears and her lips might come together unseen, a few of the people fell to dancing. Instantly all the rest fell to dancing, and the courtyard overflowed with the Carmagnole. Then they elevated into the vacant chair a young woman from the crowd to be carried as the goddess of liberty, and then swelling and overflowing out into the adjacent streets, and along the river's bank, and over the bridge, the Carmagnole absorbed them every one and whirled them away. After grasping the doctor's hand as he stood victorious and proud before him, after grasping the hand of Mr. Lorry, who came panting in breathless from his struggle against the water spout of the Carmagnole, after kissing little Lucy, who was lifted up to clasp her arms round his neck, and after embracing the ever-zealous and faithful Pross who lifted her, he took his wife in his arms and carried her up to their rooms. Lucy, my own, I am safe. Oh, dearest Charles, let me thank God for this on my knees as I have prayed to him. They all reverently bowed their heads and hearts. When she was again in his arms, he said to her, And now speak to your father, dearest. No other man in all this France could have done what he has done for me. She laid her head upon her father's breast, as she had laid his poor head on her own breast long, long ago. He was happy in the return he had made her. He was happy in the return he had made her. He was recompensed for his suffering. He was proud of his strength. You must not be weak, my darling, he remonstrated. Don't tremble so. I have saved him. End of Book 3, Chapter 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book the Third. The Track of a Storm. 
Chapter 7 A Knock at the Door I have saved him. It was not another of the dreams in which he had often come back. He was really here. And yet his wife trembled, and a vague but heavy fear was upon her. All the air round was so thick and dark, the people were so passionately revengeful and fitful, the innocent were so constantly put to death on vague suspicion and black malice, it was so impossible to forget that many as blameless as her husband, and as dear to others as he was to her, every day shared the fate from which she had been clutched, that her heart could not be as lightened of its load as she felt it ought to be. The shadows of the wintry afternoon were beginning to fall, and even now the dreadful carts were rolling through the streets. Her mind pursued them, looking for him among the condemned, and then she clung closer to his real presence and trembled more. Her father, cheering her, showed a compassionate superiority to this woman's weakness, which was wonderful to see. No garret, no shoemaking, no one hundred and five North Tower now. He had accomplished the task he had set himself. His promise was redeemed. He had saved Charles. Let them all lean upon him. Their housekeeping was of a very frugal kind, not only because that was the safest way of life, involving the least offense to the people, but because they were not rich, and Charles, throughout his imprisonment, had had to pay heavily for his bad food, and for his guard, and towards the living of the poorer prisoners. Partly on this account, and partly to avoid a domestic spy, they kept no servant. The citizen and citizeness who acted as porters at the courtyard gate rendered them occasional service, and Jerry, almost wholly transferred to them by Mr. Lorry, had become their daily retainer, and had his bed there every night. It was an ordinance of the Republic, one and indivisible of liberty, equality, fraternity, or death, that on the door or doorpost of every house the name of every inmate must be legibly inscribed in letters of a certain size at a certain convenient height from the ground. Mr. Jerry Cruncher's name, therefore, duly embellished the doorpost down below. And, as the afternoon shadows deepened, the owner of that name himself appeared, from overlooking a painter whom Dr. Manette had employed to add to the list the name of Charles Evermond called Darnay. In the universal fear and distrust that darkened the time, all the usual harmless ways of life were changed. In the doctor's little household, as in very many others, the articles of daily consumption that were wanted were purchased every evening, in small quantities, and at various small shops. To avoid attracting notice and to give as little occasion as possible for talk and envy was the general desire. For some months past, Miss Pross and Mr. Cruncher had discharged the office of purveyors, the former carrying the money, the latter the basket. Every afternoon, at about the time when the public lamps were lighted, they fared forth on this duty, and made and brought home such purchases as were needful. Although Miss Pross, through her long association with the French family, might have known as much of their language as of her own, if she had had a mind, she had no mind in that direction. Consequently, she knew no more of that nonsense, as she was pleased to call it, than Mr. Cruncher did. So her manner of marketing was to plump a noun substantive at the head of the shopkeeper without any introduction in the nature of an article, and, if it happened not to be the name of the thing she wanted, to look round for that thing, lay hold of it, and hold on by it until the bargain was concluded. She always made a bargain for it by holding up, as a statement of its just price, one finger less than the merchant held up, whatever his number might be. Now, Mr. Cruncher, said Miss Pross, whose eyes were red with felicity, if you are ready, I am. Jerry hoarsely professed himself at Miss Pross's service. He had worn all his rust off long ago, but nothing would file his spiky head down. There's all manner of things wanted, said Miss Pross, and we shall have a precious time of it. We want wine among the rest. Nice toast these redheads will be drinking wherever we buy it. It will be much the same to your knowledge, miss, I should think, retorted Jerry, whether they drink your health or the old uns. Who's he? said Miss Pross. Mr. Cruncher, with some diffidence, explained himself as meaning old Nick's. Ha! It doesn't need an interpreter to explain the meaning of these creatures. They have but one, and it's midnight murder and mischief. Hush, dear, pray, pray be cautious, cried Lucy. 
Yes, 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 I'll be cautious. But I may say among ourselves that I do hope there will be no oniony and tobacco-y smotherings in the form of embracings all around, going on in the streets. Now, Ladybird, never you stir from that fire till I come back. Take care of the dear husband you have recovered, and don't move your pretty head from his shoulder as you have it now, till you see me again. May I ask you a question, Dr. Manette, before I go? I think you may take that liberty, the doctor answered, smiling. For gracious sake, don't talk about liberty. We have quite enough of that, said Miss Pross. Hush, dear, again, Lucy remonstrated. Well, my sweet, said Miss Pross, nodding her head emphatically, the short and the long of it is that I am a subject of His Most Gracious Majesty King George the Third. Miss Pross curtsied at the name. And as such, my maxim is, confound their politics, frustrate their knavish tricks, on him our hopes we fix, God save the king. Mr. Cruncher, in an access of loyalty, growlingly repeated the words after Miss Pross, like somebody at church. I am glad you have so much of the Englishman in you, though I wish you had never taken that cold in your voice, said Miss Pross approvingly. But the question, Dr. Manette, is there— it was the good creature's way to affect to make light of anything that was a great anxiety with them all, and to come at it in this chance manner. Is there any prospect yet of our getting out of this place? I fear not yet. It would be dangerous for Charles yet. Hey ho hum, said Miss Pross, cheerfully repressing a sigh as she glanced at her darling's golden hair in the light of the fire. Then we must have patience and wait, that's all. We must hold up our heads and fight low, as my brother Solomon used to say. Now, Mr. Cruncher, don't you move, Ladybird. They went out, leaving Lucy and her husband, her father, and the child by a bright fire. Mr. Lorry was expected back presently from the banking house. Miss Pross had lighted the lamp, but had put it aside in a corner that they might enjoy the firelight undisturbed. Little Lucy sat by her grandfather with her hands clasped through his arm. And he, in a tone not rising much above a whisper, began to tell her a story of a great and powerful fairy who had opened a prison wall and let out a captive who had once done the fairy a service. All was subdued and quiet, and Lucy was more at ease than she had been. "'What is that?' she cried all at once. "'My dear,' said her father, stopping in his story and laying his hand on hers, "'command yourself.' What a disordered state you are in! The least thing, nothing, startles you. You, your father's daughter. I thought my father, said Lucy, excusing herself, with a pale face and in a faltering voice, that I heard strange feet upon the stair. My love, the staircase is as still as death. As he said the word, a blow was struck upon the door. Oh, father, father, what can this be? Hide, Charles, save him. My child, said the doctor, rising and laying his hand up on her shoulder, I have saved him. What weakness is this, my dear? Let me go to the door. He took the lamp in his hand, crossed the two intervening outer rooms, and opened it. A rude clattering of feet over the floor, and four rough men in red caps, armed with sabres and pistols, entered the room. The citizen Evremon called Darnay, said the first. Who seeks him, answered Darnay. I seek him. We seek him. I know you, Evremond. I saw you before the tribunal today. You are again the prisoner of the Republic. The four surrounded him, where he stood with his wife and child clinging to him. Tell me how and why am I again a prisoner? It is enough that you return straight to the conciergerie, and will know to-morrow. You are summoned for to-morrow. Dr. Manette, whom this visitation had so turned into stone, that he stood with the lamp in his hand, as if be woe a statue made to hold it, moved after these words were spoken, put the lamp down, and confronting the speaker and taking him, not ungently, by the loose front of his red woolen shirt, said, You know him, you have said. Do you know me? "'Yes, I know you, Citizen Doctor.' "'We all know you, Citizen Doctor,' said the other three. He looked abstractedly from one to the other, and said in a lower voice after a pause, "'Will you answer his question to me, then? How does this happen?' "'Citizen Doctor,' said the first reluctantly, "'he has been denounced to the section of Saint-Antoine. "'This citizen, 
pointing out the second who had entered, is from Saint Antoine. The citizen here indicated, nodded his head, and added, He is accused by Saint Antoine. Of what? asked the doctor. Citizen doctor, said the first with his former reluctance, ask no more. If the Republic demands sacrifices from you, without doubt you as good patriot will be happy to make them. The Republic goes before all. The people is supreme. Evermond, we are pressed. One word, the doctor entreated. Will you tell me who denounced him? It is against rule, answered the first, but you can ask him of Saint Antoine here. The doctor turned his eyes upon that man, who moved uneasily on his feet, rubbed his beard a little, and at length said, Well, truly it is against rule, but he is denounced, and gravely, by the citizen and citizeness de Farge, and by one other. What other? Do you ask, citizen doctor? Yes. Then, said he of Saint Antoine, with a strange look, you will be answered to-morrow. Now... I am dumb. End of chapter 7, A Knock at the Door, Book the Third, The Track of a Storm. Read by Torah in Yellowstone National Park, October 2006. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book Three, Chapter Eight A Hand at Cards Happily unconscious of the new calamity at home, Miss Pross threaded her way along the narrow streets and crossed the river by the bridge of the Pont Neuf, reckoning in her mind the number of indispensable purchases she had to make. Mr. Cruncher, with the basket, walked at her side. They both looked to the right and to the left into most of the shops they passed, had a wary eye for all gregarious assemblages of people, and turned out of their road to avoid any very excited group of talkers. It was a raw evening, and the misty river, blurred to the eye with blazing lights, and to the ear with harsh noises, showed where the barges were stationed, in which the smiths worked, making guns for the army of the Republic. Woe to the man who played tricks with that army, or got undeserved promotion in it. Better for him that his beard had never grown— for the national razor shaved him close. Having purchased a few small articles of grocery and a measure of oil for the lamp, Miss Pross bethought herself of the wine they wanted. After peeping into several wine-shops, she stopped at the sign of the good Republican Brutus of Antiquity, not far from the National Palace, once and twice the Tuileries, where the aspect of things rather took their fancy. It had a quieter look than any other place of the same description they had passed, and though red with patriotic caps, was not so red as the rest. Sounding Mr. Cruncher, and finding him of her opinion, Miss Pross resorted to the good Republican Brutus of Antiquity, attended by her cavalier. Slightly observant of the smoky lights, of the people, pipe in mouth, playing with limp cards and yellow dominoes, of the one bare-breasted, bare-armed, soot-begrimed workman reading a journal aloud, and of the others listening to him, of the weapons worn or laid aside to be resumed, of the two or three customers fallen forward asleep, who in the popular high-shouldered shaggy black spencer looked in that attitude like slumbering bears or dogs, and the two outlandish customers approached the counter and showed what they wanted, as their wine was measuring out, a man parted from another man in a corner, and rose to depart. In going he had to face Miss Pross. No sooner did he face her than Miss Pross uttered a scream and clapped her hands. In a moment the whole company was on their feet. That somebody was assassinated by somebody vindicating a difference of opinion was the likeliest occurrence. Everybody looked to see somebody fall, but only saw a man and woman standing staring at each other, 
the man with all the outward aspect of a Frenchman and a thorough Republican, the woman evidently English. What was said in this disappointing anticlimax by the disciples of the good Republican Brutus of antiquity, except that it was something very voluble and loud, would have been as so much Hebrew or Chaldean to Miss Pross and her protector, though they had been all ears. But they had no ears for anything in their surprise, for it must be recorded that not only was Miss Pross lost in amazement and agitation, but Mr. Cruncher, though it seemed on his own separate and individual account, was in a state of the greatest wonder. "'What is the matter?' said the man, who had caused Miss Pross to scream, speaking in a vexed, abrupt voice, though in a low tone, and in English. "'Oh, Solomon! Solomon!' cried Miss Pross, clapping her hands again. "'After not setting eyes upon you or hearing of you for so long a time, do I find you here?' "'Don't call me Solomon. Do you want to be the death of me?' asked the man, in a furtive, frightened way. "'Brother! brother!' cried Miss Pross, bursting into tears. "'Have I ever been so hard with you that you ask me such a cruel question?' "'Then hold your meddlesome tongue,' said Solomon. "'And come out, if you want to speak to me. Pay for your wine and come out. Who's this man?' Miss Pross, shaking her loving and dejected head at her by no means affectionate brother, said through her tears, "'Mr. Cruncher!' "'Let him come out, too,' said Solomon. "'Does he think me a ghost?' "'Apparently Mr. Cruncher did, to judge from his looks. "'He said not a word, however, "'and Miss Pross, exploring the depths of her reticule "'through her tears with great difficulty, paid for the wine. "'As she did so, Solomon turned to the followers "'of the good Republican Brutus of Antiquity, "'and offered a few words of explanation in the French language, "'which caused them all to relapse into their former places and pursuits. "'Now,' said Solomon, stopping at the dark street corner. "'What do you want?' "'How dreadfully unkind in a brother nothing has ever turned my love away from,' cried Miss Pross, "'to give me such a greeting and show me no affection.' "'There, confound it, there,' said Solomon, making a dab at Miss Pross's lips with his own. "'Now, are you content?' Miss Pross only shook her head and wept in silence. "'If you expect me to be surprised,' said her brother Solomon, "'I am not surprised. I knew you were here. I know of most people who are here. "'If you really don't want to endanger my existence, which I half believe you do, "'go your ways as soon as possible, and let me go mine. I am busy. I am an official.' "'My English brother Solomon,' mourned Miss Pross, casting up her tear-fraught eyes, "'that had the makings in him of one of the best and greatest men in his native country, "'an official among foreigners, and such foreigners.' "'I would almost sooner have seen the dear boy lying in his—' "'I said so,' cried her brother, interrupting. "'I knew it. You want to be the death of me. I shall be rendered suspected by my own sister, just as I am getting on.' "'The gracious and merciful heavens forbid!' cried Miss Pross. "'Far rather would I never see you again, dear Solomon, though I have ever loved you truly and ever shall. Say but one affectionate word to me, and tell me there is nothing angry or estranged between us, and I will detain you no longer.' "'Good Miss Pross, as if the estrangement between them had come of any culpability of hers, as if Mr. Lorry had not known it for a fact, years ago, in the quiet corner in Soho, that this precious brother had spent her money and left her.' He was saying the affectionate word, however, with a far more grudging condescension and patronage than he could have shown if their relative merits and positions had been reversed, which is invariably the case all the world over, when Mr. Cruncher, touching him on the shoulder, hoarsely and unexpectedly, interposed with the following singular question. "'Oh, say, might I ask the favour, as whether your name is John Solomon, or Solomon John?' The official turned towards him with sudden distrust. He had not previously uttered a word. "'Come,' said Mr. Cruncher, "'speak out, you know,' which, by the way, was more than he could do himself. "'John Solomon? Or oh, Solomon John. She calls you Solomon, and she must know, being your sister. And I know you're John, you know. Which of the two goes first? And regarding that name Frost, likewise?' "'That weren't your name over the water.' "'What do you mean?' "'Well, I don't know all I mean, "'cause I can't call to mind what your name was over the water.' "'No?' 
"'No, but I swear it was a name of two syllables.' "'Indeed?' "'Yeah, t'other one was one syllable. "'I know you. "'You was a spy witness at the Bailey. "'Why in the name of the father of lies own father to yourself "'was you called at that time?' "'Bossad,' said another voice, striking in. "'That's the name for a thousand pound,' cried Jerry. "'The speaker who struck in was Sidney Carton. "'He had his hands behind him, under the skirts of his riding-coat, "'and he stood at Mr. Cruncher's elbow "'as negligently as he might have stood at the old bailey itself. "'Don't be alarmed, my dear Miss Pross. "'I arrived at Mr. Lorry's to his surprise yesterday evening. "'We agreed that I would not present myself elsewhere "'until all was well, or until I could be useful. "'I present myself here to beg a little talk with your brother.' "'I wish you had a better employed brother than Mr. Barsad. "'I wish for your sake Mr. Barsad was not a sheep of the prisons.' "'Sheep was a cant word at the time, for a spy under the jailers. "'The spy, who was pale, turned paler, and asked him how he dared. "'I'll tell you,' said Sidney. "'I lighted on you, Mr. Barsad, coming out of the prison of the conciergerie, "'while I was contemplating the walls an hour or more ago.' "'You have a face to be remembered, and I remember faces well. "'Made curious by seeing you in that connection, "'and having a reason to which you are no stranger "'for associating you with the misfortunes of a friend, "'now very unfortunate, I walked in your direction. "'I walked into the wine-shop here, close after you, and sat near you. "'I had no difficulty in deducing from your unreserved conversation.' and the rumour openly going about among your admirers, the nature of your calling. And gradually what I had done at random seemed to shape itself into a purpose, Mr. Barr said. "'What purpose?' the spy asked. "'It would be troublesome, and might be dangerous to explain it in the street. Could you favour me, in confidence, with some minutes of your company, at the office of Telson's Bank, for instance?' "'Under a threat?' "'Oh, did I say that? "'Then why should I go there?' "'Really, Mr. Barr said, I can't say, if you can't. "'Do you mean that you won't say, sir?' "'The spy irresolutely asked. "'You apprehend me very clearly, Mr. Barr said. "'I won't.' "'Carton's negligent recklessness of manner "'came powerfully in aid of his quickness and skill "'in such a business as he had in his secret mind.' and with such a man as he had to do with. His practised eye saw it, and made the most of it. "'Now, I told you so,' said the spy, casting a reproachful look at his sister. "'If any trouble comes of this, it's your doing.' "'Come, come, Mr. Barsad,' exclaimed Sidney. "'Don't be ungrateful. But for my great respect for your sister, I might not have led up so pleasantly to a little proposal that I wish to make for our mutual satisfaction. Do you go with me to the bank? I'll hear what you've got to say. Yes, I'll go with you. I propose that we first conduct your sister safely to the corner of her own street. Let me take your arm, Miss Pross. This is not a good city at this time for you to be out unprotected. "'And as your escort knows, Mr. Barsad, I will invite him to Mr. Lorry's with us. "'Are we ready? Come, then.' "'Miss Pross recalled soon afterwards, and to the end of her life remembered, "'that as she pressed her hands on Sidney's arm, and looked up in his face, "'imploring him to do no hurt to Solomon, "'there was a braced purpose in the arm, and a kind of inspiration in the eyes, "'which not only contradicted his light manner, but changed and raised the man.' She was too much occupied, then, with fears for the brother who so little deserved her affection, and with Sidney's friendly reassurances, adequately to heed what she observed. They left her at the corner of the street, and Carton led the way to Mr. Lorry's, which was within a few minutes' walk. John Barsad, or Solomon Pross, walked at his side. Mr. Lorry had just finished his dinner, and was sitting before a cheery little log or two of fire, perhaps looking into their blaze for the picture of that younger elderly gentleman from Telson's, who had looked into the red coals at the Royal George at Dover, now a good many years ago. He turned his head as they entered, 
and showed the surprise with which he saw a stranger. "'Miss Pross's brother, sir,' said Sidney. "'Mr. Barsad.' "'Barsad?' repeated the old gentleman. "'Barsad? I have an association with the name and with the face.' "'I told you you had a remarkable face, Mr. Barsad,' observed Carton coolly. "'Pray sit down.' As he took a chair himself, he supplied the link that Mr. Lorry wanted, by saying to him, with a frown, "'Witness at that trial.' Mr. Lorry immediately remembered, and regarded his new visitor with an undisguised look of abhorrence. "'Mr. Barsad has been recognised by Miss Pross.' "'as the affectionate brother you have heard of,' said Sidney, "'and has acknowledged the relationship. "'I passed the worst news. "'Darnay has been arrested again.' "'Struck with consternation, the old gentleman exclaimed, "'What do you tell me? "'I left him safe and free within these two hours, "'and am about to return to him.' "'Arrested for all that. "'When was it done, Mr. Barsad?' "'Just now, if at all.' "'Mr. Barsad is the best authority possible, sir,' said Sidney, "'and I have it from Mr. Barsad's communication to a friend and brother sheep, over a bottle of wine, that the arrest has taken place. He left the messengers at the gate and saw them admitted by the porter. There is no earthly doubt that he is retaken. Mr. Lorry's business eye read in the speaker's face that it was loss of time to dwell upon the point. Confused but sensible that something might depend on his presence of mind,' He commanded himself, and was silently attentive. "'Now I trust,' said Sidney to him, "'that the name and influence of Dr. Manette may stand him in as good stead to-morrow. You said it would be before the tribunal again to-morrow, Mr. Barsad?' "'Yes, I believe so. In as good stead to-morrow as to-day. But it may not be so. I own to you I am shaken, Mr. Lorry, by Dr. Manette's not having had the power to prevent this arrest.' "'He may not have known of it beforehand,' said Mr. Lorry. "'But that very circumstance would be alarming, "'when we remember how identified he is with his son-in-law.' "'That's true,' Mr. Lorry acknowledged, "'with his troubled hand at his chin, "'and his troubled eyes on Carton. "'In short,' said Sidney, "'this is a desperate time, "'when desperate games are played for desperate stakes. "'Let the doctor play the winning game.' I will play the losing one. No man's life here is worth purchase. Any one carried home by the people to-day may be condemned to-morrow. Now, the stake I have resolved to play for, in case of the worst, is a friend in the conciergerie, and the friend I purpose to myself to win is Mr. Barsad. You need to have good cards, sir, said the spy. I'll run them over. "'I'll see what I hold. Mr. Lorry, you know what a brute I am. I wish you'd give me a little brandy.' It was put before him, and he drank off a glassful, drank off another glassful, pushed the bottle thoughtfully away. "'Mr. Barsad,' he went on, in the tone of one who really was looking over a hand at cards, "'sheep of the prisons, emissary of the Republican committees, now turnkey, now prisoner,' always spy and secret informer, so much the more valuable here for being English, that an Englishman is less open to suspicion of subordination in these characters than a Frenchman, represents himself to his employers under a false name. That's a very good card. Mr. Barsad, now in the employ of the Republican French government, was formerly in the employ of the aristocratic English government, the enemy of France and freedom. "'That's an excellent card. "'Inference clear as day in this region of suspicion, "'that Mr. Barsad, still in the pay of the aristocratic English government, "'is the spy of Pitt, the treacherous foe of the Republic crouching in its bosom, "'the English traitor and agent of all mischief, so much spoken of and so difficult to find. "'That's a card not to be beaten. "'Have you followed my hand, Mr. Barsad?' "'Not to understand your play,' returned the spy, somewhat uneasily. "'I play my ace. "'Denunciation of Mr. Barsad to the nearest section committee. "'Look over your hand, Mr. Barsad, and see what you have. "'Don't hurry.' "'He drew the bottle near, 
poured out another glassful of brandy, and drank it off, he saw that the spy was fearful of him drinking himself into a fit state for the immediate denunciation of him. Seeing it, he poured out and drank another glassful. "'Look over your hand carefully, Mr. Barsad. Take time.' It was a poorer hand than he suspected. Mr. Barsad saw losing cards in it that Sidney Carton knew nothing of. Thrown out of his honourable employment in England, through too much unsuccessful hard swearing there, not because he was not wanted there, our English reasons for vaunting our superiority to secrecy and spies were of very modern date. He knew that he had crossed the Channel, and accepted service in France, first as a tempter and an eavesdropper among his own countrymen there, gradually as a tempter and an eavesdropper among the natives. He knew that under the overthrown government he had been a spy upon St. Antoine and Defarge's wine-shop, had received from the watchful police such heads of information concerning Dr. Manette's imprisonment, release, and history, as should serve him for an introduction to familiar conversation with the Defarges, and tried them on Madame Defarge, and had broken down with them signally. He always remembered with fear and trembling that that terrible woman had knitted when he talked with her, and had looked ominously at him as her fingers moved. He had since seen her in the section of St. Antoine, over and over again produce her knitted registers, and denounce people whose lives the guillotine then surely swallowed up. He knew, as every one employed as he was did, that he was never safe, that flight was impossible, that he was tied fast under the shadow of the axe, and that in spite of his utmost turgivisation and treachery in furtherance of the reigning terror, a word might bring it down upon him once denounced and on such grave grounds as had just now been suggested to his mind, he foresaw that the dreadful woman, of whose unrelenting character he had seen many proofs, would produce against him that fatal register, and would quash his last chance of life. Besides that all secret men are men soon terrified, here were surely cards enough of one black suit to justify the holder in growing rather livid as he turned them over. "'You scarcely seem to like your hand,' said Sidney, with the greatest composure. "'Do you play?' "'I think, sir,' said the spy, in the meanest manner, as he turned to Mr. Lorry, "'I may appeal to a gentleman of your years and benevolence to put it to this other gentleman, so much your junior, whether he can under any circumstances reconcile it to his station to play that ace of which he has spoken.' I admit that I am a spy, and that it is considered a discreditable station, though it must be filled by somebody. But this gentleman is no spy, and why should he so demean himself as to make himself one?' "'I play my ace, Mr. Barsad,' said Carton, taking the answer on himself and looking at his watch, without any scruple, in a very few minutes. "'I should have hoped, gentlemen both,' said the spy, always striving to hook Mr. Lorry into the discussion, "'that your respect for my sister, I could not better testify my respect for your sister, "'than by finally relieving her of her brother,' said Sidney Carton. "'You think not, sir. I have thoroughly made up my mind about it.' The smooth manner of the spy, curiously in dissonance with his ostentatiously rough dress, and probably with his usual demeanour, received such a check from the inscrutability of Carton who was a mystery to wiser and honester men than he, that it faltered here, and failed him. While he was at a loss, Carton said, resuming his former air of contemplating cards, "'And, indeed, now I think again, I have a strong impression that I have another good card here, not yet enumerated. That friend and fellowship, who spoke of himself as pasturing in the country prisons, "'Who was he?' "'French. You don't know him,' said the spy quickly. "'French, eh?' repeated Carton, musing, and not appearing to notice him at all, though he echoed his word. "'Well, he may be.' "'Is, I assure you,' said the spy, "'though it's not important.' "'Though it's not important,' repeated Carton, in the same mechanical way. "'Though it's not important—no, it's not important, no. 
"'Yet I know the face.' "'I think not. I am sure not. It can't be,' said the spy. "'It can't be,' muttered Sidney Carton retrospectively, and filling his glass, which fortunately was a small one, again. "'Can't be. Spoke good French. Yet like a foreigner, I thought.' Provincial, said the spy. No, foreign, cried Carton, striking his open hand on the table, as a light broke clearly in his mind. Cly, disguised, but the same man. We had that man before us at the old Bailey. Now, there you are hasty, sir, said Barsad, with a smile that gave his aquiline nose an extra inclination to one side. There you really give me an advantage over you. "'Cly, who I will unreservedly admit at this distance of time, was a partner of mine, has been dead several years. I attended him in his last illness. He was buried in London, at the Church of St. Pancras in the Fields. His unpopularity with the blackguard multitude at the moment prevented my following his remains, but I helped to lay him in his coffin.' Here Mr. Lorry became aware, from where he sat, of a most remarkable goblin shadow on the wall. Tracing it to its source, he discovered it to be caused by a sudden extraordinary rising and stiffening of all the risen and stiff hair on Mr. Cruncher's head. "'Let us be reasonable,' said the spy, and, "'and let us be fair. To show you how mistaken you are, and what an unfounded assumption yours is, I will lay before you a certificate of Cly's burial.' which I happen to have carried in my pocket-book. With a hurried hand, he produced and opened it. Ever since. There it is. Oh, look at it, look at it. You may take it in your hand. It's no forgery. Here Mr. Lorry perceived the reflection on the wall to Elongate, and Mr. Cruncher rose and stepped forward. His hair could not have been more violently on end if it had been that moment dressed by the cow with the crumpled horn in the house that Jack built. Unseen by the spy, Mr. Cruncher stood at his side, and touched him on the shoulder like a ghostly bailiff. "'That there Roger Cly, master,' said Mr. Cruncher, with a taciturn and iron-bound visage. "'So you put him in his coffin?' "'I did.' "'Who took him out of it?' Barsad leant back in his chair and stammered, "'What do you mean?' "'I mean,' said Mr. Cruncher, that he warn't never in it. No, not he. I'll have my head took off if he were ever in it. The spy looked round at the two gentlemen. They both looked in unspeakable astonishment at Jerry. I'll tell you, said Jerry, that you buried paving stones and earth in that there coffin. Don't you go and tell me that you buried Cly. It was a takin. Me and two more knows it. How do you know it? "'What's that to you, Ecod?' growled Mr. Cruncher. "'It's you I've got a old grudge against, is it, "'with your shameful impositions upon tradesmen? "'Or catch hold of your throat and choke you for half a guinea?' Sidney Carton, who, with Mr. Lorry, "'had been lost in amazement at this turn of the business, "'here requested Mr. Cruncher to moderate and explain himself. "'Another time, sir.' he returned evasively. The present time is ill-convenient for explaining. What I stand to is that he knows full well what that there claw was never in that there coffin. Let him say he was in so much of a word of one syllable, and I'll either catch hold of his throat and choke him for half a guinea. Mr. Cruncher dwelt upon this as quite a liberal offer. Or I'll out and announce him. Um, I see one thing, said Carton. I hold another card, Mr. Barsad. "'Impossible here in raging Paris, with suspicion filling the air, "'for you to outlive denunciation when you are in communication "'with another aristocratic spy of the same antecedents as yourself, "'who, moreover, has the mystery about him of having feigned death "'and come to life again. "'A plot in the prisons of the foreigner against the Republic? "'A strong card. A certain guillotine card. Do you play?' "'No,' returned the spy, I throw up. I confess that we were so unpopular with the outrageous mob, I only got away from England at the risk of being ducked to death, and that Cly was so ferreted up and down that he never would have got away at all but for that sham. Now, how this man knows it was a sham is a wonder of wonders to me. 
"'Never you trouble your head about this man,' retorted the contentious Mr. Cruncher. "'You'll have trouble enough with giving your attention to that gentleman. "'And look here. Once more.' Mr. Cruncher could not be restrained from making rather an ostentatious parade of his liberality. "'I'd catch hold of your throat and choke you for half a guinea.' The sheep of the prisons turned from him to Sidney Carton, and said with more decision, "'It has come to a point. I go on duty soon, and can't overstay my time. You've told me you had a proposal. What is it? Now, it's no use asking too much of me. Ask me to do anything in my office, putting my head in great extra danger, and I had better trust my life to the chances of a refusal than the chances of consent. In short, I should make that choice.' "'You talk of desperation. We're all desperate here. "'Remember, I may denounce you if I think proper, "'and I can swear my way through stone walls, and so can others. "'Now, what do you want with me?' "'Not very much. You're a turnkey at the conciergerie. "'I tell you, once and for all, there is no such thing as an escape possible,' said the spy firmly. "'Why need you tell me what I have not asked?' "'You are a turnkey at the conciergerie.' "'I am, sometimes.' "'You can be, when you choose.' "'I can pass in and out when I choose.' Sidney Carton filled another glass with brandy, poured it slowly out upon the hearth, and watched it as it dropped. It being all spent, he said, rising, "'So far we have spoken before these two because it was as well that the merits of the card should not rest solely between you and me. Come into the dark room here, and let us have one final word, alone. End of Book Three, Chapter Eight This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three The Track of a Storm. Chapter Nine The Game Made. While Sidney Carton and the sheep of the prisons were in the adjoining dark room, speaking so low that not a sound was heard, Mr. Lorry looked at Jerry in considerable doubt and mistrust. That honest tradesman's manner of receiving the look did not inspire confidence. He changed the leg on which he rested as often as if he had fifty of those limbs, and were trying them all. He examined his fingernails with a very questionable closeness of attention, and whenever Mr. Lorry's eyes caught his, he was taken with that peculiar kind of short cough requiring the hollow of a hand before it, which is seldom, if ever, known to be an infirmity attendant on perfect openness of character. Jerry, said Mr. Lorry, come here. Mr. Cruncher came forward sideways, with one of his shoulders in advance of him. What have you been besides a messenger? After some cogitation, accompanied with an intent look at his patron, Mr. Cruncher conceived the luminous idea of replying, agricultural character. My mind misgives me much, said Mr. Lorry, angrily shaking a forefinger at him, that you have used the respectable and great house of Telson's as a blind, and that you have had an unlawful occupation of an infamous description. If you have, don't expect me to befriend you when you get back to England. If you have, don't expect me to keep your secret. Telson's shall not be imposed upon. I hope, sir, pleaded the abashed Mr. Cruncher, that a gentleman like yourself, what I had the honor of odd jobbing till I'm gray at it, would think twice about harming of me, even if it was so. I don't say it is, but even if it was. And which it is to be took into account that, if it was, it wouldn't, even then, be all on one side. There'd be two sides to it. There might be medical doctors at the present hour, a pickin' up their guineas, where an honest tradesman don't pick up his fardens. Fardens, no, nor yet his half-fardens. Half-fardens, no, nor yet his quarter. A banking away like smoke at Tellson's, and a cocking their medical eyes at that tradesman on the sly, a goin' in and goin' out to their own carriages. Ah, equally like smoke, if not more so. Well, that'd be imposing, too, on Telson's, for you cannot sarse the goose and not the gander. And here's Mrs. Cruncher, or leastways was in the old England times, and would be to-morrow, if cause given, a floppin' again the business to that degree as is ruinating, stark ruinating. 
whereas them medical doctors' wives don't flop, catch em at it. Or if they flop, their toppings go in favor of more patients, and how can you rightly have one without t'other? Well, what with undertakers, and what with parish clerks, and what with sextons, and what with private watchmen, all the warishness and all in it, a man wouldn't get much by it, even if it was so. And what little a man did get would never prosper with him, Mr. Lorry. He'd never have no good of it. He'd want all along to be out of the line if he could see his way out, being once in, even if it was so. Ugh, cried Mr. Lorry, rather relenting nevertheless. I am shocked at the sight of you. Now, what I would humbly offer to you, sir, pursued Mr. Cruncher, even if it was so, which I don't say it is. Don't prevaricate, said Mr. Lorry. No, I will not, sir, returned Mr. Crunchers, as if nothing were further from his thoughts or practice, which I don't say it is. What I would humbly offer to you, sir, would be this. Upon that there stool, at that there bar, sets that there boy of mine, brought up and growed up to be a man, what will errand you, messenger you, general light job you, till your heels is where your head is, if such should be your wishes. If it was so, which I don't say it is, for I will not prevaricate to you, sir, let that there boy keep his father's place, and take care of his mother. Don't blow upon that boy's father. Do not do it, sir, and let that father go into the line of the regular diggin', and make amends for what he would have undug, if it was so, by diggin' of him in with a will, and with convictions respecting the future keepin' of him safe. That, Mr. Lorry, said Mr. Cruncher, wiping his forehead with his arm, as an announcement that he had arrived at the peroration of his discourse, is what I would respectfully offer to you, sir. A man don't see all this here a-goin' on dreadful round him, in the way of subjects without heads, dear me, plentiful enough for him to bring the price down to porterage, and hardly that, without having his serious thoughts of things. And these here would be mine, if it was so, in treatin' of you for to bear in mind that what I just said now, up and I said in the good cause where I might have kept it back. That at least is true, said Mr. Lorry. Say no more now. It may be that I shall yet stand your friend, if you deserve it, and repent in action, not words. I want no more words. Mr. Cruncher knuckled his forehead as Sidney Carton and the spy returned from the dark room. Adieu, Mr. Barsad, said the former. Our arrangement thus made, you have nothing to fear from me. He sat down in a chair on the hearth, over against Mr. Lorry. When they were alone, Mr. Lorry asked him what he had done. Not much. If it should go ill with the prisoner, I have ensured access to him once. Mr. Lorry's countenance fell. It is all I could do, said Carton. To propose too much would be to put this man's head under the axe, and, as he himself said, nothing worse could happen to him if he were denounced. It was obviously the weakness of the position. There is no help for it. But access to him, said Mr. Lorry, if it should go ill before the tribunal, will not save him. I never said it would. Mr. Lorry's eyes gradually sought the fire. His sympathy with his darling and the heavy disappointment of his second arrest gradually weakened them. He was an old man now, overborne with anxiety of late, and his tears fell. "'You are a good man and a true friend,' said Carton, in an altered voice. "'Forgive me if I notice that you are affected. I could not see my father weep and sit by careless, and I could not respect your sorrow more if you were my father.' You are free from that misfortune, however. Though he said the last words with a slip into his usual manner, there was a true feeling and respect, both in his tone and in his touch, that Mr. Lorry, who had never seen the better side of him, was wholly unprepared for. He gave him his hand, and Carton gently pressed it. To return to poor Darnay, said Carton, don't tell her of this interview or this arrangement. It would not enable her to go to see him. She might think it was contrived, in case of the worst, to convey him the means of anticipating the sentence. Mr. Lorry had not thought of that, and he looked quickly at Carton to see if it were in his mind. It seemed to be, for he returned the look and evidently understood it. She might think a thousand things, said Carton, and any of them would only add to her trouble. Don't speak to me of her. As I said to you when I first came, I had better not see her. I can put my hand out to do any little helpful work for her that my hand can find to do without that. You are going to her, I hope? She must be very desolate tonight. I am going now directly. I am glad of that. She has such a strong attachment to you and reliance on you. How does she look? Anxious and unhappy, but very beautiful. 
Ah. Uh. It was a long, grieving sound, like a sigh, almost a sob. It attracted Mr. Lorry's eyes to Carton's face, which was turned to the fire. A light, or a shade, the old gentleman could not have said which, passed from it as swiftly as a change will sweep over the side hill on a wild, bright day, and he lifted his foot to put back one of those little flaming logs which was tumbling forward. He wore the white riding coat and top boots then in vogue, and the light of the fire touching their light surfaces made them look very pale, with his long brown hair all untrimmed hanging loose about him. His indifference to fire was sufficiently remarkable to elicit a word of remonstrance from Mr. Lorry. His boot was still upon the hot embers of the flaming log, when it had broken under the weight of his foot. "'I had forgot it,' he said. Mr. Lorry's eyes were again attracted to his face. Taking note of the wasted air which clouded the naturally handsome features, and having the expression of prisoners' faces fresh in his mind, he was strongly reminded of that expression. "'And your duties here have drawn to an end, sir?' said Carton, turning to him. "'Yes. As I was telling you last night when Lucy came in so unexpectedly, I have at length done all that I can do here. I hope to have left them in perfect safety, and then to have quitted Paris. I have my leave to pass. I was ready to go.' They were both silent. "'Yours is a long life to look back upon, sir,' said Carton, wistfully. "'I am in my seventy-eighth year.' You have been useful all your life, steadily and constantly occupied, trusted, respected, and looked up to. I have been a man of business ever since I have been a man. Indeed, I may say that I was a man of business when I was a boy. See what a place you fill at seventy-eight. How many people will miss you when you leave it empty? A solitary old bachelor, answered Mr. Lorry, shaking his head. There is nobody to weep for me. How can you say that? "'Wouldn't she weep for you? Wouldn't her child?' "'Yes, yes, thank God. I didn't quite mean what I said.' "'It is a thing to thank God for, is it not?' "'Surely, surely.' "'If you could say with truth to your own solitary heart to-night, "'I have secured to myself the love and attachment, "'the gratitude or respect of no human creature. "'I have won myself a tender place in no regard.' I have done nothing good or serviceable to be remembered by. Your seventy-eight years would be seventy-eight heavy curses, would they not? You say truly, Mr. Carton. I think they would be. Sidney turned his eyes again upon the fire, and after a silence of a few moments said, I should like to ask you, does your childhood seem far off? Do the days when you sat at your mother's knee seem days of very long ago? Responding to his softened manner, Mr. Lorry answered, Twenty years back, yes. At this time of my life, no. For as I draw closer and closer to the end, I travel in the circle, nearer and nearer to the beginning. It seems to be one of the kind smoothings and preparings of the way. My heart is touched now by many remembrances that had long fallen asleep, of my pretty young mother and I so old, and by many associations of the days when what we call the world was not so real with me, and my faults were not confirmed in me. "'I understand the feeling!' exclaimed Carton, with a bright flush. "'And are you the better for it?' "'I hope so.' Carton terminated the conversation here, by rising to help him on with his outer coat. "'But you,' said Mr. Lorry, reverting to the theme, "'you are young.' Yes, said Carton, I am not old, but my young way was never the way to age. Enough of me. And of me, I am sure, said Mr. Lorry. Are you going out? I'll walk with you to her gate. You know my vagabond and restless habits. If I should prowl about the streets a long time, don't be uneasy. I shall reappear in the morning. You go to the court tomorrow? Yes, unhappily. I shall be there, but only as one of the crowd. My spy will find a place for me. Take my arm, sir. Mr. Lorry did so, and they went downstairs and out into the streets. A few minutes brought them to Mr. Lorry's destination. Carton left him there, but lingered at a little distance, and turned back to the gate again when it was shut and touched it. He had heard of her going to the prison every day. She came out here, he said, looking about him, turned this way, must have trod on these stones often. Let me follow in her steps. It was ten o'clock at night when he stood before the prison of La Force, where she had stood hundreds of times. 
a little wood sawyer, having closed his shop, was smoking his pipe at the shop door. "'Good night, citizen,' said Sidney Carton, pausing and going by, for the man eyed him inquisitively. "'Good night, citizen.' "'How goes the Republic?' "'You mean the guillotine. Not ill. Sixty-three to-day. We shall mount to a hundred soon. Samson and his men complain sometimes of being exhausted. Ha, ha, ha! He is so droll that Samson, such a barber. Do you often go to see him? Shave? Always. Every day. What a barber. You have seen him at work? Never. Go and see him when he has a good batch. Figure this to yourself, citizen. He shaved the sixty-three to-day in less than two pipes. Less than two pipes! Word of honor! As the grinning little man held out the pipe he was smoking to explain how he timed the executioner, Carton was so sensible of a rising desire to strike the life out of him that he turned away. "'But you are not English,' said the wood sawyer, "'though you wear English dress.' "'Yes,' said Carton, pausing again and answering over his shoulder. "'You speak like an old Frenchman. "'I am an old student here.' "'Aha! A perfect Frenchman! "'Good night, Englishman.' "'Good night, citizen.' "'But go and see that droll dog,' the little man persisted, calling after him, "'and take a pipe with you.' Sidney had not gone far out of sight when he stopped in the middle of the street under a glimmering lamp and wrote with his pencil on a scrap of paper. Then, traversing with the decided step of one who remembered the way well, several dark and dirty streets, much dirtier than usual, for the best public thoroughfares remained uncleansed in those times of terror, he stopped at his chemist's shop which the owner was closing with his own hands. A small, dim, crooked shop, kept in torturous uphill thoroughfare, by a small, dim, crooked man. Giving this citizen two good night, as he confronted him at his counter, he laid the scrap of paper before him. Whew! the chemist whistled softly as he read it. Hi, hi, hi! Sidney Carton took no heed, and the chemist said, For you, citizen? for me. You will be careful to keep them separate, citizen. You know the consequences of mixing them? Perfectly. Certain small packets were made and given to him. He put them one by one in the breast of his inner coat, counted out the money for them, and deliberately left the shop. There is nothing more to do, said he, glancing upwards at the moon, until tomorrow. I can't sleep. It was not a reckless manner, the manner in which he said these words aloud under the fast-sailing clouds, nor was it more expressive of negligence than defiance. It was the settled manner of a tired man, who had wandered and struggled and got lost, but who at length struck into his road and saw its end. Long ago, when he had been famous among his early editors as a youth of great promise, he had followed his father to the grave. His mother had died years before. These solemn words, which had been read at his father's grave, arose in his mind as he went down the dark streets, among the heavy shadows, with the moon and the clouds sailing on high above him. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. In a city dominated by the axe, alone at night, with natural sorrow rising in him for the sixty-three who had been that day put to death, and for tomorrow's victims then awaiting their doom in the prisons, and still of tomorrow's and tomorrow's the chain of association that brought the words home, like a rusty old ship's anchor from the deep, might have been easily found. He did not seek it, but repeated them and went on. With a solemn interest in the lighted windows where the people were going to rest, forgetful through a few calm hours of the horrors surrounding them, in the towers of the churches, where no prayers were said, for the popular revulsion had even travelled that length of self-destruction from years of priestly impostors, plunderers, and profligates, in the distant burial-places reserved as they rode upon the gates for eternal sleep, in the abounding gales and in the streets along which the sixties rolled to a death which had become so common and material, that no sorrowful story of a haunting spirit ever arose among the people out of all the working of the guillotine. With a solemn interest in the whole life and death of the city settling down to its short nightly pause and fury, Sidney Carton, 
crossed the Seine again for the lighter streets. Few coaches were abroad, for riders and coaches were liable to be suspected, and gentility hid its head in red nightcaps, and put on heavy shoes and trudged. But the theatres were all well filled, and the people poured cheerfully out as he passed, and went chatting home. At one of the theatre doors there was a little girl with a mother, looking for a way across the street through the mud. He carried the child over, and before the timid arm was loosed from his neck, asked her for a kiss. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Now that the streets were quiet, and the night wore on, the words were in the echoes of his feet, and were in the night air. Perfectly calm and steady, he sometimes repeated them to himself as he walked, but he always heard them. The night wore out, and, as he stood upon the bridge listening to the water as it splashed the river walls of the island of Paris, where the picturesque confusion of houses and cathedrals shone bright in the light of the moon, the day came coldly, looking like a dead face out of the sky. Then the night, with the moon and the stars, turned pale and died, and for a little while it seemed as if creation were delivered over to death's dominion. But the glorious sun rising seemed to strike those words, that burden of the night, straight and warm to his heart in its long bright rays. And looking along them, with reverently shaded eyes, a bridge of light appeared to span the air between him and the sun, while the river sparkled under it. The strong tide, so swift, so deep and certain, was like a congenial friend in the morning stillness. He walked by the stream, far from the houses, and in the light and warmth of the sun, fell asleep on the bank. When he awoke and was afoot again, he lingered there yet a little longer, watching an eddy that turned and turned, purposeless, until the stream absorbed it and carried it on to the sea. Like me. A trading boat, with a sail of softened color of a dead leaf, then glided into his view, floated by him and died away. As its silent track in the water disappeared, the prayer that had broken up out of his heart for merciful consideration of all his poor blindnesses and arrows ended in the words, I am the resurrection and the life. Mr. Lorry was already out when he got back, and it was easy to surmise where the old man was gone. Sidney Carton drank nothing but a little coffee, ate some bread, and having washed and changed to refresh himself, went out to the place of trial. The court was all astir and a buzz when the black sheep, whom many fell away from in dread, pressed him into an obscure corner among the crowd. Mr. Lorry was there, and Dr. Manette was there. She was there, sitting beside her father. When her husband was brought in, she turned to look upon him, so sustaining, so encouraging, so full of admiring love and pitying tenderness, yet so courageous for his sake, that it called the healthy blood into his face, brightened his glance, and animated his heart. If there had been any eyes to notice the influence of her look on Sidney Carton, it would have been seen to be the same influence exactly. Before that unjust tribunal there was little or no order of procedure, ensuring to any accused person any reasonable hearing. There could have been no such revolution if all laws, forms, and ceremonies had not first been so monstrously abused that the suicidal vengeance of the revolution was to scatter them all to the winds. Every eye was turned to the jury. The same determined patriots and good republicans as yesterday and the day before and tomorrow and the day after. Eager and prominent among them, one man with a craving face, his fingers perpetually hovering about his lips, whose appearance gave great satisfaction to the spectators. A life-thirsting, cannibal-looking, bloody-minded juryman, the Jacques Three of Saint Antoine, the whole jury, as a jury of dogs, epinamel to try the deer. Every eye then turned to the five judges and the public prosecutor. No favorable leaning in that quarter today. A fell, uncompromising, murderous business meaning there. Every eye then sought some other eye in the crowd and gleamed at it approvingly and heads nodded at one another before bending forward with a strained attention. 
Charles Evermond called Darnay. Released yesterday. Reaccused and retaken yesterday. Indictment delivered to him last night. Suspected and denounced enemy of the Republic. Aristocrat. One of a family of tyrants. One of a race proscribed for that they had used their abolished privileges to the infamous oppression of the people. Charles Evermond called Darnay, in right of such proscription, absolutely dead in law. To this effect, in as few or fewer words, the public prosecutor. The President asked, was the accused openly denounced or secretly? Openly, President. By whom? Three voices. Ernest Defarge, wine vendor of Saint Antoine. Good. Therese Defarge, his wife. Good. Alexandre Manette, physician. An uproar took place in the court, and in the midst of it, Dr. Manette was seen, pale and trembling, standing where he had been seated. President, I indignantly protest to you that this is a forgery and a fraud. You know the accused to be the husband of my daughter. My daughter, and those dear to her, are far dearer to me than my life. Who and where is the false conspirator who says that I denounce the husband of my child? Citizen Manette, be tranquil. To fail in submission to the authority of the tribunal would be to put yourself out of law. As to what is dearer to you than life, nothing can be so dear to a good citizen as the Republic." Loud acclamations hailed this rebuke. The President rang his bell, and with warmth resumed. If the Republic should demand of you the sacrifice of your child herself, you would have no duty but to sacrifice her. Listen to what is to follow. In the meantime, be silent. Frantic acclamations were again raised. Dr. Manette sat down, with his eyes looking around and his lips trembling. His daughter drew closer to him. The craving man on the jury rubbed his hands together and restored the usual hand to his mouth. Defarge was produced, when the court was quiet enough to admit of his being heard, and rapidly expounded the story of the imprisonment, and of his having been a mere boy in the doctor's service, and of the release, and of the state of the prisoner when released and delivered to him. This short examination followed, for the court was quick with its work. You did good service at the taking of the Bastille, citizen? I believe so. Here an excited woman screeched from the crowd. You were one of the best patriots there. Why not say so? You were a cannoneer that day there, and you were among the first to enter the accursed fortress when it fell. Patriots, I speak the truth. It was the vengeance who, amidst the warm commendations of the audience, thus assisted the proceedings. The president rang his bell, but... The vengeance, warming with encouragement, shrieked, I defy that bell, wherein she was likewise much commended. Inform the tribunal of what you did that day within the Bastille, citizen. I knew, said Defarge, looking down at his wife, who stood at the bottom of the steps on which he was raised, looking steadily up at him. I knew that this prisoner, of whom I speak, had been confined in a cell known as 105 North Tower. I knew it from himself. He knew himself by no other name than 105 North Tower, when he made shoes under my care. And I served my gun that day, I resolve, when the place shall fall, to examine that cell. It falls. I mount to the cell with a fellow citizen who is one of the jury directed by a gaoler. I examined it very closely. In a hole in the chimney, where a stone had been worked out and replaced, I find a written paper. This is that written paper. I have made it my business to examine some specimens of the writing of Dr. Manette. This is the writing of Dr. Manette. I confide this paper in the writing of Dr. Manette to the hands of the President. Let it be read. In a dead silence and stillness, the prisoner under trial looking lovingly at his wife, his wife only looking from him to look with solicitude at her father, Dr. Manette keeping his eyes fixed on the reader, Madame Defarge never taking hers from the prisoner, Defarge never taking his from his feasting wife, and all the other eyes were intent upon the doctor, who saw none of them. The paper was read as follows. End of chapter 9, The Game Made, read by Tora in Campbellsburg, Kentucky, November 2006.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Sirwa. Michael.Sirwa, S I R O I S, dot com. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three, Chapter Ten. The Substance of the Shadow. I, Alexandre Manette, unfortunate physician, native of Beauvais, and afterwards resident in Paris, write this melancholy paper in my doleful cell in the Bastille, during the last month of the year, 1767. I write it at stolen intervals, under every difficulty. I design to secret it in the wall of the chimney, where I have slowly and laboriously made a place of concealment for it. Some pitying hand may find it there when I and my sorrows are dust. These words are formed by the rusty iron point with which I write, with difficulty, in scrapings of soot and charcoal from the chimney, mixed with blood, in the last month of the tenth year of my captivity. Hope has quite departed from my breast. I know from terrible warnings I have noted in myself that my reason will not long remain unimpaired but I solemnly declare that I am at this time in the possession of my right mind, that is, my memory is exact and circumstantial, and that I write the truth, as I shall answer for these my last recorded words, whether they be ever read by men or not, at the eternal judgment seat. One cloudy moonlight night, in the third week of December, I think the twenty-second of the month, in the year 1757, I was walking on a retired part of the quay, by the Seine, for the refreshment of the frosty air, at an hour's distance from my place of residence, in the street of the School of Medicine, when a carriage came along behind me, driven very fast. As I stood aside to let that carriage pass, apprehensive that it might otherwise run me down, a head was put out at the window, and a voice called to the driver to stop. The carriage stopped as soon as the driver could rein in his horses, and the same voice called to me by my name. I answered. The carriage was then so far in advance of me that the two gentlemen had time to open the door and alight before I came up with it. I observed that they were both wrapped in cloaks, and appeared to conceal themselves. As they stood side by side near the carriage door, I also observed that they both looked of about my own age, or rather younger, and that they were greatly alike in stature, manner, voice, and, as far as I could see, face, too. "'You are Dr. Manette?' said one. "'I am.' "'Dr. Manette, formerly of Beauvais,' said the other, "'the young physician, originally an expert surgeon, who, within the last year or two, has made a rising reputation in Paris?' "'Gentlemen,' I returned, "'I am that Dr. Manette of whom you speak so graciously.' "'We have been to your residence,' said the first, "'and not being so fortunate as to find you there, "'and being informed that you were probably walking in this direction, "'we followed, in the hope of overtaking you. "'Will you please to enter the carriage?' "'The manner of both was imperious, "'and they both moved as these words were spoken, "'so as to place me between themselves and the carriage door. "'They were armed. I was not. "'Gentlemen,' said I, "'Pardon me, but I, I usually inquire who does me the honour to seek my assistance, and, "'and what is the nature to the case to which I am summoned?' "'The reply to this was made by him who had spoken second. "'Doctor, your clients are people of condition. "'As to the nature of the case, our confidence in your skill assures us "'that you will ascertain it for yourself better than we can describe it. "'Enough. Will you please to enter the carriage?' I could do nothing but comply, and I entered it in silence. They both entered after me, the last springing in after putting up the steps. The carriage turned about, and drove on at its former speed. I repeat this conversation exactly as it occurred. I have no doubt that it is word for word the same. I describe everything exactly as it took place, constraining my mind not to wander from the task. Where I make the broken marks that follow here, I leave off for the time, and put my paper in its hiding-place. 
The carriage left the streets behind, passed the north barrier, and emerged upon the country road. At two-thirds of a league from the barrier, I did not estimate the distance at that time, but afterwards when I traversed it, it struck out of the main avenue, and presently stopped at a solitary house. We all three alighted, and walked, by a damp soft footpath in a garden, where a neglected fountain had overflowed, to the door of the house. It was not opened immediately, in answer to the ringing of the bell, and one of my two conductors struck the man who opened it with his heavy riding-glove across the face. There was nothing in this action to attract my particular attention, for I had seen common people struck more commonly than dogs, but the other of the two, being angry likewise, struck the man in like an manner with his arm. The look and bearing of the brothers were then so exactly alike, I then first perceived them to be twin brothers. From the time of our alighting at the outer gate, which we found locked, and which one of the brothers had opened to admit us, and had re-locked, I had heard cries proceeding from an upper chamber. I was conducted to this chamber straight, the cries growing louder as we ascended the stairs, and I found a patient in a high fever of the brain lying on a bed. The patient was a woman of great beauty, and young, assuredly not much past twenty. Her hair was torn and ragged, and her arms were bound to her sides with sashes and handkerchiefs. I noticed that these bonds were all portions of a gentleman's dress. On one of them, which was a fringed scarf for a dress of ceremony, I saw the armorial bearings of a noble, and the letter E. I saw this within the first minute of my contemplation of the patient, for in her restless striving she had turned over on her face on the edge of the bed, and had drawn the end of her scarf into her mouth, and was in danger of suffocation. My first act was to put out my hand to relieve her breathing, and in moving the scarf aside, the embroidery in the corner caught my sight. I turned her gently over, placed my hands upon her breast to calm her and keep her down, and looked into her face. Her eyes were dilated and wild, and she constantly uttered piercing shrieks, and repeated the words, "'My husband, my father, and my brother,' and then counted up to twelve, and said, "'Hush!' For an instant, and no more, she would pause to listen, and then the piercing shrieks would begin again, and she would repeat the cry, "'My husband, my father, and my brother,' and would count up to twelve, and say, "'Hush!' There was no variation in the order or the manner, there was no cessation, but the regular moment's pause in the utterance of these sounds. "'How long,' I asked, "'has this lasted?' to distinguish the brothers, I will call them the elder and the younger. By the elder I mean him who exercised the most authority. It was the elder who replied, Since about this hour last night. She has a husband, a father, and a brother? A brother. I do not address her brother? He answered with great contempt. No. She has some recent association with the number twelve? The younger brother impatiently rejoined, with twelve o'clock? See, gentlemen, said I, still keeping my hands upon her breast, how useless I am, as you have brought me. If I had known what I was coming to see, I could have come provided. As it is, time must be lost. There are no medicines to be obtained in this lonely place. The elder brother looked to the younger, who said haughtily, There is a case of medicines here, and brought it from a closet, and put it on a table. I opened some of the bottles, smelt them, and put the stoppers to my lips. If I had wanted to use anything save narcotic medicines that were poisons in themselves, I would not have administered any of those. "'Do you doubt them?' asked the younger brother. "'You see, monsieur, I am going to use them,' I replied, and said no more. I made the patient swallow, with great difficulty, and after many efforts the dose that I desired to give— as I intended to repeat it after a while, and as it was necessary to watch its influence, I then sat down by the side of the bed. There was a timid and suppressed woman in attendance, wife of the man downstairs, who had retreated into a corner. The house was damp and decayed, indifferently furnished, evidently recently occupied and temporarily used. Some thick old hangings had been nailed up before the windows to deaden the sound of the shrieks. They continued to be uttered in their regular succession, with the cry, My husband, my father, and my brother, the counting up to twelve, and hush. 
The frenzy was so violent that I had not unfastened the bandages restraining the arms, but I had looked to them to see that they were not painful. The only spark of encouragement in the case was that my hand upon the sufferer's breast had this much soothing influence, that for minutes at a time it tranquilized the figure. It had no effect upon the cries. No pendulum could be more regular. For the reason that my hand had this effect, I assume, I had sat by the side of the bed for half an hour with the two brothers looking on, before the elder said, "'There is another patient.' I was startled, and asked, "'Is it a pressing case?' "'You had better see,' he carelessly answered, and took up a light. The other patient lay in a back room across a second staircase, which was a species of loft over a stable. There was a low plastered ceiling to a part of it. The rest was open, to the ridge of the tiled roof, and there were beams across. Hay and straw were stored in the portion of the place, faggots for firing, and a heap of apples in sand. I had to pass through that part to get at the other. My memory is circumstantial and unshaken. I try it with these details, and I see them all, in this my cell in the Bastille, near the close of the tenth year of my captivity, as I saw them all that night. On some hay on the ground, with a cushion thrown under his head, lay a handsome peasant boy, a boy of not more than seventeen at the most. He lay on his back, with his teeth set, his right hand clenched on his breast, and his glaring eyes looking straight upward. I could not see where his wound was, as I kneeled on one knee over him, but I could see that he was dying of a wound from a sharp point. "'I am a doctor, my poor fellow,' said I. "'Let me examine it.' "'I do not want it examined,' he answered. "'Let it be.' It was under his hand, and I soothed him to let me move his hand away. The wound was a sword-thrust, received from twenty to twenty-four hours before, but no skill could have saved him if it had been looked to without delay. He was then dying fast. As I turned my eyes to the elder brother, I saw him looking down at this handsome boy whose life was ebbing out, as if he were a wounded bird, or hare, or rabbit, not at all as if he were a fellow creature. "'How has this been done, monsieur?' said I. A crazed young common dog, a serf, forced my brother to draw upon him, and has fallen by my brother's sword, like a gentleman. There was no touch of pity, sorrow, or kindred humanity in this answer. The speaker seemed to acknowledge that it was inconvenient to have that different order of creature dying there, and that it would have been better if he had died in the usual obscure routine of his vermin kind. He was quite incapable of any compassionate feeling about the boy, or about his fate. The boy's eyes had slowly moved to him as he had spoken, and they now slowly moved to me. "'Doctor, they are very proud, these nobles, but we common dogs are proud, too, sometimes. They plunder us, outrage us, beat us, kill us, but we have a little pride left sometimes. She—have uh, you seen her, doctor?' The shrieks and cries were audible there, though subdued by, by the distance. He referred to them as if she were lying in our presence. I said, I have seen her. She is my sister, doctor. They have had their shameful rights, these nobles, in the modesty and virtue of our sisters, many years. But we have had good girls among us, I know it, and have heard my father say so. She was a good girl. She was betrothed to a good young man, too, a tenant of his. We were all tenants of his, that man's who stands there. The other is his brother, the worst of a bad race. It was with the greatest difficulty that the boy gathered bodily force to speak, but his spirit spoke with a dreadful emphasis. We were so robbed by that man who stands there, as all we common dogs are by those superior beings, taxed by him without mercy, obliged to work for him without pay, obliged to grind our corn at his mill, obliged to feed scores of his tame birds on our wretched crops, and forbidden for our lives to keep a single tame bird of our own, pillaged and plundered to that degree that when we chanced to have a bit of meat we ate it in fear, with the door barred and the shutters closed so his people should not see it and take it from us. 
I say we were so robbed, and hunted, and were made so poor, that our father told us it was a dreadful thing to bring a child into the world, and that what we should pray most for was that our women might be barren, and our miserable race die out. I had never before seen the sense of being oppressed, bursting forth like a fire. I had supposed that it must be latent in the people somewhere, but I had never seen it break out until I saw it in the dying boy. Nevertheless, doctor, my sister married. He was ailing at that time, poor fellow, and she married her lover that she might tend and comfort him in our cottage, our dog-hut, as that man would call it. She had not been married many weeks, when that man's brother saw her, and admired her, and asked that man to lend her to him, for what are husbands among us? He was willing enough, but my sister was good and virtuous, and hated his brother with a hatred as strong as mine. What did the two then to persuade her husband to use his influence with her, to make her willing? The boy's eyes, which had been fixed on mine, slowly turned to the looker-on and I saw in the two faces that all he said was true, the two opposing kinds of pride confronting one another. I can see, even in this Bastille, the gentlemen's all negligent and indifference, the peasants' all trodden-down sentiment and passionate revenge. You know, doctor, that it is among the rights of these nobles to harness us common dogs to carts and drive us. They so harnessed him and drove him, you know that it is among their rights to keep us in their grounds all night, quieting the frogs, in order that their noble sleep may not be disturbed. They kept him out in the unwholesome mists at night, and ordered him back into his harness in the day, but he was not persuaded. No, taken out of harness one day at noon to feed, if he could find food he sobbed twelve times, once for every stroke of the bell, and died on her bosom. Nothing human could have held life in the boy but his determination to tell all his wrong. He forced back the gathering shadows of death, as he forced his clenched right hand to remain clenched and to cover his wound. Then, with that man's permission, and even with his aid, his brother took her away. In spite of what I know, she must have told his brother, and what that is will not be long unknown to you, doctor, if it is now. His brother took her away for his pleasure and diversion for a little while. I saw her pass me on the road. When I took the tidings home, our father's heart burst. He never spoke one of the words that filled it. I took my young sister, for I have another, to a place beyond the reach of this man, and where at least she will never be his vassal. Then I tracked the brother here, and last night climbed in, a common dog, but sword in hand. Where is the loft window? It was somewhere here. The room was darkening to his sight. The world was narrowing around him. I glanced about me and saw that the hay and straw were trampled over the floor as if there had been a struggle. She heard me and ran in. I told her not to come near us until he was dead. He came in and first tossed me some pieces of money, then struck at me with a whip. But I, though a common dog, so struck at him as to make him draw. Let him break into as many pieces as he will. The sword that he stained with my common blood, he drew to defend himself, thrust at me with all his skill for his life. My glance had fallen, but a few moments before, on the fragments of a broken sword lying among the hay. The weapon was a gentleman's. In another place lay an old sword that seemed to have been a soldier's. Now lift me up, doctor. Lift me up. Where is he? He is not here, I said, supporting the boy, and thinking that he referred to the brother. He, proud as these nobles are, he is afraid to see me. Where is the man who was here? Turn my face to him. I did so, raising the boy's head against my knee, but invested for the moment with extraordinary power. He raised himself completely obliging me to rise, too, or I could not have still supported him. "'Marquis,' said the boy, turned to him with his eyes open wide, and with his right hand raised, "'in the days when all these things are to be answered for, I summon you and yours to the last of your bad race to answer for them. 
I mark this cross of blood upon you as a sign that I do it. In the days when all these things are to be answered for, I summon your brother, the worst of the bad race, to answer for them separately. I mark this cross of blood upon him as a sign that I do it. Twice he put his hand to the wound in his breast, and with his forefinger drew a cross in the air. He stood for an instant with the finger yet raised, and as it dropped, he dropped with it, and I laid him down dead. When I returned to the bedside of that young woman, I found her raving in precisely the same order of continuity. I knew that this might last for many hours, and that it would probably end in the silence of the grave. I repeated the medicines I had given her, and I sat at the side of the bed until the night was far advanced. She never abated the piercing quality of her shrieks, and never stumbled in the distinctness or the order of her words. They were always, my husband, my father, and my brother, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Hush! This lasted twenty-six hours from the time when I first saw her. I had come and gone twice, and was again sitting by her when she began to falter. I did what little could be done to assist that opportunity, and by and by she sank into a lethargy and lay like the dead. It was as if the wind and rain had lulled at last after a long and fearful storm. I released her arms, and called the woman to assist me to compose her figure in the dress she had torn. It was then that I knew her condition to be that of one in whom the first expectations of being a mother have arisen, and it was then that I lost the little hope I had had of her. "'Is she dead?' asked the Marquis, whom I will still describe as the elder brother, coming booted into the room from his horse. "'Not dead,' said I, "'but like to die.' "'What strength is there in these common bodies?' he said, looking down at her with some curiosity. "'There is prodigious strength,' I answered him, "'in sorrow and despair.' He first laughed at my words, and then frowned at them. He moved a chair with his foot near to mine, ordered the woman away, and said in a subdued voice, "'Doctor, finding my brother in this difficulty with these hinds, I recommended that your aid should be invited.' Your reputation is high, and as a young man with your fortune to make, you are probably mindful of your interest. The things that you see here are things to be seen, and not spoken of. I listened to the patient's breathing, and avoided answering. Do you honor me with your attention, doctor? Monsieur, said I, in my profession the communications of patients are always received in confidence. I was guarded in my answer, for I was troubled in my mind with what I had heard and seen. Her breathing was so difficult to trace that I carefully tried the pulse and the heart. There was life, and no more. Looking round as I resumed my seat, I found both the brothers intent upon me. I write with so much difficulty. The cold is so severe. I am so fearful of being detected and consigned to an underground cell and total darkness that I must abridge this narrative. There is no confusion or failure in my memory. It can recall and could detail every word that was ever spoken between me and those brothers. She lingered for a week. Towards the last I could understand some few syllables that she said to me by placing my ear close to her lips. She asked me where she was, and I told her who I was, and I, and I told her. It was in vain that I asked her for her family name. She faintly shook her head upon the pillow, and kept her secret as the boy had done. I had no opportunity of asking her any question, until I had told the brothers she was sinking fast, and could not live another day. Until then, though no one was ever presented to her consciousness save the woman and myself, one or other of them had always jealously sat behind the curtain at the head of the bed when I was there. But when it came to that they seemed careless what communication I might hold with her, as if the thought passed through my mind, I were dying too. I always observed that their pride bitterly resented the younger brothers, as I call him, having crossed swords with a peasant, and that peasant a boy. 
the only consideration that appeared to affect the mind of either of them was the consideration that this was highly degrading to the family, and was ridiculous. As often as I caught the younger brother's eyes, their expression reminded me that he disliked me deeply, for knowing what I knew from the boy. He was smoother and more polite to me than the elder, but I saw this. I also saw that I was an encumbrance in the mind of the elder, too. My patient died, two hours before midnight, at a time by my watch answering almost to the minute when I had first seen her. I was alone with her when her forlorn young head drooped gently on one side, and all her earthly wrongs and sorrows ended. The brothers were waiting in a room downstairs, impatient to ride away. I had heard them alone at the bedside, striking their boots with their riding whips and loitering up and down. "'At last she is dead,' said the elder when I went in. "'She is dead,' said I. "'I congratulate you, my brother,' were his words as he turned round. He had before offered me money, which I had postponed taking. He now gave me a rouleau of gold. I took it from his hand, but laid it on the table. I had considered the question, and had resolved to accept nothing. "'Pray excuse me,' said I. Uh, "'Under the circumstances, no.' They exchanged looks, but bent their heads to me as I bent mine to them, and we parted without another word on either side. "'I, I am weary, 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 worn down by misery. I cannot read what I have written with this gaunt hand. Early in the morning the rouleau of gold was left at my door in a little box, with my name on the outside.' From the first I had anxiously considered what I ought to do. I decided that day to write privately to the minister, stating the nature of the two cases to which I had been summoned, and the place to which I had gone, in effect stating all the circumstances. I knew what court influence was, and what the immunities of the nobles were, and I expected that the matter would never be heard of, but I wished to relieve my own mind. I had kept the matter a profound secret, even from my wife, and this too I resolved to state in my letter. I had no apprehension whatever of my real danger, but I was conscious that there might be danger to others, if others were compromised by possessing the knowledge that I possessed. I was much engaged that day, and could not complete my letter that night. I rose long before my usual time next morning to finish it. It, it was the last day of the year. The letter was lying before me, just completed, when I was told that a lady waited who wished to see me. I am growing more and more unequal to the task I have set myself. It is so cold, so dark, my senses are so benumbed, and the gloom upon me is so dreadful. The lady was young, engaging and handsome, but not marked for long life. She was in great agitation. She presented herself to me as the wife of the Marquis saint Avramont. I connected the title by which the boy had addressed the elder brother, with the initial letter embroidered on the scarf, and had no difficulty in arriving at the conclusion that I had seen that nobleman very lately. My memory is still accurate, but I cannot write the words of our conversation. I suspect that I am watched more closely than I was, and I know not at what times I may be watched. She had in part suspected, and in part discovered, the main facts of the cruel story, of her husband's share in it, and my being resorted to. She did not know that the girl was dead. Her hope had been, she said, in great distress, to show her, in secret, a woman's sympathy. Her hope had been to avert the wrath of heaven from a house that had long been hateful to the suffering many. She had reasons for believing that there was a young sister living, and her greatest desire was to help that sister. I could tell her nothing but that there was such a sister. Beyond that I knew nothing. Her inducement to come to me, relying on my confidence, had been the hope that I could tell her the name and place of abode, whereas to this wretched hour I am ignorant of both. These scraps of paper fail me. One was taken from me with a warning yesterday. I must finish my record to-day. She was a good, compassionate lady, and not happy in her marriage. 
How could she be? The brother distrusted and disliked her, and his influence was all opposed to her. She stood in dread of him, and in dread of her husband, too. When I handed her down to the door, there was a child, a pretty boy from two to three years old, in her carriage. "'For his sake, doctor,' she said, pointing to him in tears, "'I would do all I can to make what poor amends I can. "'He will never prosper in his inheritance otherwise. "'I have a presentiment that if no other innocent atonement is made for this, "'it will one day be required of him. "'What I have left to call my own, "'it is little beyond the worth of a few jewels, "'I will make it the first charge of his life to bestow, "'with the compassion and lamenting of his dead mother, "'on this injured family, if the sister can be discovered.' She kissed the boy, and said, caressing him, "'It is for thine own dear sake. Thou wilt be faithful, little Charles?' The child answered her bravely, "'Yes.' I kissed her hand, and she took him in her arms, and went away, caressing him. I never saw her more. As she had mentioned her husband's name, in the faith that I knew it, I added no mention of it to my letter. I sealed my letter, and, not trusting it out of my own hands, delivered it myself that day. That night, the last night of the year, towards nine o'clock a man in black dress rang at my gate, demanded to see me, and softly followed my servant, Ernest Defarge, a youth, upstairs. When my servant came into the room where I sat with my wife, oh, my wife! beloved of my heart, my fair young English wife. We saw the man, who was supposed to be at the gate, standing silent behind him. "'An urgent case in the Rue saint Honore, he said. "'It would not detain me. He had a coach in waiting. "'It brought me here. It brought me to my grave. "'When I was clear of the house, a black muffler was drawn tightly over my mouth from behind.' and my arms were pinioned. The two brothers crossed the road from a dark corner, and identified me with a single gesture. The Marquis took from his pocket the letter I had written, showed it to me, burnt it in the light of a lantern that was held, and extinguished the ashes with his foot. Not a word was spoken. I was brought here, I was brought to my living grave. If it had pleased God to put it in the hard heart of either of the brothers, in all these frightful years, to grant me any tidings of my dearest wife, so much as to let me know by a word, whether alive or dead, I might have thought that he had not quite abandoned them. But now I believe that the mark of the Red Cross is fatal to them, and that they have no part in his mercies, and them and their descendants to the last of their race, I, Alexandre Manette, unhappy prisoner, to this last night of the year, 1767, in my unbearable agony, denounce to the times when all these things shall be answered for. I denounce them to heaven and to earth. A terrible sound arose when the reading of this document was done, a sound of craving and eagerness that had nothing articulate in it but blood. The narrative called up the most revengeful passions of the time, and there was not a head in the nation but must have dropped before it. Little need, in the presence of that tribunal and that auditory, to show how the Defarges had not made the paper public, with the other captured Bastille memorials born in procession, and had kept it biding their time. Little need to show this detested family name had long been anathematized by Saint Antoine, and was wrought into the fatal register. The man never trod ground whose virtues and services would have sustained him in that place that day against such denunciation. And all the worse for the doomed man, that the denouncer was a well-known citizen, his own attached friend, the father of his wife. One of the frenzied aspirations of the populace was, for imitations of the questionable public virtues of antiquity, and for sacrifices and self-immolations on the people's altar. Therefore, when the President said, else had his own head quivered on his shoulders, 
that the good physician of the Republic would deserve better still of the Republic by rooting out an obnoxious family of aristocrats, and would doubtless feel a sacred glow and joy in making his daughter a widow, and her child an orphan, there was wild excitement, patriotic fervor, not a touch of human sympathy. "'Much influence around him has that doctor,' murmured Madame Defarge, smiling to the vengeance. "'Save him now, my doctor, save him.' At every juryman's vote there was a roar, another and another, roar and roar. Unanimously voted, at heart and by dissent an aristocrat, an enemy of the Republic, a notorious oppressor of the people. Back to the conciergerie, and death within four and twenty hours. End of Book Three, Chapter Ten. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Clark, Winnipeg, Canada. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three, Chapter Eleven Dusk. The wretched wife of the innocent man thus doomed to die fell under the sentence as if she had been mortally stricken. But she uttered no sound, and so strong was the voice within her, representing that it was she of all the world who must uphold him in his misery, and not augment it, that it quickly raised her, even from that shock. The judges, having to take part in a public demonstration out of doors, the tribunal adjourned. The quick noise and movement of the court's emptying itself by many passengers had not ceased when Lucy stood stretching out her arms towards her husband with nothing in her face but love and consolation. If I might touch him, if I might embrace him once, oh, good citizens, if you would have so much compassion for us. There was but a jailer left, along with two of the four men who had taken him last night and Barsad. The people had all poured out to the show in the streets. Barsad proposed to the rest. Let her embrace him, then. It is but a moment. It was silently acquiesced in, and they passed her over the seats in the hall to a raised place, where he, by leaning over the dock, could fold her in his arms. Farewell, dear darling of my soul, my parting blessing on my love. We shall meet again, where the weary are at rest." They were her husband's words, as he held her to his bosom. I can bear it, dear Charles. I am supported from above. Don't suffer for me. A parting blessing for our child. I send it to her by you. I kiss her by you. I say farewell to her by you. My husband, no, a moment. He was tearing himself apart from her. We shall not be long separated. I feel that this will break my heart by and by. But I will do my duty while I can. And when I leave her... God will raise up friends for her, as he did for me. Her father had followed her, and would have fallen on his knees to both of them, but that Darnay put out a hand and seized him, crying, No, no, what have you done, what have you done, that you should kneel to us? We know now what a struggle you have made of old. We know now what you underwent when you suspected my descent, and when you knew it. We know now the natural antipathy you strove against, and conquered for her dear sake. We thank you with all our hearts, and all our love and duty. Heaven be with you. Her father's only answer was to draw his hands through his white hair, and wring them with a shriek of anguish. It could not be otherwise, said the prisoner. All things have worked together as they have fallen out. It was the always vain endeavour to discharge my poor mother's trust that first brought my fatal presence near you. Good could never come of such evil, and a happier end was not in nature to so unhappy a beginning. Be comforted, and forgive me. Heaven bless you. As he was drawn away, his wife released him, and stood looking after him with her hands touching one another in the attitude of prayer and with a radiant look upon her face, in which there was even a comforting smile. As he went out at the prisoner's door, she turned, laid her head lovingly on her father's breast, tried to speak to him, and fell at his feet. 
Then issuing from the obscure corner from which he had never moved, Sidney Carton came and took her up. Only her father and Mr. Lorry were with her. His arm trembled as it raised her and supported her head. Yet there was an air about him that was not all of pity, that had a flush of pride in it. Shall I take her to a coach? I shall never feel her weight. He carried her lightly to the door and laid her tenderly down in a coach. Her father and their old friend got into it, and he took his seat beside the driver. When they arrived at the gateway where he had paused in the dark not many hours before, to picture to himself on which of the rough stones of the street her feet had trodden, he lifted her again and carried her up the staircase to their rooms. There he laid her down on a couch where her child and Miss Pross wept over her. Don't recall her to herself, he said softly to the latter. She is better so. Don't revive her to consciousness while she only faints. Oh, Carton, Carton, dear Carton, cried little Lucy, springing up and throwing her arms passionately round him in a burst of grief. Now that you have come, I think you will do something to help Mamma, something to save Papa. Oh, look at her, dear Carton. Can you, of all people who love her, bear to see her so? He bent over the child and laid her blooming cheek against his face. He put her gently from him and looked at her unconscious mother. Before I go, he said, and paused, I may kiss her. It was remembered afterwards that when he bent down and touched her face with his lips, he murmured some words. The child, who was nearest to him, told them afterwards, and told her grandchildren when she was a handsome old lady, that she heard him say, A life you love. When he had gone out into the next room, he turned suddenly on Mr. Lorry and her father, who were following, and said to the latter, You had great influence but yesterday, Dr. Manette. Let it at least be tried. These judges and all the men in power are very friendly to you, and very recognizant of your services, are they not? Nothing connected with Charles was concealed from me. I had the strongest assurances that I should save him, and I did. He returned the answer in great trouble and very slowly. Try them again. The hours between this and tomorrow afternoon are few and short, but try. I intend to try. I will not rest a moment. That's well. I have known such energy as yours do great things before now. Though never, he added with a smile and a sigh together, such great things as this. But try. Of little worth as life is when we misuse it, it is worth that effort. It would cost nothing to lay down, if it were not. I will go, said Dr. Manette, to the prosecutor and the president straight, and I will go to others whom it is better not to name. I will write, too, and, but stay. There is a celebration in the streets, and no one will be accessible until dark. That's true. Well, it is a forlorn hope at best, and not much more the forlorner for being delayed till dark. I should like to know how you speed, though, mind. I expect nothing. When are you likely to have seen these dread powers, Dr. Manette? Immediately after dark, I should hope. Within an hour or two from this. It will be dark soon after four. Let us stretch the hour or two. If I go to Mr. Lorry's at nine, shall I hear what you have done, either from our friend or from yourself? Yes. May you prosper. Mr. Lorry followed Sidney to the outer door, and, touching him on the shoulder as he was going away, caused him to turn. I have no hope, said Mr. Lorry, in a low and sorrowful whisper, nor have I. If any one of these men, or all of these men, were disposed to spare him, which is a large supposition, for what is his life or any man's to them, I doubt if they durst spare him after the demonstration in the court." and so do I. I heard the fall of the axe in that sound. Mr. Lorry leaned his arm upon the doorpost, and bowed his face upon it. Don't despond, said Carton very gently. Don't grieve. I encouraged Dr. Manette in this idea, because I felt that it might one day be consolatory to her. Otherwise she might think his life was want only thrown away or wasted, and that might trouble her. Yes, yes, returned Mr. Lorry, drying his eyes. You are right. 
But he will perish. There is no real hope. Yes, he will perish. There is no real hope, echoed Carton, and walked with a settled step downstairs. End of Book Three Chapter Eleven This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Clark, Winnipeg, Canada. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three, Chapter Twelve, Darkness. Sidney Carton paused in the street, not quite decided where to go. At Telson's banking house, at nine, he said, with a musing face. Shall I do well in the meantime to show myself? I think so. It is best that these people should know that there is such a man as I here. It is a sound precaution, and may be a necessary preparation. But care, care, care. Let me think it out. Checking his steps, which had begun to tend towards an object, he took a turn or two in the already darkening street, and traced the thought in his mind to its possible consequences. His first impression was confirmed. It is best, he said, finally resolved, that these people should know that there is such a man as I here. And he turned his face towards St. Antoine. Defarge had described himself that day as the keeper of a wine shop in the St. Antoine suburb. It was not difficult for one who knew the city well to find his house without asking any question. Having ascertained its situation, Carlton came out of those closer streets again and dined at a place of refreshment, and fell sound asleep after dinner. For the first time in many years he had no strong drink. Since last night he had taken nothing but a little light thin wine. And last night he dropped the brandy slowly down on Mr. Lorry's hearth like a man who had done with it. It was as late as seven o'clock when he awoke refreshed, and went out into the streets again. As he passed along towards St. Antoine, he stopped at a shop window where there was a mirror, and slightly altered the disordered arrangement of his loose cravat and his coat collar and his wild hair. This done, he went on direct to Defarge's and went in. There happened to be no customer in the shop but Jacques Three, of the restless fingers and the croaking voice. This man, whom he had seen upon the jury, stood drinking at the little counter, in conversation with the Defarge's, man and wife. The vengeance assisted in the conversation like a regular member of the establishment. As Carton walked in, took his seat, and asked, in very indifferent French, for a small measure of wine, Madame Defarge cast a careless glance at him, and then a keener, and then a keener, and then advanced to him herself, and asked him what it was he had ordered. He repeated what he had already said. English, asked Madame Defarge, inquisitively raising her dark eyebrows. After looking at her as if the sound of even a single French word were slow to express itself to him, he answered in his former strong foreign accent, Yes, Madame, yes, I am English. Madame Defarge returned to her counter to get the wine, and, as he took up a Jacobin journal and feigned to pour over it, puzzling out its meaning, he heard her say, I swear to you, like Evremond. Defarge brought him the wine and gave him good evening. How? Good evening. Oh, good evening, citizen, filling his glass. Ah, and good wine. I drink to the Republic. Defarge went back to the counter and said, Certainly a little like. Madame sternly retorted, I tell you, a good deal like. Jacques Three pacifically remarked, He is so much in your mind, you see, Madame. The amiable vengeance added with a laugh, Yes, my faith, and you are looking forward with so much pleasure to seeing him once more tomorrow. Carton followed the lines and words of his paper with a slow forefinger and with a studious and absorbed face. They were all leaning their arms on the counter close together, speaking low. After a silence of a few moments, during which they all looked towards him without disturbing his outward attention from the Jacobin editor, they resumed their conversation. Why stop? There is great force in that. Why stop? Well, well, reasoned Defarge, but one must stop somewhere. 
After all, the question is still where. At extermination, said Madame. Magnificent, croaked Jacques III. The vengeance also highly approved. Extermination is good doctrine, my wife, said Defarge, rather troubled. In general, I say nothing against it. But this doctor has suffered much. You have seen him today. You have observed his face when the paper was read. I have observed his face, repeated Madame, contemptuously and angrily. Yes, I have observed his face. I have observed his face to be not the face of a true friend of the Republic. Let him take care of his face. And you have observed, my wife, said Defarge, in a deprecatory manner, the anguish of his daughter, which must be a dreadful anguish to him. I have observed his daughter, repeated Madame. Yes, I have observed his daughter more times than one. I have observed her today, and I have observed her other days. I have observed her in the court, and I have observed her in the street by the prison. Let me but lift my finger. She seemed to raise it. The listener's eyes were always on his paper. And to let it fall with a rattle on the ledge before her, as if the axe had dropped. The citizeness is superb, croaked the juryman. She is an angel, said the vengeance, and embraced her. As to thee, pursued Madame implacably, addressing her husband, if it depended on thee, which happily it does not, thou wouldst rescue this man even now. No, protested Defarge, not if to lift this glass would do it. But I would leave the matter there. I say stop there. "'See you then, Jacques,' said Madame Defarge wrathfully, "'and see you too, my little vengeance, see you both. "'Listen, for other crimes as tyrants and oppressors "'I have this race a long time on my register, "'doomed to destruction and extermination. "'Ask my husband, is that so?' "'It is so,' assented Defarge, without being asked. "'In the beginning of the great days, when the Bastille falls, "'he finds this paper of to-day, and he brings it home, and in the middle of the night, when this place is clear and shut, we read it. Here, on this spot, by the light of this lamp, ask him, is that so? It is so, assented Defarge. That night, I tell him, when the paper is read through, and the lamp is burnt out, and the day is gleaming in above those shutters and between those iron bars, that I have now a secret to communicate. Ask him, is that so? It is so, assented Defarge again. I communicate to him that secret. I smite this bosom with these two hands as I smite it now, and I tell him, Defarge, I was brought up among the fishermen of the seashore, and that peasant family so injured by those two Evremond brothers, as that Bastille paper describes, is my family. Defarge, that sister of the mortally wounded boy upon the ground, was my sister. That husband was my sister's husband. That unborn child was their child. That brother was my brother. That father was my father. Those are my dead. And that summons to answer for those things descends to me. Ask him, is that so? It is so, assented Defarge once more. Then tell wind and fire where to stop returned madame, but don't tell me. Both her hearers derived a horrible enjoyment from the deadly nature of her wrath. The listener could feel how white she was without seeing her, and both highly commended it. Defarge, a weak minority, interposed a few words for the memory of the compassionate wife of the Marquis, but only elicited from his own wife a repetition of her last reply. Tell the wind and the fire where to stop, not me. Customers entered, and the group was broken up. The English customer paid for what he had had, perplexedly counted his change, and asked, as a stranger, to be directed towards the National Palace. Madame Defarge took him to the door, and put her arm on his in pointing out the road. The English customer was not without his reflections, then, that it might be a good deed to seize that arm, lift it, and strike under it sharp and deep. But he went his way, and was soon swallowed up in the shadow of the prison wall. At the appointed hour he emerged from it to present himself in Mr. Lorry's room again, where he found the old gentleman walking to and fro in restless anxiety. He said he had been with Lucy until just now, and had only left her for a few minutes to come and keep his appointment. 
Her father had not been seen since he quitted the banking-house towards four o'clock. She had some faint hopes that his mediation might save Charles, but they were very slight. He had been more than five hours gone. Where could he be? Mr. Lorry waited until ten, but Dr. Manat not returning, and he, being unwilling to leave Lucy any longer, it was arranged that he should go back to her, and come to the banking-house again at midnight. In the meantime, Carton would wait alone by the fire for the doctor. He waited and waited, and the clock struck twelve, but Dr. Manette did not come back. Mr. Lorry returned and found no tidings of him, and brought none. Where could he be? They were discussing this question, and were almost building up some weak structure of hope on his prolonged absence when they heard him on the stairs. The instant he entered the room, it was plain that all was lost. Whether he had been to any one, or whether he had been all that time traversing the streets, was never known. As he stood staring at them, they asked him no questions, for his face told them everything. "'I cannot find it,' said he, "'and I must have it. Where is it?' His head and throat were bare, and, as he spoke with a helpless look straying all around, he took his coat off and let it drop to the floor. "'Where is my bench? I have been looking everywhere for my bench, and I can't find it. What have they done with my work? Time presses. I must finish those shoes.' They looked at one another, and their hearts died within them. "'Come, come,' he said, in a whimpering, miserable way. "'Let me get to work. Give me my work.' Receiving no answer, he tore his hair and beat his feet upon the ground, like a distracted child. "'Don't torture a poor, forlorn wretch,' he implored them, with a dreadful cry. "'But give me my work. What is to become of us if those shoes are not done to-night?' Lost, utterly lost. It was so clearly beyond hope to reason with him, or try to restore him, that, as if by agreement, they each put a hand upon his shoulder— and soothed him to sit down before the fire, with a promise that he should have his work presently. He sank into the chair and brooded over the embers, and shed tears. As if all that had happened since the garret time were a momentary fancy or a dream, Mr. Lorry saw him shrink into the exact figure that Defarge had had in keeping. Affected and impressed with terror as they both were, by this spectacle of ruin, it was not a time to yield to such emotions. His lonely daughter, bereft of her final hope and reliance, appealed to them both too strongly. Again, as if by agreement, they looked at one another with one meaning in their faces. Carton was the first to speak. The last chance is gone. It was not much. Yes, he had better be taken to her. But before you go, will you for a moment steadily attend to me? Don't ask me why I make the stipulations I am going to make, and exact the promise I am going to exact. I have a reason, a good one. I do not doubt it, answered Mr. Lorry. Say on. The figure in the chair between them was all the time monotonously rocking itself to and fro and moaning. They spoke in such a tone as they would have used if they had been watching by a sick bed in the night. Carton stooped to pick up the coat which lay almost entangling his feet. As he did so, a small case, in which the doctor was accustomed to carry the lists of his day's duties, fell lightly to the floor. Carton took it up, and there was a folded paper in it. "'We should look at this,' he said. Mr. Lorry nodded his consent. He opened it and exclaimed, "'Thank God!' "'What is it?' asked Mr. Lorry eagerly. "'A moment. Let me speak of it in its place. First. He put his hand in his coat and took another paper from it. That is the certificate which enables me to pass out of this city. Look at it, you see? Sidney Carton, an Englishman. Mr. Lorry held it open in his hand, gazing in his earnest face. Keep it for me until tomorrow. I shall see him tomorrow, you remember, and I had better not take it into the prison. Why not? I don't know. I prefer not to do so. Now take this paper that Dr. Minette has carried about him. It is a similar certificate, enabling him and his daughter and her child at any time to pass the barrier and the frontier, you see? Yes. Perhaps he obtained it as his last and utmost precaution against evil yesterday. When is it dated? But no matter. Don't stay to look. Put it up carefully with mine and your own. Now observe, I never doubted until within this hour or two that he had or could have had such a paper. 
It is good until recalled, but it may be soon recalled, and I have reason to think will be. They are not in danger. They are in great danger. They are in danger of denunciation by Madame Defarge. I know it from her own lips. I have overheard words of that woman's, to-night, which have presented their danger to me in strong colours. I have lost no time, and since then I have seen the spy. He confirms me. He knows that a wood-sawyer, living by the prison wall, is under the control of the Defarges, and has been rehearsed by Madame Defarge as to his having seen her, he never mentioned Lucy's name, making signs and signals to prisoners. It is easy to foresee that the pretense will be the common one. A prison plot, and that it will involve her life, and perhaps her child's, and perhaps her father's, for both have been seen with her at that place. Don't look so horrified. You will save them all. Heaven grant I may, Carton, but how? I am going to tell you how. It will depend on you, and it could depend on no better man. This new denunciation will certainly not take place until after to-morrow, probably not until two or three days afterwards, probably a week afterwards. You know, it is a capital crime to mourn for or sympathize with a victim of the guillotine. She and her father would unquestionably be guilty of this crime, and this woman, the inveteracy of whose pursuit cannot be described, would wait to add that strength to her case and make herself doubly sure. You follow me? So attentively, and with so much confidence in what you say, that for a moment I lose sight, touching the back of the doctor's chair, even of this distress. You have money and can buy the means of travelling to the sea-coast as quickly as the journey can be made. Your preparations have been completed for some days to return to England. Early to-morrow have your horses ready, so that they may be in starting trim at two o'clock in the afternoon. It shall be done. His manner was so fervent and inspiring that Mr. Lorry caught the flame and was as quick as youth. You are a noble heart. Did I say we could depend on no better man? Tell her to-night what you know of her danger as involving her child and her father. Dwell upon that, for she would lay her own fair head beside her husband's cheerfully. He faltered for an instant, and then went on as before. For the sake of her child and her father, press upon her the necessity of leaving Paris, with them and you, at that hour. Tell her that it was her husband's last arrangement. Tell her that more depends on it than she dare believe or hope. You think her father, even in this sad state, will submit himself to her, do you not? I am sure of it. I thought so. Quietly and steadily have all these arrangements made in the courtyard here, even to the taking of your own seat in the carriage. The moment I come to you, take me in and drive away. I understand that I wait for you under all circumstances. You have my certificate in your hand with the rest, you know, and will reserve my place. Wait for nothing but to have my place occupied, and then for England. Why then, said Mr. Lorry, grasping his eager but so firm and steady hand, it does not all depend on one old man, but I shall have a young and ardent man at my side. By the help of heaven you shall. Promise me solemnly that nothing will influence you to alter the course on which we now stand pledged to one another. Nothing, Carton. Remember these words to-morrow. Change the course, or delay in it, for any reason, and no life can possibly be saved, and many lives must inevitably be sacrificed. I will remember them. I hope to do my part faithfully, and I hope to do mine. Now good-bye. Though he said it with a grave smile of earnestness, and though he even put the old man's hand to his lips, he did not part from him then. He helped him so far to arouse the rocking figure before the dying embers, as to get a cloak and a hat put upon it, and to tempt it forth to find where the bench and work were hidden that it still moaningly besought to have. He walked on the other side of it and protected it to the courtyard of the house where the afflicted heart, so happy in the memorable time when he had revealed his own desolate heart to it, outwatched the awful night. He entered the courtyard and remained there for a few moments alone, looking up at the light in the window of her room. Before he went away, he breathed a blessing towards it, and a farewell. End of Book 3 Chapter 12
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caroline Morse. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three, Chapter Thirteen. Fifty Two. In the black prison of the Conciergerie, the doomed of the day awaited their fate. They were in number as the weeks of the year. Fifty-two were to roll that afternoon, on the life-tide of the city, to the boundless everlasting sea. Before their cells were quit of them, new occupants were appointed. Before their blood ran into the blood spilled yesterday, the blood that was to mingle with theirs to-morrow was already set apart. Two score and twelve were told off. From the farmer-general of seventy, whose riches could not buy his life, to the seamstress of twenty, whose poverty and obscurity could not save her. Physical diseases, engendered in the vices and neglects of men, will seize on victims of all degrees, and the frightful moral disorder, born of unspeakable suffering, intolerable oppression, and heartless indifference, smote equally without distinction. Charles Darnay, alone in a cell, had sustained himself with no flattering delusion since he came to it from the tribunal. In every line of the narrative he had heard, he had heard his condemnation. He had fully comprehended that no personal influence could possibly save him, that he was virtually sentenced by the millions, and that units could avail him nothing. Nevertheless it was not easy, with the face of his beloved wife fresh before him, to compose his mind to what it must bear. His hold on life was strong, and it was very, very hard to loosen. By gradual efforts and degrees, unclosed a little here, it clenched the tighter there and when he brought his strength to bear on that hand, and it yielded, this was closed again. There was a hurry, too, in all his thoughts, a turbulent and heated working of his heart, that contended against resignation. If for a moment he did feel resigned, then his wife and child who had to live after him seemed to protest and to make it a selfish thing. But all this was at first, before long, the consideration that there was no disgrace in the fate he must meet, and that numbers went the same road wrongfully and trod it firmly every day, sprang up to stimulate him. Next followed the thought that much of the future peace of mind enjoyable by the dear ones depended on his quiet fortitude. So by degrees he calmed into the better state, and when he could raise his thoughts much higher and draw comfort down. Before it had set in dark on the night of his condemnation, he had travelled thus far on his last way. Being allowed to purchase the means of writing, and a light, he sat down to write until such time as the prison lamps should be extinguished. He wrote a long letter to Lucy, showing her that he had known nothing of her father's imprisonment until he had heard of it from herself, and that he had been as ignorant as she of his father's and uncle's responsibility for that misery until the paper had been read. He had already explained to her that his concealment from herself of the name he had relinquished was the one condition, fully intelligible now, that her father had attached to their betrothal and was the one promise he had still exacted from her on the morning of their marriage. He entreated her, for her father's sake, never to seek to know whether her father had become oblivious of the existence of the paper, or had had it recalled to him, for the moment or for good, by the story of the tower, on that old Sunday under the dear old plane tree in the garden. If he had preserved any definite remembrance of it, there could be no doubt that he had supposed it destroyed with the Bastille, when he had found no mention of it among the relics of the prisoners which the populace had discovered there, and which had been described to all the world. He besought her, though he added that he knew it was needless, to console her father by impressing him, through every tender means she could think of, with the truth that he had done nothing for which he could justly reproach himself, but had uniformly forgotten himself for their joint sakes. Next to her preservation of his own last grateful love and blessing, and her overcoming of her sorrow, to devote herself to their dear child, he adjured her, as they would meet in heaven to comfort her father. To her father himself he wrote in the same strain, but he told her father that he expressly confided his wife and child to his care, and he told him this, very strongly, with the hope of rousing him from any despondency or dangerous retrospect toward which he foresaw he might be tending. To Mr. Lorry he commended them all, and explained his worldly affairs. That done, with many added sentences of grateful friendship and warm attachment, all was done. He never thought of Carton. His mind was so full of the others that he never once thought of him. He had time to finish these letters before the lights were out. When he lay down on his straw bed, he thought he had done with this world. 
but it beckoned him back in his sleep and showed itself in shining forms, free and happy, back in the old house in Soho, though it had nothing in it like the real house, unaccountably released and light of heart. He was with Lucy again, and she told him it was all a dream and he had never gone away. A pause of forgetfulness, and then he had even suffered, and had come back to her, dead and at peace, and yet there was no difference in him. Another pause of oblivion, and he awoke in the sombre morning, unconscious where he was of what had happened until it flashed upon his mind, This is the day of my death. Thus he had come through the hours to the day when the fifty-two heads were to fall, and now, while he was composed and hoped that he could meet the end with quiet heroism, a new action began in his waking thoughts which was very difficult to master. He had never seen the instrument that was to terminate his life, how high it was from the ground, how many steps it had, where he would be stood, how he would be touched, whether the touching hands would be dyed red, which way his face would be turned, whether he would be the first or might be the last. These and many similar questions, in no wise directed by his will, obtruded themselves over and over again countless times, neither were they connected with fear. He was conscious of no fear. Rather, they originated in a strange besetting desire to know what to do when the time came, a desire gigantically disproportionate to the few swift moments to which it referred, a wondering that was more like the wondering of some other spirit within his than his own. The hours went on as he walked to and fro, and the clocks struck the numbers he would never hear again. Nine, gone forever. Ten, gone forever. Eleven, gone forever. Twelve coming on to pass away. After a hard contest with that eccentric action of thought, of which it had last perplexed him, he had got the better of it. He walked up and down, softly repeating their names to himself. The worst of the strife was over. He could walk up and down, free from distracting fancies, praying for himself and for them. Twelve gone forever. He had been apprised that the final hour was three and he knew he would be summoned some time earlier inasmuch as the tumbrils jolted heavily and slowly through the streets. Therefore he resolved to keep two before his mind as the hour, and so to strengthen himself in the interval that he might be able after that time to strengthen others. Walking regularly to and fro with his arms folded to his breast, a very different man from the prisoner who had walked to and fro at La Force, he heard one strike away from him without surprise. The hour had measured like most other hours, Devoutly thankful to heaven for his recovered self-possession, he thought, there is but another now, and turned to walk again. Footsteps in the stone passage outside the door. He stopped. The key was put in the lock and turned. Before the door was opened, or as it opened, a man said in a low voice in English, He has never seen me here. I have kept out of his way. Go you in alone. I wait near. Lose no time. The door was quickly opened and closed, and there stood before him face to face, quiet, intent upon him, and with the light of a smile upon his features and a cautionary finger on his lip, Sidney Carton. There was something so bright and remarkable in his look that for the first moment the prisoner misdoubted him to be an apparition of his own imagining. But as he spoke, and it was his voice, he took the prisoner's hand, and it was his real grasp. "'Of all the people upon earth you least expected to see me,' he said, "'I could not believe it to be you. I can scarcely believe it now.' You are not, the apprehension came suddenly into his mind, a prisoner? No, I am accidentally possessed of a power over one of the keepers here, and in virtue of it I stand before you. I come from her, your wife, dear Darnay. The prisoner wrung his hand. I bring you a request from her. What is it? A most earnest, pressing and emphatic entreaty, addressed to you in the most pathetic tones of the voice so dear to you that you well remember. The prisoner turned his face partly aside. You have no time to ask me why I bring it or what it means. I have no time to tell you. You must comply with it. Take off those boots you wear and draw on these of mine. There was a chair against the wall of the cell behind the prisoner. Carton, pressed forward, had already, with the speed of lightning, got him down into it and stood over him barefoot. Draw on these boots of mine. Put your hands to them. Put your will to them. Quick! Carton, there is no escaping from this place. It can never be done. You will only die with me. It is madness. It would be madness if I asked you to escape, but do I? When I ask you to pass out at that door, tell me it is madness and remain here. Change that cravat for this of mine, that coat for this of mine. While you do it, let me take this ribbon from your hair and shake out your hair like this of mine. With wonderful quickness, and with a strength both of will and action that appeared quite supernatural, he forced all these changes upon him. The prisoner was like a young child in his hands. 
Carton, dear Carton, it is madness. It cannot be accomplished. It never can be done. It has been attempted and has always failed. I implore you not to add your death to the bitterness of mine. Do I ask you, my dear Darnay, to pass the door? When I ask that, refuse. There are pen and ink and paper on this table. Is your hand steady enough to write? It was when you came in. Steady it again and write what I shall dictate. Quick, friend, quick. Pressing his hand to his bewildered head, Darnay sat down at the table. Carton, with his right hand in his breast, stood close beside him. Write exactly as I speak. To whom do I address it? To no one. Carton still had his hand in his breast. Do I date it? No. The prisoner looked up at each question. Carton, standing over him with his hand in his breast, looked down. If you remember, said Carton, dictating, the words that passed between us long ago, you will readily comprehend this when you see it. You do remember them, I know. It is not in your nature to forget them. He was drawing his hand from his breast. The prisoner chancing to look up in his hurried wonder as he wrote, the hand stopped, closing upon something. Have you written, forget them? Carton asked. I have. Is that a weapon in your hand? No, I am not armed. What is it in your hand? You shall know directly. Write on. There are but a few words more. He dictated again. I am so thankful that the time has come, when I can prove them, that I do so is no subject for regret or grief. As he said these words with his eyes fixed on the writer, his hand slowly and softly moved down close to the writer's face. The pen dropped from Darnay's fingers on the table, and he looked about him vacantly. "'What vapor is that?' he asked. "'Vapor? Something that crossed me? I am conscious of nothing. There can be nothing here. Take up the pen and finish. Hurry, hurry!' As if his memory were impaired or his faculties disordered, the prisoner made an effort to rally his attention. As he looked at Carton with clouded eyes and with an altered manner of breathing, Carton, his hand again in his breast, looked steadily at him. "'Hurry, hurry!' The prisoner bent over the paper once more. If it had been otherwise, Carton's hand was again watchfully and softly stealing down. I never should have used the longer opportunity. If it had been otherwise, the hand was at the prisoner's face. I should but have had so much the more to answer for. If it had been otherwise. Carton looked at the pen and saw that it was trailing off into unintelligible signs. Carton's hand moved back to his breast no more. The prisoner sprang up with a reproachful look, but Carton's hand was close and firm at his nostrils, and Carton's left arm caught him round the waist. For a few seconds he faintly struggled with the man who had come to lay down his life for him. But with a minute or so he was stretched insensibly on the ground. Quickly, but with hands as true to the purpose as his heart was, Carton dressed himself in the clothes the prisoner had laid aside, combed back his hair, and tied it with the ribbon the prisoner had worn. Then he softly called, "'Enter there! Come in!' and the spy presented himself. "'You see,' said Carton, looking up as he kneeled on one knee beside the insensible figure, putting the paper in the breast. "'Is your hazard very great?' "'Mr. Carton,' the spy answered with a timid snap of his fingers, "'my hazard is not that, in the thick of business here, if you are true to the whole of your bargain. Don't fear me, I will be true to the death.' You must be, Mr. Carton, if the tale of fifty-two is to be right. Being made right by you in that dress I shall have no fear. Have no fear. I shall soon be out of the way of harming you, and the rest will soon be far from here, please God. Now get assistance and take me to the coach. You? asked the spy nervously. Him, man, with whom I have exchanged. You go out at the gate by which you brought me in? Of course. I was weak and faint when you brought me in, and I am fainter now you take me out. The parting interview has overpowered me. Such a thing has happened here, often and too often. Your life is in your own hands. Quick, call assistance. You swear not to betray me, said the trembling spy as he paused for a last moment. Man, man, returned Carton, stamping his foot. Have I sworn by no solemn vow already to go through with this, that you waste the precious moments now? Take him yourself to the courtyard you know of. Place him yourself in the carriage. Show him yourself to Mr. Lorry. Tell him yourself to give him no restorative but air, and to remember my words of last night and his promise of last night, and drive away. The spy withdrew, and Carton seated himself at the table, resting his forehead on his hands. The spy returned immediately with two men. How, then, said one of them, contemplating the fallen figure, so afflicted to find that his friend has drawn a prize in the lottery of St. Guillotine? A good patriot, said the other, could hardly have been more afflicted if the aristocrat had drawn a blank. 
They raised the unconscious figure, placed it on a litter they had brought to the door, and bent to carry it away. "'The time is short, Evremond,' said the spy in a warning voice. "'I know it well,' answered Carton. "'Be careful of my friend, I entreat you, and leave me.' "'Come then, my children,' said Barsad. "'Lift him and come away.' The door closed, and Carton was left alone. Straining his powers of listening to the utmost, he listened for any sound that might denote suspicion or alarm. There was none. Keys turned, doors clashed, footsteps passed along distant passages. No cry was raised or hurry made that seemed unusual. Breathing more freely in a little while, he sat down at the table and listened again until the clock struck two. Sounds that he was not afraid of, for he divined their meaning, then began to be audible. Several doors were opened in succession, and finally his own. A jailer with a list in his hand looked in, merely saying, "'Follow me, Evremond,' and he followed into a large dark room at a distance. It was a dark winter day, and what with the shadows within, and what with the shadows without, he could but dimly discern the others who were brought there to have their arms bound. Some were standing, some seated. Some were lamenting and in restless motion, but these were few. The great majority were silent and still, looking fixedly at the ground. As he stood by the wall in a dim corner, while some of the fifty-two were brought in after him, one man stopped in passing to embrace him, as having a knowledge of him. It thrilled him with a great dread of discovery, but the man went on. A very few moments after that a young woman, with a slight girlish form, a sweet spare face in which there was no vestige of color and large widely opened patient eyes, rose from the seat where he had observed her sitting and came to speak to him. "'Citizen Evremond,' she said, touching him with her cold hand, "'I am a poor little seamstress who was with you in La Force.' He murmured for answer, "'True, I forget what you were accused of. Plots. Though the just heaven knows that I am innocent of any. Is it likely? Who would think of plotting with a poor little weak creature like me?' The forlorn smile with which she said it so touched him that tears started from his eyes. "'I am not afraid to die, citizen Evremond, but I have done nothing.' I am not unwilling to die if the Republic which is to do so much good to us poor will profit by my death, but I do not know how that can be, citizen Evremond, such a poor little weak creature. As the last thing on earth that his heart was to warm and soften to, it warmed and softened to this pitiable girl. I heard you were released, citizen Evremond. I hoped it was true. It was, but I was taken again and condemned. If I may ride with you, citizen Evremond, will you let me hold your hand? I am not afraid, but I am little and weak, and it will give me more courage. As the patient eyes were lifted to his face, he saw a sudden doubt in them, and then astonishment. He pressed the work-worn, hunger-worn young fingers and touched his lips. Are you dying for him? she whispered. And his wife and child. Hush! Yes. Oh, you will let me hold your brave hand, stranger? Hush, yes, my poor sister, to the last. The same shadows that are falling on the prison are falling in that same hour of the early afternoon, on the barrier with the crowd about it, when a coach going out of Paris drives up to be examined. Who goes here? Whom have we within? Papers! The papers are handed out and read. Alexander Manette, physician, French. Which is he? This is he. This helpless, inarticulately murmuring, wandering old man pointed out. Apparently the citizen doctor is not in his right mind. The revolution fever will have been too much for him. Greatly too much for him. Ha! Many suffer with it. Lucie, his daughter. French. Which is she? This is she. Apparently it must be. Lucie, the wife of Evremond. Is it not? It is. Ha! Evremond has an assignation elsewhere. Lucie, her child. English. This is she? She and no other. Kiss me, child of Evremond. Now thou hast kissed a good Republican, something new in thy family, remember it. Sidney Carton. Advocate. English. Which is he? He lies here, in this corner of the carriage. He, too, is pointed out. Apparently the English advocate is in a swoon. It is hoped he will recover in the fresher air. It is represented that he is not in strong health, and has separated sadly from a friend who is under the displeasure of the Republic. Is that all? It is not a great deal, that. Many are under the displeasure of the Republic, and must look out at the little window. Jarvis Lorry, banker, English. Which is he? I am he, necessarily being the last. It is Jarvis Lorry who has replied to all the previous questions. It is Jarvis Lorry who has alighted and stands with his hand on the coach door, replying to a group of officials. 
they leisurely walk round the carriage and leisurely mount the box, to look at what little luggage it carries on the roof. The country people hanging about press nearer to the coach doors and greedily stare in. A little child carried by its mother has its short arm held out for it, that it may touch the wife of an aristocrat who has gone to the guillotine. Behold your papers, Jarvis Lorry, countersigned. One can depart, citizen? One can depart. Forward, my postillions. A good journey. I salute you, citizens. And the first danger passed. These are again the words of Jarvis Lorry as he clasps his hands and looks upward. There is terror in the carriage, there is weeping, there is the heavy breathing of the insensible traveller. "'Are we not going too slowly? Can they not be induced to go faster?' asks Lucy, clinging to the old man. "'It would seem like flight, my darling. I must not urge them too much. It would rouse suspicion. Look back, look back, and see if we are pursued. The road is clear, my dearest. So far we are not pursued. Houses in twos and threes pass by us. Solitary farms, ruinous buildings. Dye-works, tanneries, and the like, open countries, avenues of leafless trees. The hard, uneven pavement is under us. The soft, deep mud is on either side. Sometimes we strike into the skirting mud to avoid the stones that clatter and shake us. Sometimes we stick in ruts and sloughs there. The agony of our impatience is then so great that in our wild alarm and hurry we are forgetting out and running, hiding, doing anything but stopping. Out of the open country, in again amongst ruinous buildings, solitary farms, dye-works, tanneries, and the like, cottages in twos and threes, avenues of leafless trees. Have these men deceived us and taken us back by another road? Is this not the same place twice over? Thank heaven, no, a village. Look back, look back, and see if we are pursued. Hush, the posting-house. Leisurely our four horses are taken out. Leisurely the coach stands in the little street, bereft of horses and with no likelihood upon it of ever moving again. Leisurely the new horses come into visible existence one by one. Leisurely the new postillions follow, sucking and plating the lashes of their whips. Leisurely the old postillions count their money, make wrong additions, and arrive at dissatisfied results. All the time our overfraught hearts are beating at a rate that would far outstrip the fastest gallop of the fastest horses ever foaled. At length the new postillions are in their saddles, and the old are left behind. We are through the village, up the hill and down the hill, and on the low watery grounds. Suddenly the postillions exchange speech with animated gesticulation, and the horses are pulled up, almost on their haunches. We are pursued? Ho! Within the carriage there! Speak, then! What is it? asks Mr. Lorry, looking at the window. How many did they say? I do not understand you. At the last post, how many to the guillotine today? Fifty-two. I said so, a brave number. My fellow citizens here would have it forty-two. Ten more heads are worth having. The guillotine goes handsomely. I love it. High forward. Whoop! The night comes on dark. He moves more. He is beginning to revive and to speak intelligibly. He thinks they are still together. He asks him by his name what he has in his hand. Oh, pity us, kind heaven, and help us. Look out, look out, and see if we are pursued. The wind is rushing after us, and the clouds are flying after us, and the moon is plunging after us, and the whole wild night is in pursuit of us. So far we are pursued by nothing else. End of Book 3 Chapter 13「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Moira Fogarty. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book 3, Chapter 14. The Knitting Done. In that same juncture of time when the fifty-two awaited their fate, Madame Defarge held darkly ominous counsel with the Vengeance, and Jacques III of the Revolutionary Jury. Not in the wine-shop did Madame Defarge confer with these ministers, but in the shed of the wood-sawyer, erst a mender of roads. The sawyer himself did not participate in the conference, but abided at a little distance, like an outer satellite who was not to speak until required, or to offer an opinion until invited. "'But our Defarge,' said Jacques III, "'is undoubtedly a good Republican, eh?' "'There's no better,' the voluble vengeance protested in her shrill notes, "'in France.' 
"'Peace, little vengeance,' said Madame Defarge, laying her hand with a slight frown on her lieutenant's lips. "'Hear me speak. My husband, fellow-citizen, is a good Republican and a bold man. He has deserved well of the Republic, and possesses its confidence. But my husband has his weaknesses, and he is so weak as to relent towards this doctor.' "'It is a great pity,' croaked Jacques Three, dubiously shaking his head, with his cruel fingers at his hungry mouth. "'It is not quite like a good citizen. It is a thing to regret.' "'See you,' said Madame. "'I care nothing for this doctor, I. He may wear his head or lose it for any interest I have in him. It is all one to me. But the Evremond people are to be exterminated, and the wife and child must follow the husband and father.' "'She has a fine head for it,' croaked Jacques Three. "'I have seen blue eyes and golden hair there, "'and they looked charming when Samson held them up.' "'Ogre that he was, he spoke like an epicure. "'Madame Defarge cast down her eyes and reflected a little. "'The child also,' observed Jacques Three, "'with a meditative enjoyment of his words, "'has golden hair and blue eyes, "'and we seldom have a child there. "'It is a pretty sight.' "'In a word,' said Madame Defarge, "'coming out of her short abstraction, "'I cannot trust my husband in this matter. "'Not only do I feel, since last night, "'that I dare not confide to him the details of my projects, but also I feel that if I delay, there is danger of his giving warning, and then they might escape. "'That must never be!' croaked Jacques Three. "'No one must escape. We have not half enough as it is. We ought to have six score a day.' "'In a word,' Madame Defarge went on, "'my husband has not my reason for pursuing this family to annihilation, and I have not his reason for regarding this doctor with any sensibility.' I must act for myself, therefore. Come hither, little citizen. The wood-sawyer, who held her in the respect, and himself in the submission of mortal fear, advanced with his hand to his red cap. Touching those signals, little citizen, said Madame Defarge sternly, that she made to the prisoners, you are ready to bear witness to them this very day? Aye, aye, why not? cried the sawyer. "'Every day, in all the weathers, from two to four, always signalling, sometimes with a little one, sometimes without. I know what I know. I have seen with my eyes.' He made all manner of gestures while he spoke, as if in incidental imitation of some few of the great diversity of signals that he had never seen. "'Clearly plots,' said Jacques Three. "'Transparently!' "'There is no doubt of the jury,' inquired Madame Defarge, letting her eyes turn to him with a gloomy smile. "'Rely upon the patriotic jury, dear citizeness. I answer for my fellow jurymen.' "'Now let me see,' said Madame Defarge, pondering again. "'Yet once more, can I spare this doctor to my husband? I have no feeling either way. Can I spare him?' "'He would count as one head.' observed Jacques Three in a low voice. "'We really have not heads enough. It would be a pity, I think.' "'He was signalling with her when I saw her,' argued Madame Defarge. "'I cannot speak of one without the other, and I must not be silent, and trust the case wholly to him, this little citizen here, for I am not a bad witness.' The vengeance and Jacques Three vied with each other in their fervent protestations that she was the most admirable and marvellous of witnesses. The little citizen, not to be outdone, declared her to be a celestial witness. "'He must take his chance,' said Madame Defarge. "'No, I cannot spare him. You are engaged at three o'clock. You are going to see the batch of to-day executed. You?' The question was addressed to the wood-sawyer, who hurriedly replied in the affirmative, seizing the occasion to add that he was the most ardent of Republicans, and that he would be in effect the most desolate of Republicans if anything prevented him from enjoying the pleasure of smoking his afternoon pipe in the contemplation of the droll national barber. He was so very demonstrative herein that he might have been suspected, perhaps was, by the dark eyes that looked contemptuously at him out of Madame Defarge's head of having his small individual fears for his own personal safety every hour in the day. I, said Madame, am equally engaged at the same place. After it is over, say at eight to-night, 
Come you to me in St. Antoine, and we will give information against these people at my section. The wood sawyer said he would be proud and flattered to attend the citizeness. The citizeness, looking at him, he became embarrassed, evaded her glance as a small dog would have done, retreated among his wood, and hid his confusion over the handle of his saw. Madame Defarge beckoned the juryman and the vengeance a little nearer to the door, and there expounded her further views to them thus. She will now be at home, awaiting the moment of his death. She will be mourning and grieving. She will be in a state of mind to impeach the justice of the Republic. She will be full of sympathy with its enemies. I will go to her. "'What an admirable woman! What an adorable woman!' exclaimed Jacques Three, rapturously. "'Ah, my cherished!' cried the vengeance, and embraced her. "'Take you my knitting,' said Madame Defarge, placing it in her lieutenant's hands, "'and have it ready for me in my usual seat. Keep me my usual chair. Go you there straight, for there will probably be a greater concourse than usual to-day.' "'I willingly obey the orders of my chief,' said the vengeance with alacrity, and kissing her cheek. "'You will not be late.' "'I shall be there before the commencement.' "'And before the tumbrils arrive. Be sure you are there, my soul,' said the vengeance, calling after her, for she had already turned into the street. "'Before the tumbrils arrive!' Madame Defarge slightly waved her hand to imply that she heard, and might be relied upon to arrive in good time and so went through the mud and round the corner of the prison wall. The vengeance and the juryman, looking after her as she walked away, were highly appreciative of her fine figure and her superb moral endowments. There were many women at that time, upon whom the time laid a dreadfully disfiguring hand. But there was not one among them more to be dreaded than this ruthless woman, now taking her way along the streets. Of a strong and fearless character, of shrewd sense and readiness, of great determination, of that kind of beauty which not only seems to impart to its possessor firmness and animosity, but to strike into others an instinctive recognition of those qualities, the troubled time would have heaved her up under any circumstances. But, imbued from her childhood with a brooding sense of wrong, and an inveterate hatred of a class, opportunity had developed her into a tigress. She was absolutely without pity. If she had ever had the virtue in her, it had quite gone out of her. It was nothing to her that an innocent man was to die for the sins of his forefathers. She saw not him, but them. It was nothing to her that his wife was to be made a widow, and his daughter an orphan. That was insufficient punishment, because they were her natural enemies and her prey, and as such had no right to live. To appeal to her was made hopeless by her having no sense of pity, even for herself. If she had been laid low in the streets, in any of the many encounters in which she had been engaged, she would not have pitied herself, nor, if she had been ordered to the axe to-morrow, would she have gone to it with any softer feeling than a fierce desire to change places with the man who sent her there. Such a heart Madame Defarge carried under her rough robe. Carelessly worn, it was becoming robe enough, in a certain weird way, and her dark hair looked rich under her coarse red cap. Lying hidden in her bosom was a loaded pistol. Lying hidden at her waist was a sharpened dagger. Thus accoutred, and walking with the confident tread of such a character, and with the supple freedom of a woman who had habitually walked in her girlhood, barefoot and bare-legged, on the brown sea-sand, Madame Defarge took her way along the streets. Now, when the journey of the travelling coach, at that very moment waiting for the completion of its load, had been planned out last night, the difficulty of taking Miss Pross in it had much engaged Mr. Lorry's attention. It was not merely desirable to avoid overloading the coach, but it was of the highest importance that the time occupied in examining it and its passengers should be reduced to the utmost, since their escape might depend on the saving of only a few seconds here and there. Finally, he had proposed, after anxious consideration, that Miss Pross and Jerry, who were at liberty to leave the city, should leave it at three o'clock in the lightest wheeled conveyance known to that period. Unencumbered with luggage, they would soon overtake the coach, and, passing it and proceeding it on the road, would order its horses in advance, and greatly facilitate its progress during the precious hours of the night, when delay was the most to be dreaded. Seeing in this arrangement the hope of rendering real service in that pressing emergency, 
Miss Pross hailed it with joy. She and Jerry had beheld the coach start, had known who it was that Solomon brought, had passed some ten minutes in torches of suspense, and were now concluding their arrangements to follow the coach, even as Madame Defarge, taking her way through the streets, now drew nearer and nearer to the else deserted lodging in which they held their consultation. "'Now what do you think, Mr. Cruncher?' said Miss Pross, whose agitation was so great that she could hardly speak or stand or move or live. "'What do you think of our not starting from this courtyard? A another carriage having already gone from here to-day, it, it might awaken suspicion.' "'My opinion, Miss,' returned Mr. Cruncher, "'is as you're right. Likewise what I'll stand by you, right or wrong.' "'I'm so distracted with fear and hope for our precious creatures,' said Miss Pross, wildly crying, "'that I am incapable of forming any plan. Are, are you capable of forming any plan, my dear good Mr. Cruncher?' "'Respectin' a future spear o' life, miss,' returned Mr. Cruncher, "'I hope so. Respectin' any present use of this here blessed old head o' mine, I think not. Would you do me the favour, miss, to take notice of two promises and wows what it was my wishes for to record in this here crisis?' "'Oh, for gracious sake!' cried Miss Pross, still wildly crying. "'Record them at once, and get them out of the way like an excellent man.' First, said Mr. Cruncher, who was all in a tremble, and who spoke with an ashy and solemn visage, "'Them poor things well out of this. Never no more will I do it. Never no more.' "'I am quite sure, Mr. Cruncher,' returned Miss Pross, "'that you never will do it again, whatever it is, and I beg you not to think it necessary to mention more particularly what it is.' "'No, Miss,' returned Jerry. "'It shall not be named to you. Second. "'Them poor things well out o' this, "'and never no more will I interfere "'with Mrs. Cruncher's flopping. "'Never no more.' "'Whatever housekeeping arrangement that may be,' "'said Miss Pross, striving to dry her eyes "'and compose herself, "'I have no doubt it is best that Mrs. Cruncher "'should have it entirely under her own superintendence. "'Oh, my poor darlings!' "'I go so far as to say, Miss, moreover,' "'proceeded Mr. Cruncher, "'with a most alarming tendency to hold forth "'as from a pulpit.' and let my words be tucked down and took to mrs cruncher through yourself that what my opinions respecting floppin has undergone a change and that what i only hope with all my heart as mrs cruncher may be a flopping at the present time there 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 i hope she is my dear man cried the distracted miss pross and i hope she finds it answering her expectations "'Forbid it,' proceeded Mr. Cruncher, with additional solemnity, additional slowness, and additional tendency to hold forth and hold out, as anything what I have ever said or done should be visited on my earnest wishes for them poor creatures now. Forbid it as we shouldn't all flop, if it was anyways convenient, to get em out of this here dismal risk. Forbid it, miss. What I say, forbid it!' This was Mr. Cruncher's conclusion, after a protracted but vain endeavour to find a better one. And still Madame Defarge, pursuing her way along the streets, came nearer and nearer. "'If we ever get back to our native land,' said Miss Pross, "'you may rely upon my telling Mrs. Cruncher as much as I may be able to remember and understand of what you have so impressively said.' "'And at all events you may be sure that I shall bear witness to your being thoroughly in earnest at this dreadful time. "'Now, pray let us think. My esteemed Mr. Cruncher, let us think.' "'Still Madame Defarge, pursuing her way along the streets, came nearer and nearer. "'If you were to go before,' said Miss Pross, "'and stop the vehicle and horses from coming here, and were to wait somewhere for me, w wouldn't that be best?' "'Mr. Cruncher thought it might be best.' "'Where could you wait for me?' asked Miss Pross. Mr. Cruncher was so bewildered that he could think of no locality but Temple Bar. Alas! Temple Bar was hundreds of miles away, and Madame Defarge was drawing very near indeed. "'By the cathedral door,' said Miss Pross. "'Would it be much out of the way to take me in near the great cathedral door between the two towers?' "'No, Miss,' answered Mr. Cruncher. "'Then, like the best of men,' said Miss Pross, "'go to the posting-house straight and make that change.' "'I am doubtful,' said Mr. Cruncher, "'hesitating and shaking his head, "'about leaving of you, you see. "'We don't know what may happen.' "'Heaven knows we don't,' returned Miss Pross, "'but have no fear for me. 
take me in at the cathedral at three o'clock, or as near it as you can, and I am sure it will be better than our going from here. I feel certain of it. There, bless you, Mr. Cruncher. Think not of me, but of the lives that may depend on both of us. This exordium, and Miss Pross's two hands in quite agonized entreaty clasping his, decided Mr. Cruncher. With an encouraging nod or two, he immediately went out to alter the arrangements, and left her by herself to follow as she had proposed. The having originated a precaution, which was already in course of execution, was a great relief to Miss Pross. The necessity of composing her appearance so that it should attract no special notice in the streets was another relief. She looked at her watch, and it was twenty minutes past two. She had no time to lose, but must get ready at once. Afraid, in her extreme perturbation, of the loneliness of the deserted rooms, and of half-imagined faces peeping from behind every open door in them, Miss Pross got a basin of cold water, and began laving her eyes, which were swollen and red. Haunted by her feverish apprehensions, she could not bear to have her sight obscured for a minute at a time by the dripping water, but constantly paused and looked round, to see that there was no one watching her. In one of those pauses she recoiled and cried out, for she saw a figure standing in the room. The basin fell to the ground, broken, and the water flowed to the feet of Madame Defarge. By strange, stern ways, and through much staining blood, those feet had come to meet that water. Madame Defarge looked coldly at her, and said, "'The wife of Evremonde? Where is she?' It flashed upon Miss Pross's mind that the doors were all standing open, and would suggest the flight. Her first act was to shut them. There were four in the room, and she shut them all. She then placed herself before the door of the chamber which Lucy had occupied. Madame Defarge's dark eyes followed her through this rapid movement, and rested on her when it was finished. Miss Pross had nothing beautiful about her. Years had not tamed the wildness, or softened the grimness of her appearance. But she too was a determined woman in her different way, and she measured Madame Defarge with her eyes every inch. "'You might, from your appearance, be the wife of Lucifer,' said Miss Pross in her breathing. "'Nevertheless, you shall not get the better of me. I am an Englishwoman.' Madame Defarge looked at her scornfully but still with something of Miss Pross's own perception that they too were at bay. She saw a tight, hard, wiry woman before her, as Mr. Lorry had seen in the same figure a woman with a strong hand in the years gone by. She knew full well that Miss Pross was the family's devoted friend. Miss Pross knew full well that Madame Defarge was the family's malevolent enemy. "'On my way yonder,' said Madame Defarge, with a slight movement of her hand towards the fatal spot, "'where they reserve my chair and my knitting for me, I am come to make my compliments to her in passing. I wish to see her.' "'I know that your intentions are evil,' said Miss Pross, "'and you may depend upon it. I'll hold my own against them.' Each spoke in her own language. Neither understood the other's words. Both were very watchful, and intent to deduce from look and manner what the unintelligible words meant. "'It will do her no good to keep herself concealed from me at this moment,' said Madame Defarge. "'Good patriots will know what that means. Let me see her. Go tell her that I wish to see her. Do you hear?' "'If those eyes of yours were bedwinches,' returned Miss Pross, "'and I was an English four-poster, they shouldn't lose a splinter of me.' "'No, you wicked foreign woman. I am your match.' Madame Defarge was not likely to follow these idiomatic remarks in detail, but she so far understood them as to perceive that she was set at naught. "'Woman, imbecile, and pig-like!' said Madame Defarge, frowning. "'I take no answer from you. I demand to see her. Either tell her that I demand to see her, or stand out of the way of the door and let me go to her.' this with an angry explanatory wave of her right arm. "'I little thought,' said Miss Pross, "'that I should ever want to understand your nonsensical language. But I would give all I have, except the clothes I wear, to know whether you suspect the truth or any part of it.' Neither of them for a single moment released the other's eyes. Madame Defarge had not moved from the spot where she stood when Miss Pross first became aware of her, 
but she now advanced one step. "'I am a Briton,' said Miss Pross. "'I am desperate. I don't care an English twopence for myself. I know that the longer I keep you here, the greater hope there is for my ladybird. I'll not leave a handful of that dark hair upon your head if you lay a finger on me.' Thus Miss Pross, with a shake of her head and a flash of her eyes between every rapid sentence, and every rapid sentence a whole breath. Thus Miss Pross, who had never struck a blow in her life. But her courage was of that emotional nature that it brought the irrepressible tears into her eyes. This was a courage that Madame Defarge so little comprehended as to mistake for weakness. "'Ha-ha!' she laughed. "'You poor wretch! What are you worth? I address myself to that doctor.' She then raised her voice and called out, "'Citizen doctor! Wife of Evremonde! Child of Evremonde! Any person but this miserable fool! Answer the citizeness Defarge!' Perhaps the following silence, perhaps some latent disclosure in the expression of Miss Pross's face, perhaps a sudden misgiving apart from either suggestion, whispered to Madame Defarge that they were gone. Three of the doors she opened swiftly and looked in. "'Those rooms are all in disorder. There has been hurried packing. There are odds and ends upon the ground. There is no one in that room behind you. Let me look.' "'Never!' said Miss Pross, who understood the request as perfectly as Madame Defarge understood the answer. "'If they are not in that room, they are gone, and can be pursued and brought back,' said Madame Defarge to herself. "'As long as you don't know whether they are in that room or not, you are uncertain what to do,' said Miss Pross to herself." and you shall not know that, if I can prevent your knowing it. And know that, or not know that, you shall not leave here while I can hold you. I have been in the streets from the first. Nothing has stopped me. I will tear you to pieces, but I will have you from that door," said Madame Defarge. We are alone at the top of a high house in a solitary courtyard. We are not likely to be heard and I pray for bodily strength to keep you here, while every minute you are here is worth a hundred thousand guineas to my darling," said Miss Pross. Madame de Farge made at the door. Miss Pross, on the instinct of the moment, seized her round the waist in both her arms, and held her tight. It was in vain for Madame de Farge to struggle and to strike. Miss Pross, with the vigorous tenacity of love, always so much stronger than hate, clasped her tight, and even lifted her from the floor in the struggle that they had. The two hands of Madame Defarge buffeted and tore her face, but Miss Pross, with her head down, held her round the waist, and clung to her with more than the hold of a drowning woman. Soon Madame Defarge's hand ceased to strike, and felt at her encircled waist. "'It is under my arm,' said Miss Pross, in smothered tones. "'You shall not draw it. I am stronger than you. I bless heaven for it.' I hold you till one or other of us faints or dies." Madame Defarge's hands were at her bosom. Miss Pross looked up, saw what it was, struck at it, struck out a flash and a crash, and stood alone, blinded with smoke. All this was in a second. As the smoke cleared, leaving an awful stillness, it passed out on the air like the soul of the furious woman whose body lay lifeless on the ground. In the first fright and horror of her situation, Miss Pross passed the body as far from it as she could, and ran down the stairs to call for fruitless help. Happily she bethought herself of the consequences of what she did, in time to check herself and go back. It was dreadful to go in at the door again, but she did go in, and even went near it to get the bonnet and other things that she must wear. These she put on, out on the staircase, first shutting and locking the door and taking away the key. Then she sat down on the stairs a few moments to breathe and to cry, and then got up and hurried away. By good fortune she had a veil on her bonnet, or she could hardly have gone along the streets without being stopped. By good fortune, too, she was naturally so peculiar in appearance as not to show disfigurement like any other woman. She needed both advantages, for the marks of gripping fingers were deep in her face, and her hair was torn, and her dress, hastily composed with unsteady hands, was clutched and dragged a hundred ways. In crossing the bridge she dropped the door-key in the river. Arriving at the cathedral some few minutes before her escort, and waiting there, she thought, 
What if the key were already taken in a net? What if were identified? What if the door were opened and the remains discovered? What if she were stopped at the gate, sent to prison, and charged with murder? In the midst of these fluttering thoughts, the escort appeared, took her in, and took her away. "'Is there any noise in the streets?' she asked him. "'The usual noises,' Mr. Cruncher replied, and looked surprised by the question and by her aspect. "'I don't hear you,' said Miss Pross. "'What do you say?' It was in vain for Mr. Cruncher to repeat what he had said. Miss Pross could not hear him. "'So I'll nod my head,' thought Mr. Cruncher, amazed. "'At all events she'll see that.' And she did. "'Is there any noise in the streets now?' asked Miss Pross again, presently. Again Mr. Cruncher nodded his head. "'I don't hear it.' "'Gone deaf in an hour?' said Mr. Cruncher, ruminating, with his mind much disturbed. "'What's come to her?' "'I feel,' said Miss Pross, "'as if there had been a flash and a crash, "'and that crash was the last thing I should ever hear in this life.' "'Blessed if she ain't in a queer condition,' said Mr. Cruncher, "'more and more disturbed. "'What can she have been a taken to keep her courage up? "'Hark, there's the roll of them dreadful carts. "'You can hear that, Miss.' "'I can hear,' said Miss Pross, "'seeing that he spoke to her. "'Nothing!' "'Oh, my good man, there was first a great crash, and then a great stillness, "'and that stillness seems to be fixed and unchangeable, "'never to be broken any more, as long as my life lasts.' "'If she don't hear the roll of those dreadful carts, "'now very nigh their journey's end,' said Mr. Cruncher, glancing over his shoulder, "'it's my opinion that indeed she never will hear anything else in this world.' "'And indeed she never did.' End of Book 3, Chapter 14, The Knitting Done Recorded in Toronto, Ontario, by Moira Fogarty, October 2006For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Sirwa. Michael. Sirwa. S I R O I S. dot com. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three. Chapter Fifteen. The Footsteps Die Out Forever. Along the Paris streets, the death carts rumble, hollow and harsh. Six tumbrils carry the day's wine to la guillotine. All the devouring and insatiate monsters imagined, since imagination could record itself, are fused in the one realization, guillotine. And yet there is not in France, with its rich variety of soil and climate, a blade, a leaf, a root, a sprig, a peppercorn, which will grow to maturity under conditions more certain than those that have produced this horror. Crush humanity out of shape once more, under similar hammers, and it will twist itself into the same tortured forms. Sow the same seed of rapacious license and oppression over again, and it will surely yield the same fruit according to its kind. Six tumbrils roll along the streets. Change these back again to what they were, thou powerful enchanter, time, and they shall be seen to be the carriages of absolute monarchs, the equipages of feudal nobles, the toilettes of flaring Jezebels, the churches that are not my father's house, but dens of thieves, the huts of millions of starving peasants. No, the great magician who majestically works out the appointed order of the Creator never reverses his transformations. If thou be changed into this shape by the will of God— say the seers to the enchanted in the wise Arabian stories, then remain so. But if thou wear this form through mere passing conjuration, then resume thy former aspect. Changeless and hopeless, the tumbrils roll along. As the sombre wheels of the six carts go round, they seem to plough up a long crooked furrow among the populace in the streets. Ridges of faces are thrown to this side and to that, and the ploughs go steadily onward. So used are the regular inhabitants of the houses to the spectacle that in many windows there are no people, 
and in some the occupation of the hands is not so much as suspended, while the eyes survey the faces in the tumbrils. Here and there the inmate has visitors to see the sight, then he points his finger with something of the complacency of a curator or authorized exponent to this cart and to this, and seems to tell who sat here yesterday and who there the day before. Of the riders in the tumbrils some observe these things, and all things on their last roadside with an impassive stare, others with a lingering interest in the ways of life and men, some seated with drooping heads or sunk in silent despair. Again, there are some so heedful of their looks that they cast upon the multitude such glances as they have seen in theatres and in pictures. Several close their eyes and think, or try to get their straying thoughts together. Only one, and he a miserable creature, of a crazed aspect, is so shattered and made drunk by horror that he sings and tries to dance, not one of the whole number appeals by look or gesture to the pity of the people. There is a guard of sundry horsemen riding abreast of the tumbrils, and faces are often turned up to some of them, and they are asked some question. It would seem to be always the same question, for it is always followed by a press of people towards the third cart. The horsemen abreast of that cart frequently point out one man in it with their swords. The leading curiosity is to know which is he. He stands at the back of the tumbril with his head bent down, to converse with a mere girl who sits on the side of the cart and holds his hand. He has no curiosity or care for the scene about him, and always speaks to the girl. Here and there, in the long street of St. Honor, cries are raised against him. If they move him at all, it is only to a quiet smile, as he shakes his hair a little more loosely about his face. He cannot easily touch his face, his arms being bound. On the steps of a church, awaiting the coming up of the tumbrils, stands the spy and prison sheet. He looks into the first of them, not there. He looks into the second, not there. He already asks himself, Has he sacrificed me? When his face clears, as he looks into the third. Which is Evremond? says a man behind him. That, at the back there. With his hand in the girl's? Yes. The man cries, Down, Evremond, to the guillotine, all aristocrats. Down, Evremond. Hush. Hush, the spy entreats him timidly. And why not, citizen? He is going to pay the forfeit. It will be paid in five minutes more. Let him be at peace. But the man continuing to exclaim, Down, Evremond, the face of Evremond is for a moment turned towards him. Evremond then sees the spy, and looks attentively at him, and goes his way. The clocks are on the stroke of three and the furrow ploughed among the populace is turning round, to come on into the place of execution and end. The ridges, thrown to this side and to that, now crumble in, and close behind the last plough as it passes on, for all are following to the guillotine. In front of it, seated in chairs as in a garden of public diversion, are a number of women busily knitting. On one of the foremost chairs stands the vengeance, looking about for her friend. "'Therese!' she cries in her shrill tones. "'Who has seen her? Therese Defarge!' "'She never missed before,' says a knitting woman of the sisterhood. "'No, nor will she miss now,' cries the vengeance petulantly. "'Therese!' "'Louder,' the woman recommends. "'Aye, louder, vengeance, much louder, and still she will scarcely hear thee. "'Louder yet!' Vengeance, with a little oath or so added, and yet it will hardly bring her. Send other women up and down to seek her, lingering somewhere, and yet, although the messengers have done dread deeds, it is questionable whether of their own wills they will go far enough to find her. "'Bad fortune!' cries the vengeance, stamping her foot in the chair. "'And here are the tumbrils, and Evremond will be dispatched in a wink, and she not here.' See her knitting in my hand, and her empty chair ready for her. I cry with vexation and disappointment. As the vengeance descends from her elevation to do it, the tumbrils begin to discharge their loads. The ministers of St. Guillotine are robed and ready. Crash! A head is held up, and the knitting women, 
who scarcely lifted their eyes to look at it a moment ago when it could think and speak, count one. The second tumbrel empties and moves on. The third comes up. Crash! And the knitting women, never faltering or pausing in their work, count two. The supposed Evremond descends, and the seamstress is lifted out next after him. He has not relinquished her patient hand in getting out, but still holds it as he promised. He gently places her with her back to the crashing engine that constantly whirs up and falls, and she looks into his face and thanks him. But for you, dear stranger, I should not be so composed, for I am naturally a poor little thing, faint of heart, nor should I have been able to raise my thoughts to him who was put to death, that we might have hope and comfort here to-day. I think you were sent to me by heaven. Or you to me, says Sidney Carton. Keep your eyes on me, dear child, and mind no other object. I mind nothing while I hold your hand. I shall mind nothing when I let it go, if they are rapid. They will be rapid, fear not. The two stand in the fast-thinning throng of victims, but they speak as if they were alone, eye to eye, voice to voice, hand to hand, heart to heart, these two children of the universal mother, else so wide apart and differing, have come together on the dark highway, to repair home together, and to rest in her bosom. Brave and generous friend, will you let me ask you one last question? I am very ignorant, and it troubles me just a little. Tell me what it is. I have a cousin, an only relative, and an orphan like myself, whom I love very dearly. She is five years younger than I, and she lives in a farmer's house in the south country, Poverty parted us, and she knows nothing of my fate, for I cannot write. And if I could, how should I tell her? It is better as it is. What I have been thinking as we came along, and and what I am still thinking now, as I look into your kind, strong face, which gives me so much support, is this. If the Republic really does good to the poor, and they come to be less hungry, and in all ways to suffer less, she may live a long time, she may even live to be old. What then, my gentle sister? Do you think, the uncomplaining eyes in which there is so much endurance fill with tears, and the lips part a little more and tremble, that it will seem long to me while I wait for her in the better land, where I trust both you and I will be mercifully sheltered? It cannot be, my child. There is no time there, and no troubles there. You comfort me so much. I am so ignorant. Am I to kiss you now? Is the moment come? Yes. She kisses his lips. He kisses hers. They solemnly bless each other. The spare hand does not tremble as he releases it. Nothing worse than a sweet, bright constancy is in the patient face. She goes next before him. Is gone. The knitting women count twenty-two. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The murmuring of many voices, the upturning of many faces, the pressing on of many footsteps in the outskirts of the crowd, so that it swells forward in a mass, like one great heave of water, all flashes away. 23. They said of him, about the city that night, that it was the peacefulest man's face ever beheld there. Many added that he looked sublime and prophetic. One of the most remarkable sufferers, by the same axe, a woman, had asked at the foot of the same scaffold not long before to be allowed to write down the thoughts that were inspiring her. If he had given any utterance to his, and they were prophetic, they would have been these. I see Barsad and Cly. Defarge, the vengeance, the juryman, the judge, long ranks of the new oppressors who have risen on the destruction of the old, perishing by this retributive instrument, before it shall cease out of its present use. I see a beautiful city, and a brilliant people rising from this abyss, and in their struggles to be truly free, in their triumphs and defeats, through long years to come, I see the evil of this time, and of the previous time of which this is the natural birth, 
gradually making expiation for itself and wearing out. I see the lives for which I lay down my life, peaceful, useful, prosperous, and happy, in that England which I shall see no more. I see her with a child upon her bosom, who bears my name. I see her father, aged and bent, but otherwise restored, and faithful to all men in his healing office, and at peace. I see the good old man, so long their friend, in ten years' time, enriching them with all he has, and passing tranquilly to his reward. I see that I hold a sanctuary in their hearts, and in the hearts of their descendants, generations hence. I see her, an old woman, weeping for me on the anniversary of this day. I see her and her husband, their course done, lying side by side in their last earthly bed. And I know that each was not more honored and held sacred in the other's soul than I was in the souls of both. I see that child who lay upon her bosom and who bore my name, a man, winning his way up in that path of life which once was mine. I see him winning it so well that my name is made illustrious there by the light of his. I see the blots I threw upon it faded away. I see him, foremost of just judges and honored men, bringing a boy of my name, with a forehead that I know and golden hair, to this place, then fair to look upon, with not a trace of this day's disfigurement. And I hear him tell the child my story with a tender and a faltering voice. It is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. End of Book 3 Chapter 15 And the End of A Tale of Two Cities By Charles Dickens